A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome all of you to the day two of Reform Now conference organized by Advocata Institute Sri Lanka under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. And we have completed a successful day one of the conference. Today, we are here at day two. So let's see how that goes for today. So starting off, let me introduce myself. First, my name is Ashing Sunni Virasinghe, and I will be your live stream host for today as well. And we're reporting live to you from the Bandar Naika Memorial International Conference Hall. Now, to take you through, now if you joined yesterday, you know how the conference went. It was a very fruitful day with a lot of uh, reforms coming forward. And we started the day with our uh, none other than the president of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe, with a keynote speech. And then we went on to share the learnings from Thailand's reform experience after the Asian financial crisis in 1997 because we all have something to learn from other stories. And to add on to that, we had the next session on Air India privatization story. And we are yet to know whether Sri Lankan Airlines can be privatized or not. And after that discussion, we also went into our next session on resetting Samurdi, social safety nets. And the day went on with taxation, stability, and growth discussion. And also, we shouldn't forget to mention, Advocata Institute stepped into a milestone by launching their state-owned enterprise in Sri Lanka web platform and also by launching their report on state of the state-owned enterprise in Sri Lanka 2022 report and also the report on SOE governance and consolidation plans. And on after completing that very milestone, we ended the day one with another successful conversation, a panel discussion on centralizing the state's ownership functions. So that was day one, ladies and gentlemen. And here we are back again at BMICH to commence, to very ready to commence the day two of the Reform Now conference organized by Advocata Institute under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. I think before we go forward, I have to remind you about the sponsors who are making this event a success on both the days. So starting off with the platinum sponsor, we have Cal. And as a gold sponsor, we have Expo Lanka. As silver sponsors, we have M2M Veranda Services, John Kills Group, John Keels Properties. And as the event planners, we have FNF, Jetwing Hotels, and Atlas Network. And right now we are joining us live on our live stream and we are live streaming on so many platforms. So let me remind you of uh, the platforms as well. You can watch us live or share our live with anyone through SL blog, politics.lk, Sri Lanka Students for Liberty, The Morning, The Sunday Morning, Daily FT, Other, Economy and Business Sri Lanka, businessnews.lk and via Citizen as well. So those are the platforms that you can watch our live stream on the Reform Now Conference of Advocata Institute. So uh, like I said, this is a very successful session. We had the day one and we are going into day two. So day two, I'm sure you're excited to know how we're going to start day two as well. So day two, the very first session we're about to start in a short while is on debt crisis, structural adjustment and trade policy. And we have the keynote speaker for this session, Professor Premachandra Atukorala. He is a professor of economics, Australian National University, and also a senior advisor to Advocata Institute Sri Lanka. And as a panelist, we will be joined by Dr. Sarat Raja Patirana. He is a chair of academic program at Advocata Institute. And we will also be joined by the next panelist, Dr. Asanka Vijay Singha. He is a research fellow, Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. So through this session this will be a discussion on policy solutions on how to expand Sri Lanka's openness to trade and improve national productivity so um, to start off today I'm sure everyone's energized I told you this conference is all about resetting Sri Lanka and are we really going to leave the judgment to the professionals or the authorities are we just going to keep blaming the authorities for this no I think you and I, as responsible citizens of Sri Lanka, we have something to do. It's all about having the right mindset to face the future of Sri Lanka, to reset the country, because that's what we all want, right? So I hope you are ready to go for our first session today with the positive mindset for resetting Sri Lanka. 
And um, before we move forward, since we have a little bit more time to go into the next session of our main hall, I would like to remind you what Advocata Institute stands for. The Advocata Institute is an independent policy think tank based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, which conducts research, provides commentary, and holds events to promote sound policy ideas compatible with a free society in Sri Lanka. I think that's what we all need. It's good to know that a private institute is stepping in to take the responsibility and provide all information to the country as well. And let me remind you, they're on social media platforms, they're social media arms, they're on Facebook under the arms of Advocata Institute, Advocata Plus, Advocata Kural, and they're on LinkedIn under Advocata Institute, on Twitter as Advocata Institute and Advocata Plus, and on YouTube, Advocata Institute as Advocata Plus, and on TikTok as well as Advocata LK, Advocata Plus, and on Instagram, you can follow them as Advocata LK. So keep following them as they will bring forward you the latest content. And ladies and gentlemen, I think we are now ready to move into the main hall for the very first session of day two. So I wish everyone all the the very best as we bring in experts and think leaders and as the citizens of Sri Lanka let's hear and watch it with open mind so enjoy today's conference with a open mind may I request everyone to take their seats as we are about to begin proceedings I would like to invite Dr. Sarat Rajapatharana to introduce Professor Premachandra Atukorala uh, on, and I would like to request you to come on stage, uh, Dr. Rajapatharana. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great privilege and uh, honor to introduce Professor Premachand Atukorala. Actually, the cliche that he doesn't need any introduction applies here very much so. <laughs> so I, I, I promise him to keep it very short. So as a result, what I'll do is that I'll have one anecdote and two observations. I tried to do it. He said one minute, I asked for three minutes. So the first uh, the anecdote is that I first saw him at a, a big conference in Singapore. We were, the Burbank was starting the famous studies on international trade uh, by Mikhail Yetel. And we were asked to comment on their framework to do the big study, uh, multi-country study. And so there were very important people, Michael McAley, Jacob Frankel, Robert Baldwin. And then I found my countrymen, whom I didn't know then, made the best comments at the, at the, at the thing. So I said, here, here's somebody we have to really get to know and work with, which I did. And so, so that's my anecdote. The two observations, and that's I'm going to embarrass him now. <laughs> he's the most published Sri Lankan economist ever, uh, and so he's so modest, he doesn't, know, he doesn't want this to be said, but it's true. Then my second observation is I had a great privilege of co-authoring a book with him and some papers, and he does all the heavy lifting, and you share the glory. <laughs> most of the time you don't deserve it. But that's how he is. So the ANU faculty calls him Mahaguri. This is in Indonesia, not Singhala. And he is the great teacher and very famous with the students and the faculty there. So that is, I kept it short. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarath, for a nice introduction, even though it will be flattering. Yeah. And uh, again, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Advocata for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. And uh, I have already learned a lot from very rich presentations yesterday. Now, I would like to begin with some opening remarks uh, about how this session and my presentation fit within the overall focus of the uh, conference. Uh, the president, uh, in his presentation, emphatically mentioned that there is no way out for Sri Lanka other than uh, going to sign an agreement with the IMF. And he indirectly said that we would not have faced this calamity uh, if we went to IMF uh, two years ago. Then we had a very interesting presentation by Dr. Virathai Santi Prabhu. Uh, he told us the very interesting and uh, insightful story uh, about Thailand. Now, uh, he emphasize the role of IMF uh, in the structural adjustment program uh, after the 1997-98 crisis. It was a huge IMF program with 17.2 billion uh, US dollars. But he clearly highlighted that even though IMF program helped banking restructuring and stabilizing in the country, there was a very significant domestic component in the reform process. Say, they reformed their foreign direct investment regime, and then they re uh, rewrote law to give uh, independence to the central bank, and brought new uh, ministers, people from the uh, business community to run the country, there were a lot of changes which were beyond the IMF program. The point he made was that IMF program helped, but there was a strong local component. That's a big lesson for us. Then, uh, after the IMF program, Thai economy recovered very rapidly. In my own work, I have done an analysis about the way the sources of Thai economy's recovery. Between 1999 and 2005, out of total growth increment, 75% came from tradable sectors. The reform help shifting the incentive structure from non-tradable, the construction and other things, toward the tradable sector. And export sector played a very important role in the recovery process. And uh, after that reform, Thailand has never gone to the IMF. And it is also the Asian story. Out of the five crisis-affected countries in East Asia, none of the countries have gone to the IMF after 1998, during that uh, three-decade period. Again, if you uh, look at South Asia, India had a massive reform in 1991, but India has not gone to the IMF after that. Then again, tiny economy, Bangladesh, over the last three decades, Thailand, Bangladesh has not gone to the IMF, right? They have even helped us to uh, face the crisis recently. Then the real issue is why Sri Lanka has been a repetitive IMF client. 
we have gone to IMA 16 times. Now we are getting ready to uh, sign the 17th agreement. In other words, actually, when you look at financial history in the world, even though we are located in Asia, we are an African country. But all the repetitive boroughs in the world are in Africa. Angola has gone 20 times, right? Uh, then uh, Zambia is go, uh, again going to go there for the uh, 13th time. Then, even though geographically we are located in Asia, partly we are an African country. Now, why is it? We need to look at a little bit history. Now, the problem in Sri Lankan policy debate is that we are forgetful nation. We do not try to learn lessons from history, right? Let me say a few things in order to set the stage for my presentation. Now, when we gained independence from the British in 1941, actually we, are, we inherited uh, not only an export-dependent economy, but also welfare-oriented economy. Uh, people forget about it, right? During the three decades leading to independence, uh, our semi-independent government introduced a lot of welfare system. We already had a free education system, free health care, uh, food rationing, free uh, distribution of rice, uh, free of charge. Everything was there in the package. It was a dynamic export-oriented economy with a strong welfare component. But during that period, we had thriving export industries. Uh, uh, in 1950, uh, the time when we attend independent around that time, Sri Lanka was awash with foreign exchange. Our first uh, prime minister, Ms. D. S. N. Anaika didn't even want to spend time uh, by talking to the IMF team. When they were here, he said, I have a lot of other important things, uh, but we are not a bigger nation. We don't need IMF, um, uh, sorry, World Bank support, right? That was the situation. Then what happened? We inherited welfare-oriented economy with a thriving export industries. Then, unfortunately, the fortune of the uh, colonial export industries started diminishing because of various reasons. But uh, the policy emphasis was more on that welfare component, right? Uh, because policymakers were already, already thinking about the next election. One prime minister even promised to bring and distribute rice from the moon. You remember, say the welfare orientation increased with a huge budget burden on the budget, but we failed to restructure the economy. During the period from 1950 until nine, uh, late 1970s, in response to challenges, uh, we implemented what I call like a strict policies. We turn inward instead of becoming more export oriented. Uh, we don't need another example from East Asia. Look at Mauritius. Mauritius was the prison uh, for Sri Lanka. Our last prime minister was sent there as a prisoner, right? It was a useless, a hopeless country. But Mauritius started opening the economy from early 70s. Right? Now, Mauritius per capita income now is 11,000. They never want, had to go to the IMF, right? But we first turned our policy direction in the entire wrong uh, way. And then there was a uh, bold attempt in 1977 to reverse the development pattern to make the country more outward oriented. Unfortunately, the reforms were half-hearted. Uh, uh, 
uh, actually the reformer did not listen to World Bank or IMF uh, uh, to their advice in the way when they were prepared the reform program. It was a bold attempt though. At the same time, civil law prevented us from benefiting from these reforms. And then reforms were broadened uh, in the early 90s, uh, and uh, there were significant gains, even though we could not become another East Asian country. Remember, 1994 election, actually the alternative party, the left-in, uh, left so-called left-in party came into power by promising to continue with liberalization reforms, simply because the gains were visible at that time. Professor Mick Moore, who talked to us yesterday, has written a beautiful article about it, why the 77 reform eventually became bipartisan policy. And uh, uh, yesterday, uh, I think his name, uh, Mr. Uh, Ajit Gunawardhana made the point that one of the most important reforms over the last 44 decades was done by left in government, uh, privatizing the plantation sector. Again, the telecom reform, all these things continue during that period. But unfortunately, after ending of the civil war, there has been a massive backtracking from these reforms. Uh, when peace came to the country, there was opportunity for us to continue with the reforms in a better way, with further reforms, in order to redress that massive imbalance, uh, imbalance in the economy, huge welfare orientation, but lack of dynamic uh, tradable sector. We had that opportunity, but we miss it. Now, my presentation begins with that point. Right? Uh, to summarize what I mentioned, we inherited welfare economy, and then emphasis of the policy regime for three decades was to increase the welfare network, but without thinking about providing the groundwork to continue with these policies. We became inward-oriented. Then we attempted to become outward oriented and the reforms did not work well. Still, uh, there were significant gains which were uh, instrumental in making the reform bipartisan. But during the post-Civil War era, there have been significant backtracking. And let me start my presentation from there. I'm going to focus on two issues. The first issue is how anti-tradable bias in the incentive structure made the Sri Lankan economy vulnerable to the present crisis, right? Here, I think you are familiar with the term tradables. Uh, I have defined them in the second slide. You can have a look at them later. Tradables are basically actual exports as well as products which are close substitute for exports, tradables. Then we have importable. Imports, imports and goods produced domestically that are close substitutes for imports. Taken together, we call them tradables. Now, our incentive structure throughout the post-independence uh, period has favored non-tradable. Uh, non-tradable mean construction, utilities, and all the other services, right? Uh, and then that anti-tradable bias or pro-non-tradable bias intensified during the last three decades. That's the point I want to highlight. Secondly, how to read this anti 
uh, tradable bias as part of the stabilization and structural adjustment reform. Again, Thai story, stabilization itself is not enough. We need to restructure the economy to redress the non-tradable bias. That's how Thailand did not, I mean, made the economy resilient to further crisis. Uh, that is the East Asian story as well. Now, yeah, this is the way I'm going to structure the rest of the presentation. Uh, little bit theory in three uh, paragraphs, debt crisis uh, uh, premier. Uh, then I am going to discuss about anti-tradable bias and how it made the country vulnerable to the crisis. Then thirdly, I am going to uh, focus on policies for redressing the uh, anti-tradable bias uh, as part of the IMF package. Uh, now, very briefly, debt crisis, debt or any financial crisis, is basically can be defined as lots of confidence in a country's ability to manage uh, debt or balance of payment position. A debt distress situation causing a severe disruption in the functioning of the economy. That's what has happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, there's a huge literature about why countries succumb to crisis. There are two different theories. Firstly, self-fulfilling panic theory. Now, uh, the second one, vulnerability theory. Now, what the self-fulfilling panic theory says, actually that's a huge theoretical literature explaining the possibility of a crisis uh, even when a country is running fine. Everything looks fine, suddenly the country succumbs to a crisis. A crisis is prompted by a sporadic event. Uh, I will call it a trigger striking both guilty and innocent countries alike. That was the mentality prevailed in Sri Lanka immediately after the uh, pandemic, right? Politicians say that we were fine, everything was going well, but the pandemic created this problem. Now, this idea uh, has lost credibility actually in the financial crisis literature. Uh, trigger itself is not going to be a, create a crisis. Think about the pandemic. Virus come. Not everybody succumb to the uh, virus. Some people remain agile. Uh, some people become sick with the virus, right? In East Asia, every country was affected by the virus, but only Sri Lanka became a problem country, right? Therefore, virus itself uh, has not been a problem. Then the more relevant theory is here, vulnerability theory. A debt crisis is caused by a combination of two things. Firstly, vulnerability. Secondly, trigger. Uh, without a trigger, crisis might not happen at, the, at a given time. But it will happen someday, right? Uh, if you are Vulnerable. Vulnerability is, a, is an unstable macroeconomic condition. The, one of the uh, great economists in this area, he has nicely defined it. Vulnerability means that if something goes wrong, then suddenly a lot goes wrong. Think about Sri Lanka. We were vulnerable with a huge debt overhang uh, and uh, debt repayment obligations and so on, right? That was the vulnerable situation. Then when the trigger hit and the crisis happened, a lot went, went wrong, even political instability, uh, arrogance and everything, right? Therefore, it is a combination of vulnerability and the trigger. Therefore, 
uh, we need to focus on the sources of vulnerability. Now, my focus is on how non-tradable bias in the economy, which intensified during the last two decades, contributed to this crisis. Now, the whole story is summarized uh, in this slide, but I'm going to show some pictures to uh, uh, deepen the un understanding related to this point. Uh, firstly, what we had from about 2005, I will call it a debt-driven spurt in the uh, economy. Right? And then, the, uh, after the, particularly after the civil law, the country started building infrastructure uh, in a massive way by borrowing from initially from China and secondly from more expensive sovereign debt issues and so on. Then the growth spurt was underpinned by a massive non-tradable bias. There was a non-tradable bias in the economy, but it intensified during that period. Then what was the outcome? It was the vulnerability to COVID-19 shock. Uh, firstly, we had a massive debt overhang uh, by 2019, over 50 million uh, dollar denominated, mostly dollar denominated debt. Right? Then uh, by 2020, according to available estimate, our debt obligations for the coming two years was about five billion. Every year we had to uh, use uh, foreign exchange reserves equivalent to about five billion for amortization of debt as well as interest payment. Then the Debt service burden as the percentage of export as well as no, uh, tradable production had increased massively. Then the reserves declined dramatically during that period. Therefore, the underlying source of the vulnerability, the outcome here was basically the debt driven growth during that period. Now let us turn to some of the slides. This is Sri Lankan GDP growth rate per capita, uh, growth rate adjusted for population growth. Uh, you can see that during the period here, I don't have a pointer here, I don't know how to, uh, you can see that during the period from about 2004-05, uh, we had the most rapidly growing period of the Sri Lankan economy. In one year, it, uh, the growth rate reached beyond 9%. And uh, during that period, uh, people were very happy without understanding the source of growth during that period, right? It is just like the difference between a strong normal uh, wrestler and a sumo wrestler, right? A sumo wrestler is big, right? By feeding a lot of uh, non-nutritious food, fattening thing, right? But the sumo wrestler does not live long. Average life expectancy is about 30 years or 40, right? Real wrestler is very strong, but he looks relatively skinny compared to a sumo wrestler. In other words, our growth during that period was similar to a, a sumo wrestler, basically. Now, look at the data. Now, here, total tradable production, uh, basically, used in national accounts, I separate a tradable production, uh, exports and exportables, and import competing goods. And uh, I don't have a time to explain how it is done. Then I have, export, uh, again, 
total tradable production, uh, which is the red line. Uh, the black line is uh, export, which is a more direct measure of tradability. Now you can see non-trade Tradable production share, in fact, has been declining. Actually, it's a, in a way, natural process. When an economy grows, services share increase to a certain extent. But there was a dramatic turnaround from about mid-2010s, right? The, there had been a decline, but the decline expedited during that period. Uh, showing the production structure shifting to non-tradable activities. The export story is even more telling. You can see from about late 70s, because of the market-oriented reforms, which gained impetus from the further reforms in uh, early 90s, uh, export to GDP ratio increased, right? I think in your writing, you had highlighted this point. Yeah. Now, look at what happened to that ratio. It has plummeted during this period. It declined from 20% to about 10% during that period. Therefore, the non-tradable bias in the economy during that period is very clear. Now, central bank report and many uh, people who talk in the parliament uh, show this picture or tell something similar. If you <coughs> express total debt in the country as a percentage of GDP, actually we did not have a big problem uh, in recent years. Uh, I remember when I gave a lecture at the planning ministry, the director who later became uh, again, the, he uh, made the point that the debt burden in Sri Lanka was much higher in the early 90s compared to uh, uh, recent years. But this figure, to me, is a bogus figure, simply because the denominator GDP has been weighted by non-tradable goods. Non-tradable goods do not help you to repay your debt. Right? Therefore, to get a meaningful picture, you have to go beyond the data and do better calculations. This is my better calculations. Uh, external debt relative to GD, uh, uh, tradable GDP, ignore non-tradable sector, express debt as a percentage of total tradable GDP. And then uh, even better indicator is total debt as a percentage of export earnings. Here export earnings is both merchandise export as well as uh, services export. Now, both indicators clearly indicate the problem. I mean, the, the debt dependence in the country has been historically high during this period, simply because the policy regime uh, shifted from traded orientation to non-traded sector, our debt burden relating to our ability to repay worsened during that period. Therefore, the story is complete here, right? The, and then debt service ratio accordingly had reached historical height. Then that, that is my, part of my presentation how the country became vulnerable to the crisis. Then the important lesson summarized here is be careful in comparing growth rates. Look at the sectoral composition of underlying growth. Think about the difference between a sumo wrestler and, the, and a real wrestler. Then uh, I come to Sources of anti-tradable bias during that period, this is going to be the focus of our discussion, but this is the key point. Excess focus on non-tradable sectors during that period naturally tilted the incentive structure against tradable production. Uh, it happened in any country. It has a popular term called Dutch disease, because 
uh, the term was coined by the Economist magazine about what happened in uh, Netherlands after the discovery of North Sea oil, right? The huge amount of resources came to non-tradable sector, tradable sector shrank, right? Now, that non-tradable bias built into the system was uh, exaggerated or compounded by three other factors during that period. Firstly, a chain rate policy. Now, uh, we have been making this mistake all the time. Say, you, we focus mostly on inflation and use the chain rate to tame inflation, right? Uh, it's called, you use inflation, uh, exchange rate, nominal exchange rate, as an inflation anchor, ignoring the fact that what is needed for avoiding anti-tradable bias is uh, uh, preventing appreciation of the real exchange rate, nominal exchange rate adjusted for relative prices. Look at this figure. The real exchange rate here is the black line. Uh, after the 77 reform, actually the numerical magnitude increased, that means real exchange rate appreciated, uh, improved competitiveness of the economy. That competitiveness was not retained, maintained during the uh, ensuing period, uh, simply because we intervened in the foreign exchange market to tame inflation, ignoring the uh, importance of real exchange rate in resource allocation. That pattern intensified during the last two decades, right? The pump in money into non-tradable sectors, at the same time trying to keep the nominal exchange rate virtually constant in order to tame inflation. And uh, you can see what happened here. Now, then the second point, the tariffs regime became more and more distorted. Do you know, by 2000, many people expected that we are moving towards a more uniform tariff structure. There has been significant tariff cut, but these patterns were reversed by introducing a lot of para tariffs and other quantitative restrictions. And therefore, when the trade regime become more and more protectionist, uh, it become anti-export virtually. It is the famous learner symmetry theorem. When you protect industries, and we have done it in a big way in recent years, then import uh, imp uh, the, uh, importers will make absorbent, absor abnormal profit, but export or tradable sectors suffer, right? That's the second. Thirdly, policy backsliding relating to foreign direct investment. This is a very important point. I did a study for the World Bank by digging into investment records and BOI. During 2005 and 2013, about 200 export or more export-oriented firms closed down business in this country. And uh, at that time, people were talking about a second BOI in the other tower. When investors come, they have to go to another BOI to get approval. Uh, the uh, approval process got distorted. 10% commission, all these things killed the foreign direct investment regime. Actually, I have talked to some Korean exporters, firms uh, in Seoul. They say that we, did, we will have second thought about coming to Sri Lanka at that time, right? All the Korean investors left the country, not single one, right? Then natural non-tradable bias was intensified by policy errors during that period. Now, I think I can stop here. Then the basic, uh, can I take two minutes? I think, yeah. Reform for redressing anti-export bias. Again, Thai story. IMF is very useful in the stabilization package, right? But the, naturally, the, the, their mission is to achieve 
balance of payment uh, stability virtually. Now in Sri Lankan case, balance of payment deficit had closely followed the budget deficit. Therefore, that is the case in many developing countries. Therefore, IMF is going to focus mostly on fiscal consolidation. Nothing is wrong with it. Actually, that is the saying that IMF means it is mostly fiscal. IMF, right? Then why? It is natural. Sri Lanka is a twin deficit country. Our trade deficit has been mirrored in uh, budget deficit. Therefore, we are not going to blame the IMF, right? The current account deficit is approximately identical to uh, government budget deficit. Remember, identity does not mean causation. That's simple arithmetic, right? Uh, after the event, when you balance national accounts, uh, budget deficit is closely related to uh, uh, external deficit, uh, current account deficit. It does not necessarily imply that budget deficit caused the current account deficit. It is simply an identity, right? This is, I have explained in a slide, you can go through it later. Now, this is the story. You have current account deficit, which is the uh, black line. Uh, the blue line is the budget deficit, right? They have gone together. Budget deficit has closely followed the uh, current account deficit and the vice versa, the identity. But remember, in addition to that, there's a private sector deficit, which is the red line. The uh, private sector expenditure and private sector income difference between the two. Now, private sector has managed to live above water, naturally. I mean, there's only one or two deficit. Therefore, private sector we can't blame. It is basically the public sector. But when you compare this with Thailand or other East Asian countries, the story is very different. In these countries, saving rate has been very high. The Thai saving rate is closer to 40%, compared to our about 20 around that. Therefore, even when the country is running a budget deficit, private sector has compensated for that. In the, all the Asian countries, that's the story. I have written a different paper on this issue. Government deficit uh, can be tolerated if the private sector generate more savings. It has not happened in Sri Lanka. Partly non-tradable bias can be there. That's a big research issue we have to think about, right? Uh, and then IMF approach to reform, therefore, assume a tight link between the budget deficit and the balance of payment deficit. The, that is their mission. We can't blame them, right? But the national account identity that link budget deficit to current account deficit does not necessarily imply causation running from one to another. We have to keep that in mind. Uh, taming inflation, of course, through budget, uh, fiscal operation can help improving the real exchange rate. I don't, that's a fact, right? But anti-tradable bias depend on many other factors. Again, the Thai story, you rely on uh, IMF to stabilize the economy, but take additional policy measures as the reform package to redress the anti-export bias. Therefore, in an economy where anti-export bias has underpinned vulnerability to the crisis by building up a massive debt overhang, uh, like Sri Lanka, it is necessary to combine expenditure reduction policy, that is the IMF package, uh, high interest rate, uh, and uh, taxation and other things. You need to combine them with expenditure switching policies, change in the incentive structure towards tradable sector. Again, 
one should not make the mistake that uh, we, are, we should talk up only about exports. Imports are, import compete in industries are equally important, but you have to pro promote them, unlike Sri Lankan situation now, imports in quotas and all the things in a competitive market context. I am talking about tradables here. Uh, then just go back to uh, that slide 15. We need to, re I mean, the reverse all these three areas. Never use a chain rate, nominal exchange rate, to t only to tame inflation. But focus more on real exchange rate because real exchange rate is the key determinant of tradable production in an economy. Therefore, some people like Rudiger Don Bush, he argued that uh, we should uh, learn to live with at least some inflation, but focus more on avoiding real exchange rate appreciation. This is a very important point for Sri Lanka. Then, uh, compare, I, if I had time, I would have compared Sri Lanka's own ex experience and IM program with that of other countries. We went to IMF 16 times. Out of them, 12, 12 times we went there because of balance and payment problem. Then central bank know, knew how to tweak data, right? Then you can postpone investment projects or introduce temporary tariff increases and satisfy IMF, right? Then if you achieve that target, then you get money. Then when you study this uh, uh, 16 uh, program, what we see is that we completed about seven of them and uh, tweaking had played a very big role, right? You postpone investment at the expenses of long-term growth and various things and satisfy the IMF. But this time, it has to be different. We need to combine the stabilization with the reform I uh, discussed. Let us hope this trip to Washington, D.C. is going to be the 17th and the last trip. And uh, no more IMF uh, visits, uh, just like Thailand. But to achieve that objective, we need to redress anti-export bias, which had been the culprit throughout in our pro problem. I'll stop at that. Thank you very much, Professor Atukorula. Uh, we will now commence the panel discussion on debt crisis, structural adjustment, and trade policy. The discussion will be centered on policy solutions on how to expand Sri Lanka's openness to trade and improve national productivity. I would like to invite Professor Atukorula back to stage and Dr. Sarat Rajapatrinu, academic uh, chairperson at Advakara Institute, and Dr. Asanka Vijay a research fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. Uh, the session will be moderated by Ravi Ratna Sabapati. Uh, I will now pass it on to Ravi.
Good morning. Uh, I'd like to start by inviting our two other panelists uh, to make a few opening remarks before getting into the discussion. Can I invite Dr. Rajapatrina to make a few uh, remarks? Well, as usual, <laughs> Professor Atukoral has really laid down very well, very easy to understand what he has said. And I have always been wondering about how to talk about the 16 times we want to go to the IMF. Something is wrong there, we had to go to 16 times. Actually, for the, for the example of Thailand is very important to us, and as uh, Sandra has said, uh, there's a lot of homework to be done. And I have had the, I don't know, privilege had the, to deal with the IMF time. Uh, we sit around the table and uh, discuss the problem and see how to approach it. And as uh, Professor Kuala said, it's the sort of they look at one side. Uh, they are professional people. I enjoy working with them. But we have to look out our side. We have to do the heavy we work ourselves rather than run into the IMF each time. Actually, there are as countries as it showed that there are countries that exist very well, do very well, are very prosperous without ever going to the IMF. Because if you look after your system well, if you follow the proper policy, macroeconomic policy, you can manage on your own. There are many countries in the world that never go to the IMF, then they are doing very well. In fact, one Sample of proper uh, performance is that they don't have to ask anybody. They have done their thing. So, so this is very helpful to understand where we have been, why we have been running there. <laughs> this time we need a little help, though, you know, because we are in a very dire situation compared to our past things. In the past, we could have a, do fiscal deficits and done, done all the bad things, and then go to... Uh, a sugar daddy who will say, okay, don't, don't worry, we'll help you. We have come to a point that we can't really ask that. And, and so they insist on more difficult things to do, which we have to do. And the whole issue of uh, non tradable bias that we have brought up is again a very important area that we have to be very mindful of that. So uh, going forward, that's one of the things that we have to consider the reminder that worry about the thing. Because whenever you divide uh, debt to be repaid with GDP, first of all, you are using a large num number anyway. <laughs> and like this Bhagavad said, anything divided by the national income is going to look small anyway. But the important thing is to see what are the tradable sectors, the which we can convert into, into repayment. So I would like to say we don't have a debt problem as much as a debt repayment problem. Because we have invested the money in the wrong way, that is not going to give us the tradable. That's a simple, very simple answer to that. So thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Rajput. Can I ask Dr. Vijay Singh to make a few remarks, please? Uh, thank you, Ravi. Uh, so Sri Lanka is uh, facing uh, the need for policy reforms uh, under very... Uh, bad domestic and global economic uh, condition. The domestic uh, conditions, Professor Atukar uh, explained in detail. Uh, globally, uh, we are facing a kind of a globalization trend. Uh, we saw that uh, after Brexit and election of uh, Trump and with the COVID, people are talking about reshoring, and uh, the, uh, our export markets are talking about uh, strategic uh, autonomy, and uh, U.S. is focusing on uh, supply chain real and, and uh, the World Bank is uh, worrying about uh, stagflation in global uh, economic uh, perspective of 2022. They have a separate chapter for stagflation. So Sri Lanka needs to go for ambitious uh, policy reforms, especially trade reforms, uh, under these uh, unfavorable uh, circumstances. And uh, the recent policy changes uh, have uh, created a situation that 
for the impede the structural uh, transformation, you can see uh, some sort of uh, movement of labor force from industrial sector to the agricultural sector. If you look at the uh, labor force survey data in 2021 Q1 and Q2, uh, the policies, especially trade policies, are favoring uh, domestic agricultural production. So the policymakers' burden is to remove this uh, or phasing out this uh, gradually. But the problem is 25% of uh, the population is in uh, the labor force is in the agricultural uh, sector. There can be huge political uh, backlash for this uh, kind of uh, reforms. So when I answer your question, we will discuss what we can do, uh, Sri Lanka can do uh, to uh, go for ambitious uh, policy reforms. Thank you. Thank you, Osaka. Uh, so now uh, what uh, Professor Premachandra brought out in his speech was that Sri Lanka has uh, failed to uh, reform its economy. In 1948, when the economy was doing well, uh, they failed to reform uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, ad uh, to address the change in external circumstances. Uh, the IMF programs of the 16, only seven were completed, which means, again, you did not go through the reforms uh, properly. Uh, the other uh, point you mentioned was that uh, uh, where the even where reforms may have been done, there may have been a certain uh, uh, manipulation of some of the numbers to try to meet the necessary target. So the reforms that have been done have never been. I think the message is that they were never deep enough, never uh, and never followed through properly. Uh, we've talked about the, uh, the reforms in abstraction. But could we sort of specify, Professor, what uh, this would mean in, in, actual, uh, in actual policy steps, the types of reforms that we would need most urgently? Yes. Yes, I yes. Thank you very much, Kavin. Uh, before answering the question, could I make two points related to current uh, uh, The point Sarat made that uh, not only we need to generate surpluses, but we need to convert them into repayment. That is a very important point. Actually, it is, I miss it. That's why we need export orientation, right? Say the uh, simple reason, actually, a lot of people here, I think the earlier the, in the police debate, uh, People misinterpreted uh, new monetary theory. Right? The Stephen Kelton, the lady who promoted monetary theory, uh, in her book, in the first paragraph, she clearly say that my theory is for countries which has international monetary autonomy. What do you mean by international monetary autonomy? the ability to get debt uh, credit uh, in your own currency. Uh, Australia borrow in uh, uh, sovereign bond markets, but all the Australian bonds are denominated in Australian dollars. That's no problem. I mean, you can create money and pay. But a tiny country like Sri Lanka, our international monetary autonomy is nil, right? We borrow everything in foreign currency. We have to pay them in foreign currency. Therefore, when we talk about redressing uh, our non-tradable buyers, we have to give, give more emphasis to export sector because export sector helps you to earn foreign exchange, right? Even if you create a massive budget surplus following IMF advice, it's not going to help simply because we can't convert rupees into dollars if you don't have that capability. That's a very important point. Uh, agriculture story is important, but we should not forget that poverty or unemployment cannot be resolved in the agricultural sector. Young people, they want to come into the modern sector, right? Therefore, agriculture development is important. But uh, again, uh, now, 
one of the most important development in uh, world agriculture is shifting agricultural production uh, towards ready to eat food product processed food that these industries are export oriented perhaps we might uh, consider, say look at thailand out of your total exports 35% is processed food closer to 35 according to my calculation but they are agriculture based but they are export oriented one of the biggest chicken meat export uh, shrimp export and all that say our agriculture focus has been uh, focus on a single product at one stage in the late 70s there were 20 agricultural researchers in gannur who only one was focusing on uh, non uh, paddy product this guy was considered as an outlier everybody consider paddy experiments are the way to go we had to rec- we had to focus on agriculture again the open focus is needed now you are sorry i have to you are question about what are the policy focus specific uh, uh, yeah that say imf program is basically going to focus on balance of payment support right uh, this money is not going to be uh, come to the treasury to waste on unnecessary project the money come strictly to the central bank in order to support the uh, uh, balance of payment management relating to balance of payment management i would say the first priority would, should be to restructure our import rate regime uh, for, at this stage if somebody ad- advocate reducing all the uh, import tariff it is not a val- viable thing to do you can't reduce all the import tariff at this stage right what is needed is to abolish quantitative restriction when you talk about trade policy you have to make a distinction between tariff and non tariff barriers tariff does not sever the link between world economy and the country it simply set a bar right the goods you import would be relatively more expensive in a given country but beyond that bar you can import any amount therefore through tariff uh, even relatively high tariff under the wto because we have plenty of opportunity to increase tariff if you want under wto commitment uh, it is not a bad thing at this stage simply because it will help the budget i mean when you talk about filling the budget gap uh, import tariff can help right if you look at the tariff history after 77 liberalization there was a huge peak in tariff 77 liberalization under rony the mill uh, overnight they abolish all the quantitative restrictions by retaining tariff initially it is a good thing to do and the tariff were but the pivotal thing important thing is to remove quantitative restrictions quantity restriction removal even with higher tariff would make the reform politically palatable i mean people like us who lived in uh, reform era we know that when the imported good become easily available in the market people were very happy and that helped uh, cont- i mean winning the political support then my first priority uh, uh, under the imf package would be don't think about tariff increase uh, reduction you can even increase them but you can uh, remove quantitative restriction all these black market thank you thank you are because of quantitative restriction right unlike tariff quantitative restriction sever the link between world market and the domestic market therefore middlemen can pay havoc that's what has happened in the country relating to tariff the second point i make is that we need to think about moving towards a uniform tariff structure uh, there is ample evidence i have studied the chilean experience clearly during the iind tariff time 
tariff rates were about 200%, right? Then under Pinochet regime, they had visionary advisors like Victoria Cove, our friend, and then they advised reducing the tariff. Eventually, Chile achieved the first uniform tariff structure in the world. The, what is the outcome? There are two important outcomes. Firstly, you won't believe tariff revenue increase. Tariff revenue did not decline. I mean, the custom officers don't have the ability to manipulate if the tariffs uh, are uniform. Tariff uh, uh, revenue increase, that's a well-known paper in the American Economic Review point in there. Secondly, the efficiency of the administration increased more than 10 times, right? All the delays happened because of this cascading tariff structure. They can shift from one to another and uh, bribe people and all that when you have a cascading. The two points I make is that with the IMF support, then we need to move from quantitative restriction to uh, a tra a, a tariff system. Uh, don't talk about, think about reducing tariff at one but later on, gradually remove tariff, the reform tariff to achieve uniform structure. Then the second point I want to make is the exchange rate policy. Uh, all of you know the fixing the exchange rate was a uh, mistake, and the floating was also equally mistake, mistaken policies in this context. The floating is important, but uh, think about the context where there are massive quantitative restrictions and travel restrictions and various things, and therefore drive in black market. Black market is not only in Colombo, even in Canberra there's the black market. Students uh, buy uh, dollars at uh, about 300 rupees per dollar, Australian dollar, right? It's a huge problem in that context you float the currency, what happens? It's a boundless pit. It'll, until the current exchange rate policy with the new gov central bank government, in government introduced, it's called target zone policy. It's a correct thing, actually. Under the target zone, they get the uh, information from the foreign exchange market. Then they allow the currency to determine in the middle rank, uh, allowing for a brand, that's fine. But uh, when the liberalization, import liberalization occur, perhaps you can move towards the uh, floating regime and then uh, come up with the managed floating regime. Right? Then market uh, equilibrium level, uh, maintain it, and the central bank intervene in the foreign exchange market to uh, remove excess volatility. That, those are the two things uh, I can think about. Then, of course, the tariff regime and welfare policies are important. One of the biggest mistakes I have seen in policy announcement is that policymakers talk about tariff uh, tax increases and expenditure cut before talking about the welfare reform. Then, I mean, the IMF has advocated and the uh, IMS is no longer against welfare policies. They, they, I mean, in this context, we need a strong welfare program to cushion the poor again. But that has to come first. Uh, uh, introduce uh, income tax increases, budget cut, and other things, uh, making people uh, hopeful. Uh, I think that it's a mistake to talk about tariff increase, income tax increases first before talking about uh, welfare policy. Can I, can I just... Yeah. Go, go ahead. Two, two points that you said. I am not uh, by nature, I am not really disposed to uh, impose tariff yeah. or raising the period. Uh, because there are other ways of doing it. What you said is absolutely true. No, temporary. Temper temper yeah, yeah, right. But temporary is also, you create... Uh, group that is interested in that and so they lobby against it when you do it. But I know that we need special circumstances now because we are at I agree. I think agriculture is a very difficult thing to understand because the simple number that 
number that uh, the about 27 percent of our population is involved in agriculture but their contribution to gdp is about seven percent so this is not a very efficient system yeah partly because people don't want to remain in culture this doesn't bring them in up yeah. this thing also culturally people don't want to go to the city and there's a lot of good literature about why you're moving from the city uh, you have the probability of getting a job is one variable other is the difference between the wages uh, in the rural and urban sector very good work done on that area so i think we have to think also look at agriculture that way uh, and some of the rules that to do with paddy is quite backward you know if if the farmer wants to move away from paddy to produce something else like the chilies it make much more money he cannot do it you have to ask the a district commissioner to get the permission that is ridiculous farmer should know what he is doing it, so i think we have to get it or some of those rules in in the book thank you thank you uh, uh, to move from professor prabhu uh, andre's question to dr vijay singh uh, he spoke of removing of quantitative restrictions and for uniformity in the tariff now the ideal situation is to have a single flat tariff so that all the complexity of classification all these issues of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of customs corruption arises when you have different uh, uh, levels of tariff within a very similar set of items but what would be an ideal uh, scenario for uh, sri lanka to move into initially in terms of achieving some uniformity uh, uh, in the tariff structure uh, for imports would you have some suggestions thanks ravi oh, yes uh, there there were a lot of uh, tariff uh, changes uh, recently especially after this uh, covid-19 uh, impact we can see uh, about 37% of imports by 2017 values are under quantitative import controls there are various forms like import control licenses uh, temporary suspensions import ban uh, when you look at the pattern uh, i identified seven waves after april uh, the first waves the policy maker first targeted non sophisticated uh, food right Uh, because uh, sophisticated items cannot be substituted uh, in sri lanka uh, our uh, comparative advantage does not lie in that uh, we can see 65% of food and import controls now 55% of consumption goods are under import controls now intermediate goods 30% capital goods 28% uh this this uh tariff structure was introduced after 2020 april uh 89% of food imports are under quantitative and price control uh there are acls for example uh, yogurt uh, it is about 2000 rupees per kilogram like that so uh, the challenge is how to remove these uh, tariffs uh, opening up uh, the economy but uh, we know uh, the government of, as a country sri lanka has no ability to trade freely because of this foreign exchange uh, crisis and my point about this uh, agriculture was uh, due to i think this is due to this high uh, food prices and the industrial sector contraction people are moving back uh, to uh, agricultural uh, sector we need to reverse that uh, if we are looking for uh, ambitious structural program uh, my understanding is uh, maybe by around next yes july uh, sri lanka should target uh, to uh, remove this uh, uh, protection given to domestic industries because the uh, the domestic industries they are they don't have the comparative advantage in uh, most of these goods the final outcome is uh, the foreign exchange the growth of foreign exchange inflow is lower than the foreign exchange 
outflow because uh, these uh, substitutions are import intensive. Uh, most of the substitutions uh, should import uh, raw materials from uh, the other countries. Uh, thanks. Uh, Professor Premachandra, there are a couple of uh, misapprehensions uh, about uh, uh, export orientation that I'd like you to clear. One is that uh, uh, everybody seems to want to promote exports, but at the same time they want to uh, protect the local market. Uh, the two are incompatible, if you could perhaps uh, explain why. Uh, and uh, uh, what we've seen over the last couple of years is that uh, the import restrictions, by restricting competition, it has been extremely good for businesses. Some businesses have reported record profits uh, the last two years. Uh, so what is necessarily good for business is not necessarily good for the economy. Perhaps uh, you could address these two questions. It's a big question. But yeah, of course, I mean, when there's import restrictions, some people become billionaires, right? Uh, because this is the point I made. When there are quantitative restrictions, uh, or when, the, I mean, the, uh, there, uh, there are import restrictions, they can, I mean, the people who can import, they can get huge profit who produce for the downstream market. That is true. But uh, here, we are talking about tradable production, uh, export-oriented production, as well as uh, competitive, import-competing mm -hmm. production. So we can uh, take lessons even from Sri Lanka, right? After 77, say, some of the industries which are producing shoddy goods, so one example is biscuit industry, right? Then they had to face competition, the quality of biscuits has improved in Sri and they have become export-oriented uh, industries, right? Under, a, uh, I mean, the competitive conditions, there are some manufacturers who can become uh, export-oriented as well as uh, producing for the domestic market, right? Uh, that type of import substitution is very important. Uh, can I tell you a little bit about the virtues of export orientation? Now, uh, let me take a uh, recent example. Look at disaggregated export earnings data in Sri Lanka. Uh, tourist earnings plummeted, right? From about five billion virtually to a few millions uh, decline, right? Remittances plummeted from about 6 billion to about 3 billion, and most of the remittances go to black market. Look at merchandise export. I have talked um, spoken to some firms as well. Our merchandise export has increased. Over the last six months, the uh, growth rate of total merchandise export over the last, well, previous year period is about 10%. Why? Simply because Export-oriented producers are not constrained by availability of import. Last night I talked to the central bank governor. What he says is that all the export-oriented firms, they earn foreign exchange. Therefore, they can meet their import requirement, import requirement automatically, right? Therefore, that's the virtue of export orientation. These export-oriented firms are insulated from even the current crisis. Now, compare that situation with early 70s. All the time, I have uh, written a paper on this, when manufacturing production declined in the country, the major cause was decline in imports. When the gov government imposed import restrictions, these uh, firms are heavily import uh, dependent, therefore their production declined. Say, if you compare these two situations, you can clearly see the virtue of export orientation, right? They are globally oriented. They are not constrained by foreign exchange. Say, uh, the biggest uh, pediment garment producer during our uh, student time was called Das Apparel, right? And it was producing entirely for the domestic market, but that industry was dependent on tea rubber coconut export, right? Yeah, and then when they put earning decline, import decline, 
the company was in trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Raj, uh, Rajapath, uh, we have uh, two aspects to look at. One is trade policy reform. The second is trade facilitation. The, uh, the administrative processes of automation. Uh, now, uh, Sri Lanka has been trying to get into automated uh, paperless customs clearing since 2002. Uh, perhaps you could share some of your uh, views on how we could progress in that direction. Yeah, I mean, trade policy, I think I just want to make use of this opportunity to say trade policies that uh, uh, deal with the rest total totality of the country is very important than doing here and there. For example, there's tendency to say, let's do an industrial park here, something there. Actually, this is not going to help us very much in the macroeconomics of it. Right? So, trade policy, as Professor Atukola has mentioned, is so important to change orientation between producing, uh, giving opportunities to, to do increase exports or increase tradable goods, same in a way. Uh, trade facilitation is not in that order, it's not as, as important, but it's very uh, difficult for Sri Lanka, for example, in uh, 2010, the ITCN did a survey asking exporters what are the difficulties that you um, uh, face getting things from the point of production to the port, a lot of difficulty. So many processes, if something has even little to do with wood something, then you have to go to the forest to people. Then sometimes you go to the same place twice. I mean, so it's, a, it's sort of, there's a tariff equivalent that you can put in there, quite high. Uh, then delays uh, to get the papers processed. There's no need to have all that. Uh, and so trade facilitation that way is important, but not as important as changing your trade policies. And let me just take just one more point. Uh, we talk about trade liberalization, and people don't get it, what we mean by that. Very in simple language, the easiest way to understand it is that allowing prices to allocate resources. So when you convert from a QR, quantitative restrictions, into a tariff, you have liberalized your economy. Yeah. So you, actually, you can be very important gain from there. there. And then I'm for a uniform tariff. We have been advocating it everywhere. I think a country that is had a uniform tariff or still has it, I think, Soviet Union, 17% across. They had it now since they got it of the, the last regime. They have 17% uniform tariff. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Vijay Singh. Huh? Uh, now, what are some of the challenges that uh, reforming the uh, tariff uh, and the trade policies that uh, the policymakers will face. We've had about 20 years over which uh, we've, uh, uh, we've seen the uh, trade regime turn inwards uh, and, uh, uh, and turn towards the non-tradable uh, sector. So, so to reverse 20 years of uh, uh, regression, how do you, uh, what are the challenges that the policymakers are likely to face? Well, uh, in economic uh, theory, we know that uh, we can mathematically prove uh, this uh, welfare increase, in, but uh, the pestering question is why there are this uh, protection always. Uh, the answer is the trade policy is designed by the policymakers, and their objective is not always increasing the national uh, economy. They have an integral part in their objective function to be elected or to be re-elected uh, to maximize their political support. Uh, this is uh, the famous uh, Gossman and Helpman protection for sale kind of literature. Uh, then with 25% of population in this unproductive agricultural sector, uh, the politicians will face a political challenge in uh, opening up the economy 
in a significant way. Uh, and also, these exacerbated revenue concerns will challenge policymakers to keep these uh, tariff on imports for the increase in uh, the domestic prices. It will be an incentive for the uh, domestic agricultural uh, producers not to leave the sector or for the move into that uh, sector. And uh, the uh, low job creation in the in industrial sector is there will be a kind of a recession. Uh, we are in a recession, we can see in the import data the last month we are talking about a surplus, but uh, the imports of base metals and some intermediates, uh, they, they have uh, contracted. That shows that our domestic production is uh, lowering or contracting. So these are the challenges for the uh, policymaker, especially uh, they will uh, be uh, keen about uh, the welfare impact, especially the rural sector, uh, due to uh, political uh, concerns. One option is uh, to effectively reverse uh, the myopic policies like which killed the agricultural productivity, like reintroducing this uh, fertilizer. I'm a bit of supportive of a fertilizer subsidy at this point because of the food security and uh, the other productivity concerns. But for no, not in uh, the uh, long run, like uh, the fertilizer subsidy we used to have, uh, a blanket fertilizer subsidy, but some sort of subsidy to uh, improve the productivity and reduce the food prices domestically, so to discourage the demand for higher wages, kill the inflation, and also uh, avoid uh, a reverse migration from the industrial sector to agriculture. And um, uh, once this industrial sector starts to grow, at least uh, to uh, revert back to our 2019 level, then uh, the policymaker can effectively start uh, ambitious uh, reforms. Uh, another important thing is uh, prioritizing uh, the available foreign exchange, especially these food imports. I, as I said, 89% of food imports are under imported, Im, uh, import uh, controls. Imported foods are really important for the uh, urban and uh, suburban uh, population, especially the poor uh, urban and uh, suburban population. I, in a recent paper found that uh, the food poor people in urban sector uh, and altogether the food poor people, they incorporate more imported calories to be cost efficient. So with these uh, current uh, SCLs and uh, the higher autarkic uh, price, their uh, cost efficiency of calorie consumption uh, goes down. This uh, needs to be uh, reversed, prioritizing uh, food imports and possible removal of uh, these uh, high tariffs on uh, black gram, uh, green gram, and uh, there are import controls that discourages imports of uh, milk powder. We, these are very important uh, uh, calorie uh, sources of uh, the rural, uh, estate sector and urban sector uh, poor households. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have uh, a few minutes for a couple of questions. Uh, 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 do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, the mic can be passed to you if you have some questions. Uh, Professor Atukaurali, uh, when you look at our external account statistics, we have a very large remittance component. So when you look at our external debt and you look at uh, debt to export sector, when you consider how large our remittances are, should you also be looking at current account receipts rather than only exports? Because a lot of this debt service was predicated on these large remittance inflows. My question is, should you be including that in your statistics when you look at Sri Lanka? Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, actually, when I calculated... Use the mic. Uh, Use the mic. Yeah, sorry. When I calculated the debt servicing ratio, actually, I have not included remittances. I think it is worth having an alternative. But related to remittances, uh, could I make one important point? It seems that in our policy debate, there's a huge emphasis on remittances, right? Actually, not related to the data issue, but it is good that our workers go overseas and send money home as a temporary thing. But I really don't think we should not, fo don't think that we should focus labor exporting as a long-term strategy. I think it is the same to the country. If you look at Thailand, Thailand was a labor exporter. Uh, Thai workers went to Korea, Middle East to work until mid-80s. Now, Thailand is a net labor importer. I mean, Thailand create jobs they are local. That, that should be our focus. Think about Japan. Uh, in the Indo period, Japan was a labor exporting country. These people who went to Latin America, they were called Nicaragian. Even the Prime Minister of Peru was a Japanese one, right? Now, Japan is a labor scarce country. People, uh, people come to the country. I think our target should be to retain our labor in our country. It's a, uh, they, when uh, in the policy debate, people talk about how to increase remittance, and I Sometimes I uh, want to cry when I listen to it, right? This country with this much of potential should generate jobs for our people within our borders. It is good to depend on remittances uh, for the time, right? Every country in the region, uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, uh, all these countries, even Vietnam, they were labor exporters. But now, they are labor important. Another story that come to mind, we had this conference to commemorate the 50th or 25th anniversary of Central Bank. John Williamson, one of the prominent economists, and uh, he's, he, did, uh, he died recently, he looked at what is happening in Sri Lanka in the early 90s. A lot of foreign investors were coming into the country, and uh, Martin Trust, the fa father of our April industry, uh, he had created 15 companies, right? William, uh, John Williamson said that if this trend continues, in five years' time, Sri Lanka will be importing workers, right? We lost those opportunities. Uh, they have my message is that good to rely on remittance for the time being. It's a shame to talk about uh, labor exporting as a national development strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. So we'll bring the panel discussion to a close on the note of, uh, of not trying to miss. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, first, again, I learned a lot from Chanda's presentation. Uh, I have three uh, questions. One is uh, very rightly mentioned, the tariff reform, right? Uh, what is required today is Sri Lanka has a two-tier tariff structure. When you look at the ITC latest uh, tariff profile, which is uh, uh, annual publication. You have custom duty over and above another layer called para tariff. So what is required is tariff rationalization. Tariff rationalization. Now, here we talk about para tariff in certain policy, policy discussion. Uh, in certain industrialized even to mention removal of para tariff is not permitted. Professor Sirimala Beratna is here, he knows what is the context. So this is the kind of um, thinking we have. We need to move away from that. 
Second, uh, thank you for bringing the subject of this uh, trade facilitation. With due respect to uh, Dr. Sarat Rajabhatirana, uh, you know, tariff, uh, sorry, uh, trade facilitation is equally important like the trade reform. Why? The multiple benefits of the trade facilitation is well discussed globally in the WT, right? Why I am saying in Sri Lanka now uh, sign up to the trade facilitation agreement. Uh, now it is implemented in 2017. I recently visited the WTO website. How the other countries have committed undertaking the tariff uh, trade facilitation commitment. Here I have a table. I just file it. No, under the WTO trade facilitation agreement, there are three sets of uh, categories, category A, category B, and category C. I'm not going to go into detail. Category A means with immediate effect, you undertake commitment. There are 36 measures. Thailand has undertook 91% of the 36 measures uh, committed to implement. Country like Cambodia, 82%. And Sri Lanka, 29%. Much lower. And bulk of our commitment are now categorized under what you call the category C level. That means you acquire capacity and implement. My question is to this audience, why Sri Lanka cannot commit more firm commitment implementing these things? This give the multiple benefits of the trade facilitation is well known. This give very positive signal to the foreign direct investors. This fact has to be uh, uh, mentioned. The other one is this, um, uh, you know, the, uh, I agree with uh, Professor Chandra, but what he said, Chandra said, you know, the tariff is important, it's a price-based measures. But in 2019, we had the uh, number of tariff line 1,400 under import restriction. Now, this has jumped to 2,428. But the, with the recent removal of 600 items uh, is now much less. Now, what is required here to highlight is 90% of imports are concentrated on 709 tariff lines. So, what is required at the, as a policy reform, no, top-down top -down approach to remove the quantitative restrictions not like the Export Development Board and others are doing. So you ask, uh, you know, traders to make requests, okay, my imports are, you know, the restricted. This need to be a, not the bottom-up approach, but this has to be a top-down approach other, to make the traders' life easier. My last point is, on trade facilitation, what is required is, ITC, I, I worked for the ITC some time back, you know, we have done a lot of work to establish the what you call the single window. Private sector traders are, you know, they are frustrated. Certain few political decisions could make this change. It, other countries, like us, they are already making good progress. Thank you. I just want to say, in the order of things, about economic policy, I don't put uh, facilitation on the top, actually. So I, I think we should include facilitation, but it's something up to the country to do. Just signing agreement, that's a good thing, but the point is that that doesn't really bring us the bacon. We have to really do it, uh, do it uh, for people to come and make a presentation uh, and say, here, we. We are losing so money because it takes so it's so expensive to go to the port and get things exported. There are many stuff of I put it as illegal payments involved there. So we have to we have to clean that up, and then the, yeah, so facilitation will be a factor there, but not in the order of things. If you ask me, that the immediate thing to do, I would say no. But we can do it as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, everybody. We've run out of time, so we'll bring the panel to a close or a note of that Sri Lanka should not miss any more buses on the road to uh, reforms of their trade policy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Atakurala, Dr. Raj Patirana, Dr. Vijay Singh, and Mr. Ratan Sabapati. Research Analyst at Advocata Institute on stage to give us a presentation on labor markets before we move on to the scheduled panel discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Satya. Um, so good morning, everyone. So as uh, Satya mentioned, actually she didn't, but uh, what this presentation is about is before we start the labor panel, um, I'm going to give a bit of context into the current labor force and population of, of Sri Lanka. So we'll be looking at some um, figures um, and some stats and in the panel discussion, um, the panelists will pick up on some of these and discuss the driving factors. Um, so we'll jump straight into it. The first thing we'll look at is the population of the country. So for 2022, UNFPA uh, estimates that the total population will be 21.6 million and the average annual rate of population change will be 0.3%. So this graph actually shows that the total population of the country has been um, on a continuous growth since the 1960s. But this growth is not expected to continue for long. Um, according to ADB estimates, uh, this population growth or this era of continuous population growth is expected to end in about two decades. So the driving factors of this um, end of an era essentially is first of all the rapid decline in the fertility rate of the country. So in 1960 the fertility rate was 5.5 uh, for the country but in 2019 it's 2.02. The other um, driving factor is the increased life expectancy due to the investments the country made in human development. And our life expectancy is comparable uh, to that of the average upper middle income economies as well. So because of these two driving factors uh, predominantly, the ADB estimates that the population will peak in 2038 and then contract. So after 2038, the, uh, Sri Lanka will be facing a contracting population. So if you actually analyze the, the growth uh, or the proportion of the population in each of these broad age groups, you see that due to the factors that I mentioned previously, um, everyone or uh, Everyone in the age group, um, other than everyone in the age group of 65 and above, all the other age groups are going to contract, whereas the uh, number of people in the age group of 65 and above is going to increase. And this has a direct effect 
on the age dependency ratio because each member in the working population is now going to have to support people in retirement, essentially. So if you look at a, some key factors, or key stats, actually, we see that the working age population will peak in 2027, and then it'll start to decline. Um, then the population of those age 65 or more will double by 2040 compared with 2015. Then by 2030, one in five Sri Lankans will be over the age of 60, and most of it will be women. So this um, will actually make Sri Lanka one of the uh, fastest aging countries um, in Asia. So now we'll look at the labor force, where it is currently. So in 2021, according to the DCS definition, which is on the slide, uh, the total labor force was 8.6 million. And the total labor force participation rate was 49.9%. Um, and the unemployment rate was 5.1%. I think one of the key defining features of the Sri Lankan labor force, uh, particularly the, the particularly the labor force participation rate, is that the male labor force participation rate has consistently been higher than the female's uh, participation rate. And parallel to that, you can see that the unemployment rate uh, for females are actually much higher um, than for males. And if you take a look at the change in the uh, labor force participation rate, um, between 2002 and 2020, you can see that the biggest contraction, or the largest contraction, has happened for the age group between 20 and 24. So now that we know the, uh, the labor force who is, uh, and the proportion of employment, essentially, and the labor force participation rate, we'll take a look at where they are located, where they're employed. So, if you look at it in terms of the major economic sectors, you see that a majority of them, from, uh, ranging from 40 to 50 percent, is actually employed in the service sector. And the graph on the right shows you that um, the, in terms of employment status, uh, most of these employees are private employees. And another key feature in the Sri Lankan labor force is that our informal employment is twice, or in most instances, more than twice, uh, our formal employment. So informal employment, uh, according to the DCS, is um, essentially anyone that is not subjected, subjected to national labor legislation, um, income tax, social protection, and employment benefits. So these could be unpaid family workers, um, informally self-employed people, domestic workers, as well as informal employees in the formal and informal firms. So the other thing that I want to touch on um, is the migration, because we can't talk about population and labor force without talking about the migration. So you see the, uh, the graph on the left actually breaks it down by skill level. So you go from housemaid, unskilled, uh, to professional. And on the, the graph on the right shows you that uh, the female registrations with uh, Sri Lanka Bureau of Foreign Employment, um, roughly around 90% of the women that register there register for um, clerical or mid-level, uh, sorry, um, for clerical and related uh, jobs. And I would like to end this presentation by just looking at the stock of migrant labor force um, that is in the country or has been in the country previously. Um, this model cannot be extended to 2020 and 2021 because the forecasting methodology uh, does not hold due to the 2000, there was a large number of uh, returnees in 2020. But this is where uh, the migrant labor force is at. So with this, I will end this presentation. Um, the panelists will pick up on some of these numbers and just talk about what drives these, what's causing these numbers to be the way they are. Thank you.
now invite Dr. Ramani Gunatilaka, economist and independent consultant, Ms. Shamali Ranaraja, attorney at law, along with Amita Arud Pragasam, independent policy analyst on stage. Over to you, Amita. Can you please give me that slide? Thanks so Okay, so uh, the title of this panel is actually Labor Reforms for Inclusive Growth. And I think a good place to start then is the second part of the title, which is Inclusive Growth. Um, in Sri Lanka, men are twice as likely to be employed as women. And uh, Sri Lanka actually has the 20th largest female labor force uh, participation gap or gender gap in female labor force participation. That's a huge problem, given um, what Udarini has just pointed out, given that uh, Sri Lanka's uh, population is aging, um, and the working age population is going to be shrinking after 2030. Um, and given that uh, Sri, Lanka's, Sri Lanka's labor force participation, female labor force participation, if improved, will unlock certain things for our growth uh, and for gender equality. So my first question is to uh, Ramani. What, what actually has gone wrong? Uh, what is preventing women from joining the labor force at equal rates uh, or, or similar rates to men? Uh, thank you. Yeah. It's on? Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak about this topic. Uh, it's a very complex question, and in fact, I prepared a slide which graphically shows uh, the problem. I, I hope we can have that slide up. Yes, well, until the slide comes, basically, you have to imagine women as being boxed in by concentric, uh, by concentric series of barriers. I have tried to do it to show you in a graphic way with this slide. So if you take the red circle, those are the personal individual characteristics which form barriers to taking on paid work. So for example, uh, if you are not in good health, obviously you will not be able to work for pay. Uh, if you are married, then you are less likely to participate in the labor force. And that is basically because of the dual burden women have. Uh, they have their the social norms have given them the responsibility over household work and care work. And when you get married, you are running households, you are having children. And then that doesn't give you enough time, and it, or rather it makes it costly for you to engage in in paid work. Then, if you are, if you don't even have the O levels, you're only secondary educated, then you are less likely to participate in the labor force because there again, the kind of job you may find in the labor market is not a good job. So it may make sense for you to stay at home and take your children to tuition classes and do housework rather than go out to work and get a lousy job. Uh, then, of course, skills endowment. Yeah, as I said, education. Uh, composition of the household. If there are more male earners in the family, then women are regarded as secondary earners. They are less likely to go out to work. Uh, if you are poor, of course, then you are driven to work, to, to earn income. So it's distress-driven. Then you have the local market conditions, 
which are another set of barriers which women have to negotiate. Uh, are, are there suitable jobs nearby? How is the transport? Uh, what do employers think of hiring women? By the way, most male employers are unlikely to hire women. There is uh, considerable gender discrimination in the labor market. And then, of course, you have the macroeconomic conditions. Uh, and I think you must have learned enough about them in the previous session. So I won't describe that further. If there are questions, I will answer. Thanks, Ramani, for that comprehensive answer. Um, Another thing that came up in the context slides was our unemployment rates, which are actually quite low. Um, according to the slides, around 5.1% in 2021, um, and on par roughly with the region. Uh, but you've written elsewhere that these rates actually mask another problem, the problem of youth unemployment. Um, given that we've seen so many young people participating at the recent protests, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the constraints to youth, in unemploy uh, youth employment and why, why perhaps young people are uh, finding it difficult to, to get jobs. Uh, I, there are many reasons. I, I think the two most important, that's according to my perspective, is first, economic conditions at large. The economy hasn't been generating enough jobs, enough decent jobs for men and women. And in any country, young people find it difficult to get their first job, lack of experience, and so on. So, so there's a whole bunch of factors in the macro economy and the kind of jobs which are being generated by the backward, technologically backward production structures that we have been stuck in for decades. Second thing is, we have a skills mismatch. What employers want, young people don't have. And that goes back to serious weaknesses in our education system. Uh, many Sri Lankans, unfortunately, compare themselves to India and say, oh, we are highly literate, uh, and so on. But actually, India has two countries in there. One country which is highly educated, and the other country in there is not. In our country, what has happened is that in key market-oriented skills, key market-oriented skills are missing from the education system. And this is not uh, rocket science. There have been periodic assessments by the National Institute of Education itself showing how poorly our students perform. For example, in 2016, they found that among grade 8 students, 50% got less than 5% uh, passes in math. About 66% got less than 5% in science. Uh, I mean, and, and these are the STEM sub these are part of the STEM subjects which we need to propagate, right? It's not happening. International assessments, comparative assessments have shown that our students have not gained anything in terms of cognitive skills, problem solving skills, uh, the ability to think independently, the ability to pick up verbal clues, uh, context related questions they cannot answer. So, so actually speaking, most of our people, our young people, don't have the skills needed for the market. Uh, and so our production structures are also geared towards low-skilled work, con high concentrations of low-skilled work. And we have been in this uh, rough uh, for decades. Yeah, and I, I can't imagine that that's going to get better given that the nature of work is so rapidly changing as well. Uh, if we don't update what we, we provide our, our youth in terms of skills, then we won't be prepared for the transitions in the future. Um, my next question is to Shamali. 
Um, as you know, again, from the context, we saw that levels of informality in the economy are twice as high as levels of formality, and that's not unusual for developing countries, of course, but it is a problem because it means workers aren't entitled to social protection and employment benefits. And you know, we see even in former firms, um, there's this use of manpower agencies and so on uh, because of, of the costs of labor law. Um, can you help us understand why these costs exist? What is wrong with our labor law um, that makes informality so much more attractive to workers? And, and why have previous efforts at reform failed uh, to generate the kind of legal protections that we need? Thank you, Amita. And good morning, everyone. And thank you to Advocata for inviting me to um, discuss these issues, which are very important given the context that we are in. I have a few slides, and if I may take a few minutes of your time, because our labor law is a bit complex, uh, so that I can set the stage for the next part of the discussion. Uh, till the next slide comes up, let me um, explain to you that um, those of you who are either employers or employees in the private sector or entrepreneurs uh, will know Right. So Sri Lanka has about 40 laws that relate to employment. And if that's not bad enough, on top of all the bad news that Ramani has been giving you, uh, only about 15 of these are actually in use on a day-to-day -day basis. We have two different labor law regimes, one for the public sector, which we do not touch today at all because that is uh, at the behest of the cabinet of ministers in whichever department they're employed in. And the private sector labor laws are what we are discussing as we are talking about resetting Sri Lanka. But unfortunately, these have not been compiled into a labor code. What is, uh, you can find online as a labor code is merely a collection of the labor laws. There is no kind of uh, uh, logical sequencing for this. Uh, if, if, you, if you are an employer or an employee trying to understand this. Uh, most are dated before independence. I'll, I'll put up the list shortly and you can see how far back some of these go. Um, and some of the new developments that Amita and uh, Ramani were talking about are not even contemplated in most of these. And even our amendments are sadly out of date. Um, there are paid leave and holiday anomalies. We look at something which compares sectorally. And that's another problem that we have, that you have multiple laws that apply in different sectors. And it's a sectoral law in some ways, as well as uh, a stratified law. So this is very complex for someone to understand, and labor law should be something which is accessible to everyone, especially to employees. Um, as a lawyer, uh, my bread and butter is the dispute resolution system for any lawyer, and Sri Lanka is completely outdated, overcrowded, and the delays are something which are nightmares for the ordinary litigant. We'll look at some stats as we go on. Um, and uh, employers, unfortunately, in the private sector, bear the total responsibility for many of the costs of labor. Unlike in other countries where uh, unemployment benefits, social security benefits are borne by a central fund or by the state with contributions from employers and employees, Sri Lanka lands the whole lot on the uh, head of the employers. Now, I have a lot of clients uh, who are employers. I'm a practicing attorney as well. Um, and uh, one, someone recently asked me, why would anyone realistically employ anyone in Sri Lanka? Because it's so complex and it's so difficult. So if I sort of spoil your morning a little bit more, uh, if you look at the labor laws, the first of the big ones that we use on a daily basis, which is the maternity benefits ordinance, was enacted in 1939. Now, this is very salutary from one point of view because Sri Lanka has been uh, in the forefront of providing for benefits for women. And I know one of the blue chip companies in Sri Lanka just announced that they have uh, awarded equal paternity and maternity benefits to their employees, which is uh, way ahead of where we are right now in terms of the law. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. And I think uh, Ramani will speak of this later on in her discussion as well. But if you look at the years in which uh, at the end of each law, you get the year which it was enacted, you will see that most of them are either pre-independent or immediately after independence. And legal amendments are very slow. And they have not been done in a cohesive way 
or in a pragmatic way, not aligned with development goals, not aligned with the needs of the country, not aligned with the new skills development that Ramani was speaking of with such discouragement after many years of campaigning for this. Uh, and you can see that it's a piecemeal kind of labor law. So not only is it difficult to understand and to apply and to benefit from, it is also difficult to amend and bring to a point where it is actually useful to reset it for inclusive growth. Uh, not everything is doom and gloom, but I must say the picture gets more complex uh, if it were possible. Not only do we have labor laws and regulations which you must comply by, but you also have uh, agreements with trade unions which also set employment standards. There are customary practices which also have to be taken into uh, consideration. And then you have superior court decisions. We go by Brit the British uh, law system, where superior court decisions set precedents which must be followed by employers and employees. So you can see that the labor law system really creates a lot of work for lawyers, but really doesn't do much for employment growth or for employers and employees to understand and apply and also comply with labor law. So this is where uh, um, the question that Amita posed to me about informality comes in. In this context, there, is more in, there are more incentives for employers and employees, really, to stay in the informal sector than to be, become formalized, than to enter into formal, uh, the formal sector. That is not the only reason for informality, but it is a very big one. So this is why we have something around 58% informal employment, as well as a large proportion of informality within the sector, which is what uh, Amita was referring to earlier. And uh, uh, the labor law, the complexity of the labor law is one of the reasons, one of the large reasons which come there. So uh, let me distress you some more. It seems to me my role today uh, by looking at paid leave. Now, paid leave is a good thing. It's a bad thing. It's uh, what every employee is entitled to. But Sri Lanka makes it hugely complex by having different leave systems for different sectors. Why? Uh, you can ask the parliamentarians who are here and also post it at your next general election. Uh, if you are covered by what is called the Shop and Office Employment Act, which applies obviously to shops and offices, including banks and the retail sector, there's another set of regulations which apply to the wages boards, which are usually the uh, skilled and uh, unskilled categories, uh, which are in trades and essentially in the uh, agricultural sector, so a different set. And the public sector, of course, is here just for comparison. Now, I must also tell you that the, both the, uh, some law em employees can be covered by two different laws. If you are working in, the, uh, in a factory, but you are in the office as, a, say, a timekeeper or HR officer, you would be covered by the Shop and Office Act. So it's, you can't assume, an employer can't assume, simply because you are in a trade facility or a manufacturing facility that all your employees are covered by the same law. There would be two disparate systems. Can you imagine the nightmare this is when it comes to rostering of work, scheduling of production? Because, as you can see, the leave benefits differ. Under the Shop and Office Act, you have one and a half uh, days weekly paid holidays, but the wages boards has only uh, one unpaid holiday very often, sometimes paid. And the public sector, of course, has two lovely days off and now an additional day on Friday as well. So statutory holidays, you have eight statutory holidays and the poor holidays. I have clients uh, who have customers in the U.S., for instance, especially in the IT sector. And I have been sitting in on Zoom discussions where the customer says, really, you have a holiday because the moon is full? <laughs> you know, this is very difficult to explain. And if you employ someone, it's not that you can't employ someone on the poor day, but if you do, you have to pay an additional half day's wage, regardless of the number of hours worked. So you can see how the cost keeps adding on. And really, nobody uh, can explain to me this question of why do you have a poor holiday, other than Vesak and Poson and maybe uh, uh, the Perahara uh, holiday in Kandy, where I come from, uh, may be required. But rest of the days. I, don't, I know the Sri Lankans here will know that nobody goes to the temple other than the old Ames and the, you know, the kids who are forced to go to Dhamma school. So, but this is not something that any political party will ever touch either. 
So we are, we are resigned to having these 12, eight, uh, 12 holidays, which fortunately do fall on Saturdays and Sundays, and you get a little bit of leeway, but that's like Russian roulette. From year to year, you don't know really where it's going to end up. So we have annual, uh, under the shop and office, we have 14 days annual leave, which is a good thing. We have casual leave, but not sick leave, which became a nightmare in the pandemic. But some employers do act very responsibly and give sick leave in addition. But look at the public sector. You have 45 days off on top of everything else you already have. So when you look at the total non-working days, now this is factoring in the extra day the public sector has on, as a holiday on Fridays now due to the transport restrictions, you can see exactly how much Sri Lankans are required to work. And any day on which you have a paid day off and you require an employee to work, you either have to pay uh, premium rates for overtime uh, as considered as being extra time worked, uh, or you have to give a day off, which is another complex thing. So really, uh, uh, the labor law does nothing but add a lot of work to lawyers who want to specialize in labor and employment law. So, but for the ordinary entrepreneur, I'm afraid it's a minefield. Now, um, very quickly, because I know we are on limited time, but to me as a lawyer, an efficient dispute resolution system is a no-brainer if you want to reset any country and to look at uh, how we can progress, because uh, disputes are part and parcel of human interaction. But Sri Lanka has a very, very, um, you know, well thought out dispute resolution system on paper in the law, but it doesn't work because it's bogged down in delays and uh, extraordinary complications. Now, without going into details of the court system, we have a system for uh, workplace disputes, which comprises of the Department of Labor. Uh, which is handled by the Commissioner General of Labor, or the labor tribunals, which are not even part of the court system. They are like grassroots tribunals, where an employer and employee, upon termination, can go and sort out their disputes. And the law, as it was drafted by Parliament, the Industrial Disputes Act, said, you must finish, you shall finish this case within six months. But what happened? The Supreme Court. I told you earlier, I think, that the Supreme Court decisions also have an impact. I said, no, 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 no. This is not mandatory. This is only recommendatory. And it's only a guideline. So you can take as much as you want, much time as you want. That's not exactly what they said, but that's the way it is interpreted by the, uh, uh, the LT uh, uh, structure now. And I can tell you that uh, uh, I had a case recently which took five and a half years from the date of filing to conclusion. And it's not one single reason that contributes to these delays. But the statistics speak for themselves. You can see that institutions and disposals remain virtually unchanged. And I have only given you uh, the data up to 2018 because from 2019 onwards, it's far too depressing to tackle before lunch. But now, with the problems of transport and, and the one day off extra that you get, uh, it has become even more difficult for litigants. So. If you are, and, and I, I should also explain to you that labor tribunals, after hearing a case, a, a complaint by an employee that they have been terminated unjustly, has not really a legal jurisdiction, but what we call a just and equitable jurisdiction. So the labor tribunal president has the right to decide whether it is fair. That is all well and good. But the employee can be reinstated in employment with or without back wages. So after five and a half years, when an employee is reinstated, can you imagine the chaos it creates? Because the company has moved on, uh, uh, the salary structures have changed, promotions have been given, and this employee comes back into the position that he was at the time that he left, because the labor tribunal cannot promote him. So I'm not saying do away with reinstatement, but I'm complaining, I, I really draw your attention to the delay, because if, how can an employer an employee sustain a dispute for six and five years or more. An average, let's say, is about two and a half to three years when the recommended time is six months. And then expect to have a peaceful industrial environment. I have had clients who have come for due diligence uh, reports. And when we report back, they say, no, we don't want to invest in Sri Lanka, external foreign clients, because this uh, uh, time period of uh, dispute resolution is unacceptable to us. 
We cannot have a business plan where we do not know the outcome of the case for such a long period and also cannot know in a, whether that person is coming back into our workplace or not. I cannot explain this to my shareholders, my stakeholders, and therefore I would rather go somewhere else where it doesn't take you know, a, a legal team of about 15 people to explain all this to me. So this is the problem that we have. So if you ask, uh, if you ask uh, a practitioner what are the problems, uh, it's outdated, it's piecemeal, and it takes far too long to resolve disputes. So what we need are things like alternate dispute resolution, mediation, commercially provided mediation, because uh, the, uh, the Commissioner General of Labor and the Labor Department does provide some sort of mediation, a portion of mediation, but unfortunately they cannot mediate beyond a particular point because they are also enforcers and regulators. And uh, uh, whether that system functions efficiently or not, is a whole different um, panel discussion for another day. But let me tell you that for the entirety of Sri Lanka, there are only about 700 labor officers working out of something like 44 district officers, district and sub-district officers. So you can imagine the sheer lack of capacity uh, in the dispute resolution system to handle any of these complaints speedily. And all these 44 laws and the 15 that are in regular operation, wherever there is a dispute ends up, either in this system or in the Labor Department, where you have the 700 uh, labor officers. And I think that's being optimistic after the pandemic as well, dealing with these problems. So uh, this, in a, well, in a very uh, sort of uh, extended nutshell, is the answer to your question, I hope. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make is that there are far too many, many incentives and far too many barriers to formalization, both on the part of employers who wish to formalize, enterprises who, that wish to formalize, as well as employees who would want to work in the formal sector. Thank you, Amita. Thank you for that very comprehensive answer. Um, I actually want to ask a follow-up question on this, uh, pertaining to the political economy in which um, our labor laws are negotiated, uh, lobbied for, and so on. So in, in Sri Lanka, our trade union membership is quite low. It's about 10% uh, about of our labor force is, um, uh, has membership in a, uh, in a trade union, and that's uh, 350,000 in uh, 2020. So um, quite low, low uh, compared to uh, global statistics as well. And my question is, why? Um, you know, is this because of some kind of politicization of trade unions? Is it something else? And in particular, I want to draw, uh, I mean, draw on recent political events as well. You know, we had uh, recently the arrest of a trade unionist, uh, uh, Joseph Stalin. And I have to ask you, is there, is there some kind of a relationship between these persistent crackdowns on trade unions by the political class um, and the fact that trade, membership, uh, trade union membership is so low? What is the relationship and how does that impact our labor law? I think Amita is hell-bent on getting me arrested by the time I get out <laughs> of this hall. But uh, that trade union data, that 350,000, hides also the fact that this is mostly in the pri public sector. The private sector doesn't have uh, that many... Uh, um, density of trade unionism is quite low in the private sector despite what uh, uh, people seem to think. And Mr. Stalin is also in the public sector. So the teachers' union that he heads is in the public sector, and trade union membership in the public sector is easier because they are all congested or gathered in one department and or one ministry, one sector. So it's easier to unionize them. But in the private sector, it's a different story. Uh, we have very fragmented trade unions. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got the data, but at the last count, these 350,000 members that the trade, uh, Labor Department reports as being members of trade unions were spread across something like 2,000 unions. So you can see the numerical strength of these unions are lower. Some, of course, have large membership, but Sri Lankan law only requires seven members to sign a certificate of registration for a trade union to be registered. So you have... a. Uh, 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 sort of a dispersion of the membership over very small trade unions. So uh, their bargaining strength is lower. Their political strength still is uh, to be contended with because uh, of the reputational impact, I think, of uh, uh, trade union personalities. But again, they are outdated as well. Their trade union structures are outdated. And um, 
they don't really serve the membership uh, correctly. Uh, if I look at things like maternity benefits, for instance, uh, a large, there are large sectors where 90% of the members of a particular trade union uh, is female. But unfortunately, they do not uh, reflect the campaigns. Uh, they are not reflected. Their interests are not reflected in the campaigns of the trade union, especially because the leadership is all male. Now, I'm not male bashing here, but for uh, you know, historical reasons and uh, practical reasons, women are not reflected in uh, the leadership of trade unions other than in a few plantation sector trade unions. So you have a situation where your membership and your leadership are not in sync. For instance, the maternity benefits ordinance um, provides for maternity benefits for uh, working women, um, you know, which have been brought into uniformity now in 2018. But up until then, the shop and office sector had higher benefits than uh, the wages board sector. Now, this is ridiculous because maternity benefits or maternity paid leave is not given for the benefit of the mother, but benefit of the child. So I cannot understand a system where it took so long to change something which should be looked at as the right of a child, and the right of the child should be the same regardless of where your mother is working. Same way, there are no benefits for non-working women. Uh, you don't have the same kind of uh, benefits for um, entrepreneurs or own account workers, unpaid workers, because of this problem where interests of women are not taken up at this level. So uh, you have a um, you know, failure on part of the system as well as uh, those who are supposed to advocate for uh, the rights of women and, and the workers themselves. I can give you in any number of examples where uh, their rights are not reflected. And this really has become the problem uh, where uh, getting better conditions are uh, concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Ramani. So compounding the problem of Sri Lanka's aging population is the fact that many skilled workers are now you know, leaving the country because of the economic crisis. Um, you know, there aren't official statistics on this, but anecdotally there are so many reports of uh, you know, people, especially in the younger age categories, uh, just migrating overseas, creating some kind of brain drain. I think um, in some industries, this problem is worse than in others, like the tech industry, for example. Um, my question to you is, you know, is it just skilled workers who are leaving at this point? Um, and, you know, what can be, you've talked about, you know, s skills development and, and how we need to make sure our skills development is in line with our, our, our job needs. But uh, those are perhaps more long-term, um, you know, projects. In the short run, what is it that we can do to, to prevent uh, further brain drain? Um, in the short run, we need political stability. We need to implement a credible structural adjustment program. Uh, we need to get out of this economic abyss into which we have fallen. Uh, there's nothing going to be quicker than that. Uh, that is the situation. And also when it's not just in terms of skills that we are going to have a problem. Uh, basically, if you look at labor supply, you have actual numbers, bodies, right? Then you have the skills. Now, this crisis is hammering both these aspects. One, as you said, is the emigration of skills and also unskilled workers. They are being driven out, of, by, driven out by poverty and it is at those two ends of the skills spectrum that people are leaving. And the middle lot who, who, are, who even in the best of times were a problem in terms of their employability, we are going to be stuck with more of them. So then the issue becomes, how do we transform these people into the kind of labor force needed, I mean with the skills and all that, needed to, to help grow out of this crisis? Because without labor, you can't do it. On the other hand, in a crisis, fertility rates drop. Nobody wants to have children in this uh, crisis. Uh, I mean, you're spending time in the petrol queue. 
one poor woman gave birth while standing in the passport queue so long term this is going to have a huge impact on our economy on our society because we were already an aging population now with this crisis and the impact it is having on the labor market on the demographic structure of our population uh, actually the prospect is quite frightening uh, there aren't going to be people around to look after all these old people and i will be uh, in that generation uh, uh, so so uh, yes i mean there's no alternative to political stability which is absolutely necessary for a credible economic reform program which will get us out of this mess okay so related to this i mean i know it's quite audacious to talk about like immigration policies when we're still struggling to retain skilled and unskilled labor at this moment when there's an economic crisis but i've heard so little debate among sri lankan policy makers about how how we would actually attract talent back into the country maybe not right now when there's this economic crisis but we do need to do this at some point given the out outflow of of individuals and out migration um and also given given the diversity talent and resources in our diasporic communities you think do you think this is a conversation that we need to be talking about or, or that we need to be having at this moment i think we should have had this conversation at least a decade ago uh before things got screwed up so bad that nobody wants to come here everybody wants to run away uh i i don't think in in fact i don't think emi you know immigration is a priority right now the priority here is to keep the people we have uh most sri lankans who go abroad and settle abroad they do that not because they don't want to be here i mean this is a lovely country even at the not so best of times though now it has become very bad it's just that the opportunities the the culture of political victimization uh, there is no meritocracy you know there are all these problems the social political cultural problems that have to be fixed to make this country attractive again for people to want to come back to i mean many people after the war did come back thinking that things would be better but you see the 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 conflict ends but your underlying problems remain and and actually those problems got worse yeah so so i think it it it's not the it's not a priority right now. it's keeping people here making it attractive again that's the priority yeah and i suppose that relates back to what you were talking about earlier in terms of female labor force participation as well like how do we make workplaces that actually attract women into into the uh, you know the office and into the uh, labor force how do we create a society that's actually attractive to different types of communities and genders and so on um so we've discussed increasing uh labor force participation but you know perhaps it's uh just as important to talk about job quality uh to talk about decent and good work uh, and not just you know more work um for example women in the plantation sector uh have the highest labor force participation rates amongst women but their wages are less than 1000 rupees a day and they actually do very very difficult work um i know that sri lanka has seen little change in the structural composition of output in the last decade um is that a problem should we be thinking of ways to move sri lankans out of low productivity sectors like agriculture perhaps into higher productivity sectors um and you know relatedly like how important is it for sri lanka at this moment uh to be thinking of transitioning able bodied men and women out of the military or the pub- certain parts of maybe the public sector into other types of jobs well we don't know how many how many people the military employ uh i i don't think the numbers are clear in any country because this is supposed to be a national security problem 
but having said that we don't need to look at the military the public sector is bad enough in this country of 22 million people 1.5 million are employed by the government this is totally unsustainable what is their value addition what is their productivity what is more this is not just a, a question of cost in terms of salaries and a mounting pension bill it is also in terms of uh rent seeking corruption obstruction uh, we have got a it's a guardian not now the the public sector and and repeated efforts at retrenching have been undone by the politics uh, our people sri lankans have to realize that you can't live beyond your means uh that is the fundamental thing every most people want to live off the government and a lot of them do but basically that has impoverished our country i mean uh, it's it's really time to wake up and smell the coffee here we cannot employ such vast numbers doing nothing having said that sorry i went off uh, on a tirade uh, what was your question <laughs> so i was i was also talking about the structural composition of output from Correct. agriculture Correct. which is also considered a low productivity yeah, sector yeah absolutely in at a recent conference uh, organized by the national science foundation Uh, some engineers uh, had given some presentations i hadn't heard this myself but i heard this to a colleague they estimated they kind of said that we are at the, at ir 2.1 still industrial revolution 2.1 now all these other far eastern countries they are in the fourth ir so what has prevented us from upgrading our technology there are many reasons for this one is again the kind of incentive structure private sector firms make more money through government contracts given this skewed system than in investing in technology and getting the workers and so on so so we absolutely need to support digitalization uh, support the upgrading of skills and this is an absolute priority because we have got into this mess because we haven't done this uh, quite apart from the fact that people who are managing our affairs taking decisions don't know what they are doing they have no idea of how modern economies work they think that economy is just a question of giving subsidies across the board where is the money going to be generated nobody knows so so that to that the poor quality or i mean the lack of capacity has has been a real problem for our economic progress and i imagine we have to do all of this quite carefully as well because uh for example we were talking about women participating in the labor force but you know women are predominant in certain sectors like the health and education sector as well so we want to uh perhaps think about this quite carefully and and not try to i mean i not do this overnight like policy making has been done in the recent past maybe um okay so we've spent some time now talking about the context uh of labor reforms and and some of the problems uh, of labor reform as well um i want to ask both of you what you think uh, are some solutions uh, and of course to prioritize as well the solutions that, that you're going to talk about uh, so what three reforms uh, would you recommend to lift sri lanka out of this situation and actually to help promote more inclusive growth uh, so shamli maybe we'll start with you what three reforms should sri lanka uh, think about and and try to implement now thank you amita uh, could i just have my last slide back i just kept that for uh, now and while we wait for that let me just jump in and uh, add something to what ramani was saying about uh, migration policy 
Uh, it's also no worth noting that whatever we are looking at later on, that uh, women are now just one third of migrant, migrants who migrate for employment, migrant workers. But, and that has been a huge achievement coming from you know, over 50%. But still, the skills uh, picture has not changed. Over 90% of women still migrate for either domestic work or unskilled work, which is the same. So we have to think about what Ramani was talking about also. What is the skills development? What is the value addition that we do? And whether we need to keep uh, in, uh, permitting or encouraging women to migrate for this low, kind of, low skill kind of work because your question of decent work comes in because you're migrating into individual households where protection is impossible. And we speak of, you know, constantly in the media about harassment and uh, uh, violence against migrant workers. But this is uh, impossible to tackle given that they migrate into individual households. And there is a huge demand for care workers who can go into institutions. And this is a sector that we need to look at because uh, the resetting is minimal in achieving this. So having put my two cents in there, let me come back to your question. Um, before, you, before I answer your question of what is my wish list for reform, I just want to look at why uh, reforms have failed. Because Sri Lanka has tried to reform labor law many times over. And this has failed because lack of political will uh, for genuine reform. Because at the same time when um, recommendations made after extensive consultations have been just dropped, thrown out, baby bath water, bath wash, everything, at the same time, something else comes in, like the retirement age law in November 2021, which no one has asked for, and which is virtually a dead letter because uh, workers will keep retiring at 55 in order to withdraw their EPF benefits before the whole caboodle comes down in the economic crisis. So this is the perception, and the 60 means nothing. But no consultation, no request, except from one sector for a very specific reason, which is the plantation sector, where there was a huge brain drain of uh, skilled managers, senior staff leaving at 55 and going into uh, consultancies. They asked for the retirement age to be increased, but without doing that specifically for one sector, the minimum age uh, of retirement was set for the first time by law in Sri Lanka at 60, where no one had asked for it. So th this is clearly, again, political will. Uh, same way, during the pandemic, we have not even started talking about the Teva Act, uh, which is, you know, everybody's bugaboo, but it's really not, a, uh, you know, uh, something that uh, really benefits or affects a large part of the uh, informal sector or the formal sector for that matter. So I didn't touch on that deliberately, but the maximum compensation under Teva, uh, the Termination of Employment of Workers Act, was 1.25 million. In the middle of a pandemic, when employers were already struggling, the minimum compensation is revised to two and a half million with no consultation whatsoever. So you can see that there are lots of other agendas other than what is pragmatically needed, which has been the uh, downfall of any labor reform effort. Very often, the most recent labor reform effort was to, in 2018, when there was a, a single labor law which was drafted and uh, many consultations were held across the board. But it was dropped for no reason, with no reasons being given. And the investment of uh, over 20, two years of research was just abandoned. But that is because it is bled by external consultants and not by the government. And the consultants spent most of their time convincing the stakeholders, the trade unions, workers, labor officers themselves, that this was needed. And that is not sufficient. That is not good enough. This is the government of the day which has to take responsibility, which is difficult again given the musical chairs cabinets we have been having, where the incoming minister completely drops whatever agenda that has been there for labor law reform based on the current needs. So this has to be led by very firmly the highest office uh, of the executive or the legislature, because without that, labor law reform will simply not happen. And uh, the government lacks capacity, but for goodness sake, get that capacity in either by way of uh, paid consultants or, uh, you know, capacity building of your own people. But it has to be done from within, not from without, because uh, many agendas, you know, uh, ulterior motives were attributed to this reform uh, uh, efforts, 
many times over, not in the just in the last cycle. There is lack of cohesion, I said, as I said earlier, your development goals and your labor laws do not go hand in hand. And you, you have to look at what areas that you need to focus on, especially as Ramani said, employment creation is a no-brainer. But that is not possible under the current, it will not happen under the current labor law regime. Lack of trust between employers and trade unions. We are still in the colonial mindset of, you know, the unions talking of uh, neoliberalism and colonial oppressors and, you know, exploitation and all that. Without looking at this as a participatory effort, you need each other. And the trade unions really have not done any work at all in uh, bringing the new entrance to the labor market into uh, um, uh, the trade union membership. I can ask Mr. Jafferji uh, how many employees of Advocata are members of a trade union. So, or, or other entrepreneurs here. So, the problem is that you know the unions are just trading on their prior reputation. They do not have any strength worth talking about, no negotiating strength, but still they have a prime seat at the table. So this must be changed either one way or another. You must increase trade union membership to genuinely represent those who need to have a seat at the table, or you have to take uh, some sort of collective decision on the basis that we are part of this same effort and not competitors or oppressors and, uh, uh, you know, the oppressor. Uh, the lack of a trade union structure, as I have said last, is one of the key problems because the Employers Federation represents employers, uh, a fair number of employers, at least at labor law reform discussions, but the trade unions do not speak with one voice. They can't even agree on the minimum percentage uh, of uh, membership that is required for a trade union to be recognized for bargaining. So uh, this really is my wish list in the sense that you asked me to identify three. Uh, one is that labor law reform must be led by the highest level of government. Two is that the stakeholders must have a seat at the discussions for labor law reform. And three, which cuts across all of this, is that the dispute resolution mechanism must be made efficient, must be made productive, must not become a barrier and a hindrance to growth and employment creation. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed, Ramani, your tirade earlier. So I think all of us in this room are, are quite angry and quite frustrated, and we, we feel a lot of uh, despair. Um, so I guess the final question is to you. What are your three reforms that you'd like to see uh, to take Sri Lanka out of this crisis? Okay. The first one is the easy one, uh, which has defied uh, being dealt with. And that is to reform the law related to work time. Uh, enable women who come under the Shop and Office Act to work at night. Uh, allow flexi hours, allow part-time work, not only for women, also for students. Uh, in advanced countries, waiters in restaurants, jobs like that, packers in supermarkets, they are students. So, so to deal with the problem of labor shortages in terms of body, uh, we, we need to reform that particular law in addition to others. So that's the low-hanging fruit. The other one is, as I told you earlier, we need to upgrade our production structures technologically, move ahead. Uh, the incentives have to be given, people have to jump on board. Uh, I, I have to admit that, uh, actually, it's, it's not I who thought it, but, but one of my cousins, he said that it is our generation which failed. Uh, we didn't know enough about technology, we held others back from going ahead. And that is probably true, uh, but, but we need to fix this. The, the third one, I mean, actually, even to speak about this, it frightens me. The, the whole situation of education, I mean, for three years, kids have not gone to school. I mean, children haven't learned to read or write. How is this going to affect the capacity 
of future workers how are we going to fix it there are children say who are in the primary cycle the middle school cycle they i mean when things were supposed to be good they couldn't read or write or do maths properly now how is it going to be i mean it is it is really frightening and then the is this issue of uh, malnutrition people can't buy buy food nutritious food that is going to affect the cognitive abilities of children and and affect their productivity this is this is a time bomb uh, which is ticking and which we have to address and it's no point going through the education ministry and their syllabuses and do 10 subjects and all kinds of rubbish which is not necessary even and which is not going to make them productive workers all that stuff is stuffed into their heads we don't need that we need remedial education we don't need this exam oriented system which thinks that good exam marks mean functionality in skill we don't need that i think we need to move to a system which is more like the danish system or the finnish system where it's continuous assessment and and children are tested for what they can do not what they know and this is the time for that because we don't have time to waste you know getting all those people uh, i mean the the 18 year old will be 21 when he or she finishes this syllabus and leaves school can you can we afford that in this country where we have an aging population we have to do uh, the other thing is we have to increase the school day uh, this 7:30 to 1:30 is nonsense increase it to 3:30 and then push them out of school by 16 17 plus that is how we can get the labor we need uh, so yeah those are the three things okay thank you so much for this highly engaging conversation with two brilliant women um and i think that brings uh, this panel discussion to a close thank you very much for for participating in this conversation thank you thank you dr ramani um ms shamali and amita for that, for that very engaging panel i think the audience can use a tea break now to stomach all the very dog Hello everyone welcome back to the live streaming studio of Reform Now conference organized by Advocata Institute under the theme let's reset sri lanka and just to give you um, you know some up the day day 2 of the conference first we started off with a very fruitful discussion on debt crisis structural adjustment and trade policy and soon after you might have witnessed the context setting presentation for labor market and along with that that was followed by a panel discussion on labor market reforms for more inclusive growth as you can see we're sticking to what we believe that we are ready to reset sri lanka and all of these topics have to be discussed and that's exactly what is being encouraged by advocata institute sri lanka so now it's a tea break we thought of having a chat during the tea break that is to let you know about something that's going to come up soon after lunch now reforms on agricultural land is something we all are waiting to hear and we are all are waiting with open mind to see what sh- can we do what is our role and what is the government's role these are questions that we can ask each other so soon after lunch you might um, you will experience a session on agricultural la- uh, land this panel discussion will focus on the existing laws on the ownership allocation and use of agricultural land and the reforms necessary to make the sector more efficient and productive so we thought why don't we set the stage soon um, right now before we go into the main session later on so to stage uh, to set the stage pardon to set the stage today i have the moderator himself from the panel discussion mr sudarak arya ratna a research associate at advocata institute hello to you sudarak hi hello and i would like to start the conversation with you uh, we all know that 85% of the land in sri lanka is owned by the government 
right? Yes. And now we're going to talk about reforms related to agricultural land, and you have been part of this research, you have done this research, so let's set the foundation to this discussion. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, 80 to 85% 8 of the land that is in Sri Lanka is actually owned by the government, mm -hmm. and that has proved to be really challenging when it comes to the agricultural sector, because if mm -hmm. you are a commercial investor who's looking for a big um, extent of land to cultivate, mm -hmm. Or even if you're like a small, like traditional farmer, mm -hmm. um, land ownership is a huge issue because, you know, the government is very picky about, you know, which land that they own. They're going to let private investors and farmers, yeah. you know, cultivate. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, what we see is that a lot of uh, people who want to invest in agriculture actually uh, kind of turned away by the system because, you know, there's a process that you have to follow. Yeah. Uh, to get approved to cultivate on a land mm -hmm. um, and then of course there are you know the the process itself takes a long time to actually you know for you to actually be able to have the management rights of that land yeah. and then there are various rest restrictions on what you can and cannot do on that land mm -hmm. so um, you know a lot of the times we see a lot of investors discouraged by all of these you know rights issues allocation issues mm -hmm. um, that has really impacted the agricultural sector of Sri Lanka so agricultural land reform I think is very important mm -hmm. I think one of the main components of agricultural land in Sri Lanka that is owned by the government is uh, the tea plantations that you uh, see in Sri Lanka uh, the Plantations are actually formally identified as uh, the regional plantation corporations. Right. Now, all of this land is actually owned by the government since the land was uh, taken over by the government right. in the 1970s. Uh, but since 1993, uh, what we have seen is that some of this land, not the entire, but the mo majority of the tea plantations that are owned by the government have been given over um, to the private sector in the form of a lease for a limited peri period of time. So 35 to 40 years um, is the lease period for a lot of these uh, plantations where the management rights have been given over to private companies. And that's how you see a lot of the plantations today being run by the mm -hmm. private companies as opposed to the government. But still the ownership of these lands are within the government and that kind of sets the pace and the agenda of these um, uh, plantation companies because again the government has a role to play and you know put yeah. in restrictions a lot yeah thank you so much for setting that uh, foundation to the discussion because it's important to know like who owns this land because um, simply talking every citizen of the country need to understand what we're talking about right and I, I'm sure just like me you must be also having the question now when just like Sudharaka said uh, these plantations especially the plantation lands, you said they're owned by the government and they're being managed by the private sector. But again, there's something critical to be understood. They, these will be managed only for a limited time period. Now, what's going to happen after this limited time period ends and what is the sustainable plan that you see? Actually, no one actually knows what is going to happen after yeah. the <laughs> lease ends because, you know, there's not been a plan. Right. Um, you know, a lot of the plantation companies that are Right now, the private management has mm -hmm. expressed willingness and interest in continuing yeah. to uh, be able to manage the land because uh, that way they will be able to come up with more sustainable uh, plans for the, the land that they now manage. Right. Uh, but on the side of the government, there has not been a clear indication of, you know, uh, what the plan for the future is. So right now, everyone is in kind of a situation where they don't know what is going to happen to the land. And we see the impact of this on the productivity of the land actually uh, because when you only own it for a limited period of time mm -hmm. and when the sus when you talk about sustainability and you sus talk about sustainability in the long term mm -hmm. um, if you are not too sure that you're going to be able to reap the benefits of investments that you make into the sustainability of this land then you're not going to be actually investing right. uh, in the way that we that you should for instance mm -hmm. if you are to take at the Take a look at the tea bushes in in most of these plantations. They are sometimes, you know, 50 or 100 years old. Sometimes, you know, some of the tea bushes have been, you've had to remove the bushes and just like the land be without cultivating because, you know, the bushes were not productive at all. So replanting right. is an, an essential component of productivity when mm -hmm. it comes to tea land. Mm -hmm. uh, but none of these, or rather most of these um, tea plantations have not been showing an interest mm -hmm. uh, to actually get into replanting mm -hmm. to make this investment in you know refilling wherever you know trees might have, might have died and all yeah. uh, because you need to actually 
you know invest a lot of money for these activities mm. and you know it takes a few years then for the tea bush to you know grow to a state where you can you know um uh, get some harvest out of yeah, it yeah. um so if you're not too sure that you're going to be actually reaping the full benefits of it you know you will not invest and that's what we see happening today right. so that has really impacted um uh, the productivity of the government owned uh, privately managed you know plantation land um i think a, an interesting point of comparison is when you look at the tea small holders mm -hmm. which is you know usually a few perches or a few acres of land that mm -hmm. you know are privately owned and privately managed and you yeah. know is usually you know run by the family um you see that um around 40 uh, or rather around yes around um uh when it comes to the plantations mm -hmm. around um sorry when it comes to the small holders the small holders only own around 60% of the total cultivated land yeah. um in sri lanka but uh when it comes to their productivity you see that they contribute to 75% sometimes more than that of the total tea produced in sri lanka right. uh which means that they are much more um productive and efficient than um the the plantation companies and one of the reasons for this is that you know the plantation companies have not had the incentive and the motivation to actually put in place the investments that are needed for long term sustainability including the replanting and infilling activities mm -hmm. uh which you know has greatly reduced their productivity over time right okay thank you so much and rephrasing the question i think uh, it's about um, i asked a question about the sustainability plan and you mentioned that as at now there is no plan as at yet and the government hasn't really taken steps to look forward to the future and take um, corrective measures um, during the panel discussion on agricultural land do you expect to find answers from the panelists and how are you planning to what is the result you expect out of the uh, discussion Uh yes during the panel discussion we one of the panelists that we have is actually Dr Roshan Raj Dure mm -hmm. who is uh the head of the plantations um at Helis right. so he basically runs the Thalavakali tea estates and he has been studying this uh topic for quite some time um so he will be uh giving a presentation on the state of uh, agricultural land in sri lanka um this will be more of a generic presentation not necessarily related to the tea industry but most of this uh will obviously be relevant to the tea industry and during the panel discussion also he will speak about the necessary to have uh, agricultural land reform if we are to increase the productivity of uh, agricultural activity in sri lanka and especially this point will be emphasized through uh the kind of um uh, rethinking that we need to do in uh in terms of you know how are we going to restructure the state on land so that you know agricultural agricultural activities can be done in a much more productive way yeah thank you so much and i would like to understand what really drove you to get into this research and what was your initial thinking uh yes uh, so basically what we find is that in sri lanka all the tea is like a major uh, export uh, sector of sri lanka um uh, we don't really have a lot of uh, policy action um that is kind of targeted towards increasing the productivity of the sector mm -hmm. and you see that in statistics as well if you look at you know sri lanka's uh, tea production statistics you see that in sri lanka the the sector is generally much more labor intensive um and also it is much more expensive than in other countries to um you know produce tea and this of course is having an impact on the the profitability of the sector mm -hmm. uh, and the international competitiveness of the sector because if you can't sell uh tea at a price that's competitive uh compared to the prices that you see in other countries then you're not really going to do well in the national market mm -hmm. um although ceylon tea still has the you know the traditional um recognition that is it has had as one of the finest uh, black teas and the best orthodox black tea in yeah. the international market i think we see a lot of consumers especially in the mass market moving towards you know tea that comes from uh countries like kenya mm -hmm. um and also you know india have been you know these countries have been posing a lot of challenges to uh Sri Lanka in terms of you know our competitiveness of the comp competitiveness in the international market mm -hmm. uh because they are much more productive at the, what they do compared yeah. to Sri Lanka and one interesting um 
fact here is that in Sri Lanka, actually the the tip duckers earn the highest wages in comparison to other countries, oh. you know, like Kenya and India. Uh, but what we also find is that you know in Sri Lanka the tea worker are not just the pluckers, but you know everyone engaged in like various levels of activity in the mm -hmm. supply chain. Mm -hmm. They're the least productive. Um, if you look at tea pluckers in Sri Lanka, you know they generally pluck like 15 to 20 kilos a day. Uh, if you take a country like you know Kenya, sometimes they pluck up to you know 60 kilos of uh, tea leaves up uh, a day. Mm -hmm. And we try, kind of try, try to you know, identify uh, what the reasons for this lack of productivity is. So one of the reasons that we uh, identified is that, you know, of course, the land ownership structure might have a very, you know, oh, yeah. important role to play in the, you know, discouraging of productivity. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you know, how this land ownership structure and how the employment uh, um, in tea plantations is structured in a very traditional colonial way. We have not really yeah, moved actually, past I was, that. I was going to ask that question from you. Let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the employment structure pla on yes. plantations as well, uh, Sudarak. Yes. Um, so in the plantations, now this does not relate to the uh, tea small holding uh, sector, but uh, in the estates, what we see is that we still kind of rely on the the the, the employment structure that was left over by the British right. uh, from the colonial days, and you know, like the employees, the tea pluckers and the other workers in the field, they all live in what we traditionally call the lines yeah. in the the, the uh, plantations and then uh, they kind of, the way in which it is structured is that they're always under the command of your, you know, supervisor. Mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of uh, room for agency, individual thinking, creativity and all of this actually has created a very... Um, I don't want to say slave-like because it's not slavery, yeah. uh, but, you know, something akin to that in the sense of you uh, don't see the, you know, the workers having a lot of agency in the work they do. And that also then translates into their productivity uh, because that means, you know, if they are not motivated to do the work, yeah. uh, then they are not going to be very interested in doing the work. So either, you know... I think it, uh, just to disturb you, I think it narrows down to the basics of employment at any workplace, like motivation and value, um, like valuing their services as well. So yes. that everyone is into, they know what they're doing. Yes, actually yeah. in the previous panel discussion, Dr. Uh, Ramani Kulintilaka yeah. and um, uh, Mrs. Randraj uh, spoke at length about, you know, the, the employment structure and employment issues in Sri Lanka. And this is some one of the things that they spoke yeah, about extensively. Yeah. Um, so what we see is that because of this structure that we have in place, uh, there's not a lot of, you know, uh, creativity. So one of the things that actually uh, Dr. Uh, Raj Dure, who's going to be a panelist in the Agricultural um, uh, Land Reform um, Panel, um, has been pushing for for a long time is to restructure how we do like you know th something like you know um tea plucking right. so right now what happens is you know you're you're given like a row of like tea bushes and told to pluck yeah. and you know if you're not motivated to pluck you're not going to pluck a lot of tea leaves i yeah. mean that's understandable yeah. right uh, so what he wants to do is actually to to assign plots of land mm -hmm. and treat them as small holders themselves. Mm -hmm. So you assign them a plot of land. Now the ownership of the land will still be, will still be with the government, the government obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but you assign them a plot of land and tell them, you plant your tea bushes, you do the replanting, you do the infilling. Then this is a kind of an incentive to do those activities as well, which yeah. is kind of lagging in the tea sector today. You do all of that and you increase the productivity of your plot of land and then you pluck it and you give it to us to process in our factories. Mm. So then what happens is you are given agency or what you want to do. You know, you will put in, you know, the amount of work you will need to put in to, you know, you know, meet your own like expectations of income. Mm. And then if you then give it to the factories and the factories process the tea and then they sell it in the auction or international market or whatever yeah. and then it's sold at a market price and then you promise them a ratio mm -hmm. of that income. Yeah. Um, so right now what's done in the smallholders is smallholders also give their teas to these fa same factories, right? Yes. And smallholders get 68% of the sale value of the tea. Yeah. So if you come up with the same, you, you know, if not same, similar, you know, 
uh, mechanism to actually compensate uh, these workers um, at the market value, then, you know, they will themselves see that, you know, yeah. they can earn more if you put in more work and all of that. And also the kind of, you know, very regressive employment structure that you see right now in the tea sector is actually going to, uh, you know, improve. Uh, because then, you know, you're your own boss and mm. you will be, you know, you will not be answerable to like a uh, uh, supervisor anymore yeah. who might not, you know, like uh, it's respect about your, that yes. It's your own thing, like when yes. you are self-driven, would yes. you answer, like yes. you know you're doing it for you? Yes, yeah. so actually some plantation companies have... Um, experimented with these, you know, different alternative yeah. models and, yeah. you know, a lot of uh, those models have proven to be successful in not only increasing the productivity of the sector because yeah. end of the day productivity of the sector is very important, yes, yes. Uh, but also the incomes of, you know, the 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 the, the tea workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is something that you need to kind of keep in mind uh, as well when you talk about, you know, um, the the tea sector, the employment aspect of it, as well as you know the productivity the li at large productivity mm -hmm. aspect of it, and you know these alternative models have proven to be very successful mm -hmm. at doing it. But the thing is, because of again how uh, the the political economy surrounding the tea plantations have been structured, there has been a lot of opposition to uh, you know reforms of this nature by unions yeah. uh, because again unions also have a role to play right now in plantations in asserting sure. power and you know uh, influence mm -hmm. um, and of course if you do change into a system where you know you're on your own boss you're no longer under supervise then you know the the need for a union might disappear right yeah. um, so because of that um, we have heard that you know these alternative like proposals a lot of time you know run into a lot of obstacles so this is obviously something that we need to you know collectively think of and you know have a more um, cooperative uh, strategy to like you know deal with and I think if we can actually figure this out and improve the productivity and improve the incomes I think this is going to be you know benefiting everyone and it's going yeah. to be a win-win situation yeah. for this country. Thank you so much, Zarka, for joining with this discussion today. And I wish you nice. all the very best for the panel discussion. You're Thank gonna you. You're going to soon after the lunch. Um, I think from whatever you said, everything that you said, what I understand is what we all need is a system change. Yes. Not just in agricultural reforms, but in any form. Yes. Right? So right now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to cut off to the main hall as we are now ready to begin the session soon after tea break. And it's going to be on termination versus resuscitation. And gentlemen, we will now commence our third panel discussion for the day. The current economic crisis has or will lead to a record number of businesses being rendered insolvent. Our next panel will discuss whether Sri Lanka has the robust resolution framework necessary in order to resuscitate these businesses. To start off, I would like to invite Dilshani Vijayvardhana, lawyer and board member of Union Bank PLC, and former commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission of Sri Lanka, on stage to deliver a presentation. Oops. Can I start? Okay, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to address this August uh, gathering at a critical juncture of our economic history. Sri Lanka's economy is in a critical state of health. The fact remains that many corporate bodies and even individuals will be bankrupt at the end of this crisis. Many corporates, as we speak, remain in the proverbial ICU state, fighting to survive. Some amongst them will certainly die, while some others, with some external help, can be resuscitated. An efficient, reliable, and transparent insolvency regime is sine qua non for a robust financial system and plays a key role in the reallocation of productive resources, investor confidence, and forward-looking corporate restructure. Under our legal system, when a company is insolvent, it can be wound up under the Companies Act of 2007. In the case of an individual or a partnership, 
they would be declared insolvent under the Insolvencies Ordinance of 1884. I leave it to you to do the maths as to how updated our insolvency ordinance is. The law on bankruptcy is essentially procedural in nature. Its role is to organize collective regime, ensuring the preservation of pre-bankruptcy entitlement to the maximum extent possible. Till the enactment of the Companies Act of 2007, when a company faced insolvency, the only available option was to wind up that company. However, under the present Act, alternative legal mechanisms are available to resuscitate a company. These provisions will be discussed by me shortly. Before I proceed, I like to flag that there are certain duties, fundamental duties, when a company is facing insolvency. And I'm sure many companies, as we speak now, is in this state, but unaware of this legal obligation. Under Section 219 of the Companies Act, there is a duty cast in law to each and every single director whose company is facing insolvency and unable to pay its debts to forthwith call a meeting of the board of directors to consider, one, whether you should file a petition to wind up the company or to appoint an administrator to run the business of the company. Failure to do so will expose the board of directors and each and every single director to personal liability. I repeat, personal liability. So most directors are completely unaware of these legal obligations or duty. And I think it's in this time of crisis, it is extremely important that you be cognizant of your legal duties. Where a company is not viable, the main thrust of law should be for a swift and efficient liquidation. Due to the time constraint, I will not dwell on this topic, for it is mostly procedural. But hopefully we can discuss it in the panel discussion. As Sri Lanka steps in to its darkest decade with the current economic crisis, many businesses will struggle to survive. The question remains, are there provisions in law to resuscitate them, or should we let them to die? It is a truism that rescuing a business preserves employment, potentially provides creditors with a better return, and obtains for the country's economy the benefit of a restructured, rehabilitated regime. The Companies Act of 2007 has two broad schemes available to resuscitate a company. One is to a compromise with creditors under Part 9 of the Act and voluntary administration under Part 13 of the Act. Truth be told that unlike other jurisdictions like the UK, Australia, New Zealand, which has the identical provisions according to end, which according to published data shows that these are the most resorted to provisions in these jurisdictions here in Sri Lanka, either due to the igni igni ignorance of its existence or simply incompetence of our professionals to work them. These legal restructuring tools are much buried in our statute books. As they say, never let a crisis go to waste. This may be an opportune time to have recourse to the restructuring tools to resuscitate distressed companies. Part 9 of the Act deals with compromise with creditors. This part sets out the procedure by which a company can enter into a binding compromise with its creditors. What does a compromise mean? It's a compromise, is a Compromise between the company and its creditors, which includes cancelling all or some or part of the debt or varying the rights of its creditors or the terms of the debt. In the UK, a compromise with creditors, absolutely similar provisions that we have in Sri Lanka, is governed by the UK Insolvency Act of 1986. What is interesting to note is that in such an agreement in the UK is supervised by very trained, expert people. 
called insolvency professionals. Now, who is an insolvency professional? They are what we call insolvency practitioners trained as professionals who have gained a very broad, wide practical experience and they are licensed to practice as insolvency practitioners and they are licensed and regulated by a professional body. Sri Lanka has no such profession and in this time of crisis, God only knows we need them. So maybe this is an opportune time to introduce such an expert set of professionals. The other mode to resuscitate a company is voluntary administration under Part 13 of the Act. Voluntary administration is an insolvency procedure for companies having the potential to be rehabilitated. They are in the ICU, not dead, struggling to survive. So for such companies, there is a uh, ventilator option, which is called voluntary administration. This is a new concept under the Companies Act, and it's modelled under the New Zealand Companies Act, which in turn is modelled under the Australia's Corporation Act. And according to data, in Australia and New Zealand, when a, when the, a company is in distress, this is the go-to sections. But again, unfortunately in Sri Lanka, they still remain buried in our textbooks. Administration is a voluntary process initiated. Who initiates a voluntary administration? It's the company. Why? Because it is the company who knows how good, bad, and indifferent your financial situation is. It is a board of directors who actually know how good, bad, and how critical your state of health is. So it is a process by which, which is initiated by the board of directors of a company. What happens in an administration? When the company is in administration, an independent administrator is appointed. The administrator takes control of the company's business and acts as the company's agent. It also can enter into binding contracts on behalf of the company. Now in Sri Lanka, we do not have professional to become these independent administrators. And most, if these are worked, most likely some accountancy firm will be called upon to be an administrator. Whether they have the skill set, I leave it to the audience to decide. However, in the UK, administrator will assess the business potential, whether there is hope for this company to be turned around. As I said, in the UK, which has identical provisions like in Sri Lanka, for an administrator has to be a qualified insolvency professional. And I think the business community here should seriously consider looking at the criteria, how business prof uh, insolvency practitioners uh, are trained, uh, they are regulated, they are licensed, they are absolutely with very broad spectrum of experience to take a company, turn it around. And we do need such professionals. What does administration mean for a creditor of the company? When an administrator is appointed, there's an automatic moratorium on anything due to creditors. It is not possible for creditors to bring or to pursue any legal proceedings against the company or its assets. There's a moratorium. Also upon the appointment of an administrator, director's powers are curtailed. A director cannot exercise any management powers which is in conflict with the administrator's duties. If the company's turnaround comes out of the ICU and is healthy, then the board of directors will take over control of the company. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the UK introduced a new piece of legislation, unlike Sri Lanka, they seize upon an opportunity to bring about change, and they brought about this piece of legislation called Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act of 2020. Under this act, upon a director's making a statement saying we are insolvent or likely to be insolvent, 
the court will appoint a monitor. Basically, the board of directors will manage the company, but the monitor will supervise to see whether proper steps have been taken to resuscitate the company, to turn it around. And um, as, as I said earlier, a monitor is again an insolvency professional. Perhaps Sri Lanka should take a leave from such legislations which are specifically designed to resuscitate companies during an economic crisis. Before I conclude, I would like to suggest few ideas which have been successfully implemented in other jurisdictions, just food for thought. In Sri Lanka, the law relating to insolvency is found in the legal patchwork of material. You want to see insolvency ordinance, which is of 1884, which deals with insolvency of individuals and partnerships. Companies, it is under the Companies Act. Then there are state-owned corporations, they are under that particular statute. So it's a myriad of legislations that deal with insolvency regime. Countries like the UK and even India, surprisingly, brought all these pieces of legislation under one umbrella. Uh, I think recently Murtaza emailed to me um, the, um, I think the committee papers, I think the policy papers in India dealing with the new insolvency and bankruptcy code which is of 2015, and I'm like, oh, wow, oh, great. I'm sure it will take a couple of years for it to be enacted. And I researched on the internet, and I was like very pleasantly surprised. Policy papers of 2015 was implemented in law as their new insolvency and bankruptcy code in 2016, just less than 12 months where um, second thing that I think I would like to suggest and you know, discuss further is to bring about this new set of professional calls, insolvency professionals. All advanced jurisdictions have them. They manage, they are very trained, they are basically have particular exams to follow, they are constantly updated with the new knowledge, new business environment, and they are regulated, there is a professional body that you have to be part of. Hence, I think it's an opportune time we look at a professional body set up in this, during this economic crisis. Another session, another suggestion which I think India has brought about is setting up a tribunal to look into all these insolvency and bankruptcy matters. Because with a composite tribunal with a, sp a specific expertise and qualification to determine matters relating to insolvency and to do away with going to court. Our uh, last resort, unfortunately, has sadly proven to be inept and absolutely inefficient. Also, it is no secret that laws delays is a serious bugbear in our judicial system. India, under their code, which is absolutely salutary, has addressed this issue by stipulating a timeline. You have given 180 days to resuscitate the company, or you can go to court and ask for extension, but there is time frame. So you can't sit there and let one person with a dilatory tactics prolong this entire process. In Sri Lanka, I think even in the last session, delay. We can't get anything done expeditiously, and when it comes to delay, delay is time and delay is money. So I think there's a suggestion I, I, I strongly recommend, because when we go to court system, we are bogged there for decades, and um, um, a, a, a time-based a time-based resolution on insolvency proceeding. Another reason there is delay in insolvency proceeding is lack of information. India set up this amazing new concept called information utilities, which is pretty interesting. You, it's like a portal where you have to upload all your information, uh, your, your accounts, um, your creditor list, uh, your payment schedule. It's, it's, there is a pretty uh, sort of a um, it's a structured setup where you, as a creditor of a company, could access that portal 
and get information about your debtor. So in the case, you, you, you technically know what's how good, bad, or indifferent the health situation of the country, uh, sorry, of the debtor is. So another th thought to ponder about setting such a system where information, critical, can be access, accessed by creditors. I think Sri Lanka's financial sector should lobby for change, for a more efficient, transparent, and expeditious insolvency regime in Sri Lanka. When is the time to act? It is now. Sri Lanka is currently reigning with opportunities for change. And when it is reigning opportunities, we should put out a bucket and not a thimble. Thank you. Thank you, Dilshani. Those are certainly very salient points to consider. Please do take a seat while we invite the rest of our panelists onto the stage. I would first like to invite Dr. Harsha Cabral, the President's Counsel. Mr. Nirosh De Silva, the Managing Partner at Horizon Partners Limited. Along with the moderator for the discussion, Chanaka Vikramasurya, consultant. Over to you, Mr. Vikramasurya. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me uh, <clears throat> start off by trying trying to put some context uh, to all of this. Um, now, yesterday, I think we all heard Dr. Uh, Viratai saying that how um, uh, Thailand uh, had a, introduced a very sort of robust uh, bankruptcy mechanism uh, in their path uh, to getting out of the crisis. So I think he was quite emphatic about it. Um, so needless to say that it's something that uh, we are going to need as well. Uh, what is also worthwhile remembering is <clears throat> uh, Thailand had a considerable amount of fiscal space uh, that they had um, going into that crisis or coming out of it even in terms of you know Thai baht debt being considerably low. So they had the they had the fiscal space to um, you know support their banking systems create debt recovery vehicles, capitalize debt recovery vehicles, etc. Needless to say, we have absolutely no fiscal space. Uh, it's an understatement uh, uh, to say that we, we, we have any. Um, and let's face it, banking sector NPLs are going to go through the roof, um, hopefully not to the crazy levels that uh, we experienced in that they experienced in Thailand where I think he's mentioned that he went up to something like 47 percent but at with the current high interest rate regime and and the demand contraction working its way through PNLs over the next year over the next six months through this whole fiscal year NPLs are going to go through the roof for the banking sector um, a, a, a few statistics also to perhaps put this in context is that, uh, and these are just gleaned out of, um, you know, speaking to some of the bigger banks, if there's anybody from bank supervision uh, out here, we, I'm stand to, stand to be corrected, but, you know, typical recovery rates on um, secured debt uh, in the banking sector is about 70% on capital. 70% of capital and maybe about 25% of interest. So if you work that out, it's it's still less than 50%. Uh, that's in a, that's in a, in in a, in a reasonable macro environment. Um, so needless to say, going forward, that's going to go down further. Also worth noting that um, you know 60 60 to 70% of the SMA book is um, clean. And when I say clean, it doesn't have any uh, fixed tangible collateral behind it, and perhaps about 90% of the corporate book. So for the banking sector, this is very much going to be the need of the hour, um, uh, that we are going to need a very robust uh, 
um, um, recovery debt recovery mechanism, re, uh, company restructuring mechanism that sits outside the court system. Because as we heard from Dilshani also, the, 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 otherwise the court system is going to get inundated. Um, I mean, a, a standard liquidation process, even for even with parate, sometimes with um, injunctions and even mortgage uh, laws. I think Dilshan, you can correct me. It would take anything sort of, you know, five years, uh, and that's only going to get pushed further down the road if courts, like I said, courts get inundated. So all this points to um, the simple fact that um, uh, liquidation is obviously not going to be the answer. Uh, we need some other mechanism. Um, so, in just with with all that in context, uh, can I start with you, Harsha? You heard Dilshani uh, uh, saying, you know, where we are, um, and maybe you can just give us a little bit of. Uh, I mean, my understanding from Dilshani was that we do have some sort of um, um, uh, uh, insolvency process embedded in in the legal provisions. Um, maybe a little bit about history, why they, how they came about, when they came about, and um, you know, if it's inadequate, what do we need to do to get there? Thank you. As a corporate law practitioner and a person involved in uh, reforming the law, I will try to share some thoughts. Firstly, we have traditionally been following the English law. So we have had the statutes based on the, we initially had the 1860 Joint Stock Companies Act, where again we had liquidation in that. Then in 1938, we had the company's ordinance. Again, we had winding up procedure in that. Then in 17 of 1982 Companies Act, we had that. So when it came to law reform and company, the, for the new Companies Act come to being in 2007, there was a gestation period of about nine years. So in the process, we had to look at, they were, we were given 10 uh, basic pillars, sort of uh, position papers. And uh, one happened to be to look at this aspect of winding up. So the traditional concepts were not working. And I would try to emphasize on the weaknesses we have in our system. One, the biggest mistake I see is, well, the winding up position in the Companies Act, Dilshani referred to, is supported by the winding up rules. Now, the winding up rules are 1938 rules. So you can imagine how archaic they are. To start the winding up, then to proceeding it winding up, how the creditors come in, how the provisional liquidator is appointed, liquidator, receiver, uh, the, 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 the the reports they have to make, all this is based on the 1938 rules. Absolutely archaic. Even under the new uh, Companies Act, the rules have just we have followed the old rules. That was meant to be changed. That is one. Then in 7 of 2007, a new provision was brought in, Dilshani referred to, the administrator. You know, part 13 deals with that. If, uh, exactly from sections 400 to 426, brand new 26 sections were brought into the Companies Act for administration. On top of that, as Dilshan mentioned, we have the uh, compromises and arrangements, creditors, things and all that. So, when this was discussed, it was finally decided by the Company Law Advisory Commission at that time that insolvency and business turnaround is something that we have to look at separately. Because the Insolvency Act, the totally archaic 18 uh, odd hundreds uh, act, was basically for individual insolvencies. If you look at the old case law, you would see that a lot of individuals, they declared themselves insolvent to get away from several other liabilities. That is a very common thing, but that doesn't happen anymore. So, leaving that part out, we came up with the 7 of 2007, dealing with the administrator part, then the existing compromise, and the traditional winding up. Now, winding up under the uh, sections uh, from 266 to 399 deals the entire part of winding up in our company law. 
that is basically the old law we had there are no improvements done because we were thinking of looking at a separate law to deal with that so traditional winding up system we have in our system is basically winding up by the the court that is uh, the there are situations where the there are several grounds given how to wind up a company and then the second mechanism is uh, members or creditors voluntary winding up and the third is winding up under the supervision of court so the most common thing is the winding up by court the first one because uh, uh, voluntary winding up and uh, voluntary creditors winding up or uh, members winding up is rather difficult because if there are liabilities it's very difficult for them to approach that route now other mechanism of winding up is a fairly easy thing say for example if the company is unable to pay its debt you can move court to wind up the company now the amount that is referred to actually we increased it from 5000 to 50000 it's now 50000 so inability to pay debt so any creditor uh, can send a letter it's not a letter of demand it has to be by under the hand and uh, saying well if you don't pay this amount i'm going to wind up the company now when we go to court it is pretty easy to get this company wound up because you make that application then initially when you support that application the court gives you two days that is one for the publication it's a newspaper publication and the return of that to court returnable date and the appointment of a provisional liquidator who becomes a liquidator thereafter so the legal fraternity as i must say missed you to a certain extent there are friendly winding up you get a friendly creditor so send that letter and the company comes and says well i have no objection you wind up the company so and you know that when you go to wind up a company that procedure with our system the loss delays can be taken from say 5 to 20 years right because if it's a final appeal to the supreme court the appeal will come up only after about 10 years so they know very well that this limited liability concept of where uh, the shareholders are liable to up to the extent they have will never happen because by the time the uh, uh, this thing is over uh, well you don't find anyone there was one particular case i was involved uh, super, uh, one of the supermarkets uh, there was this say someone moved to wind up the company a definitely a uh, situation where the the, the directors want to get away. They had sold, siphoned off money, all that, and then a winding up petition. Then the company comes and says, "Okay, we are in a position where we cannot go forward. We are not objecting to the winding up." Now, to object to the winding up creditors, there were some 800 dot creditors. Because all these people who have put a miris packet or whatever little, little things to the supermarket, they were creditors. So there were 800 dot creditors who walked into that courthouse, and the courthouse was packed. And the poor lady judge, she got frightened. She couldn't accommodate this crowd because everybody is trying to file proxy. And uh, she asked me, how do we get out of this? I said, no, you give them a date and say before that you file proxy in the registry and make your, because under the rules you can do that. So that happened. Ultimately, no one got a cent because our system is such when there is a schedule once you are raking the claims, uh, very often in a winding up you would see that the assets are not enough to meet the liabilities so liquidator will finally come and say uh, well these are the assets these are the liabilities so there is a schedule where you rank the claims now, that is in i believe schedule 9 of the company's act what happens is well the statutory payments are made then the secured creditors take the other one. So the unsecured creditors rank last. Invariably, invariably you get played out. You never get your claim, so it is not worth going to courts for a winding up. Because by the time you appoint a liquidator, with most of the audit companies, they have their liquidators, they are appointed, and that never works. And from there are reported cases from 1886 to 2021, 
if you go through all those cases you would realize how winding up or liquidation has failed in this country is a total failure now the other problem is rather than going to wind up the company and become a creditor there are other mechanisms for the lending institutions especially the banks they have that power of parrot execution so it's rather easier for them to use that rather than going and falling in this queue so this is better for them okay go for parrot execution recover whatever and get away now unfortunately this has not worked so then look at the other two amendments uh, the two uh, areas dilshani mentioned compromise of creditors well our creditors can never agree right in sri lanka it's very difficult for two people to agree so i mean if a bigger creditor is the bank they will know how to get that so it creditors meetings are not workable in sri lanka then comes the administrator we brought new sections for administrator and uh, that again for the now we have had this uh, uh, company is act for almost 15 years i don't think for more than three or four instances the administrator provisions have been used in one case i believe mr nilakanthan was made the late mr nilakanthan was made the administrator and he was telling me how difficult it was to go and you know to restart the factory he had to go to the provincial council he is it 100 times i have gone there i couldn't get it going so that's the worst part of it now unfortunately when we were doing that particular reform there was something we had to look at we thought well now internationally people don't let companies die straight away that is the last thing so business turn around business recovery you know there are so many things you can think now for example the us chapter 11 which works very well chapter 11 then we looked at several other jurisdictions there was a danahartha model that was introduced in malaysia after the bank started collapsing then india sikh industries companies they'll shall mention and also the english insolvency regime they work very well so what we did was there was this organization called business recovery on insolvency practitioners of sri lanka and we drafted the law i was personally involved in drafting that we looked at the malaysian model we looked at the indian sikh industries companies then the british internet the, the uk insolvency act and the developments and also the us chapter 11 and we drafted that now that mechanism was to turn around the company not to let that company fall straight away not to go into winding up not to go into administration but to try resurrect that company how to appoint a, a committee the company law uh, committee how to place it in uh, on record in court and then keep the directors away because you can't get the same directors to run the company which collapsed now if you look at after enron they have a good laws that were brought in even in india after satyam right to say satyam they resurrected that company in a short period but we just couldn't we had if you start from pramukha to hpt to all the old finance companies let alone the newer ones the golden keys and the others there were situations where we needed business recovery now the business recovery ensured that maybe insolvency practitioners or insolvency experts have to come in as dilshani said there is insolvency international organization you can get accreditation we have a couple of members are we are all accredited members where they ex- tell you how to do it maybe you have to downsize the business you have to reduce the number of uh, employees you have to uh, cut down on expenditure so many things to do there are experts to look at it and for them to do it and that the formula we brought in had a system where time frame is given you got to do this in 21 days you got to do this in 21 days like that short periods so when this was presented unfortunately uh, we had a seminar and we invited the chief justice at that time so he said no don't bring it at a separate as a separate law 
why don't you bring it as an amendment to the Companies Act? Now that draft is still there. After thorough analysis of all the foreign jurisdictions and the failures they saw in India, all that is there, draft is there. Now that has been sitting there for over 10 years. Unfortunately, in this country, so now basically at our age we try to give up, there is no point in, because there are no votes in this. So it was very difficult for anyone to go and push this, right? As against the lending institutions, well, they still have their parent execution. They don't have to go and enter into a moratorium where they say for two years we won't touch that because that was moratorium was one in that particular draft. So that draft, we sent it to the Law Commission. Law Commission also looked at it. But when with this regime changes, you know, the think tanks also change, unfortunately. So whatever that has been started by an earlier regime won't be carried down. New, new heads will come. And whether it's good, bad, or ugly, it, since it was created by an earlier regime, then no one will carry it forward. So that is where we stand. So we see a whole lot of companies reeling. And as Dilshani very correctly says, not only the insolvency regime, there are a whole lot of other provisions which are available in the Companies Act to avoid this type of crashes. She mentioned about... Uh, uh, 219, that is the insolvency situation, how the directors are responsible, civil and criminal liability, then serious loss of capital under 2020, then we have a section called solvency, 57. Every company has to maintain solvency. In my book, I have referred to it as a golden thread that runs across the entire fabric of company law. Because you can't have issue bonus, you can't declare dividends, you can't buy back shares, you can't have tamashas. The company is not solvent. But the directors are solvent. Now, I can tell you personally, the people, I do quite a number of winding up cases, and the directors of these companies who come to see us to wind up the company, they still come in their S-Class and the 7 Series BMW. But they can't pay the, uh, the employees 15,000 EPF. You see? So there are garment factories, I mean, very small salaries. The girls have not been paid EPF, ETF, and they have to go to the winding up court, and ultimately they don't get anything. So it basically has not worked in this country because maybe even under the existing statute, the provisions have not been worked. And well, you know, the judges also must have commercial thinking, and uh, parties know that taking advantage of the loss delays, it is easy to go to court and block it there. And everyone knows that when you go to wind up a court of a company, well, that's the end of the matter. You can forget about the liabilities. So that is my view on this. Well, a lot of opportunity, especially for the younger generation lawyers. Um, I saw several young lawyers here. I always tell them, well, look here. You all look at it in a different way and try to reform this. Thanks, sir. I'd like to shift gears a little bit, Nirosh. Um, you've been sort of at the forefront of trying to resurrect companies, and you know you'll come head to head with these types of creditors. And you know how have the legal provisions or the interpretation of current legal provisions or the practice of them been a hindrance, or have they helped? And you know what have your experiences been? Shanaka, I would like to spend a minute just to put. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to spend a minute uh, because we keep focusing on Thai, the Thai experience and this 47 percent um, uh, NPL rate. Because I think from that we are going to cascade into how many tough situations we are going to have in the in the coming year. Um, the Thai crisis was a creation by the private sector. The Sri Lankan crisis, as we discussed, is a creation of the government sector. So our private companies, even though they're in difficulty, are not as badly off as the, the companies in, uh, in, that the companies were in Thailand, because those big construction firms and the big uh, hotel groups and the big office buildings that came up that we are the crane stop for five, six years. Uh, that kind of level of dollar debt is not there in the Sri Lankan balance sheets. Uh, 
Having said that, the policy rate increase that the central bank governor had to do is understandable. But if we keep those rates at those levels, we are going to struggle, and that's going to bring down a lot of the struggling companies. So the, I understand what the central bank has to do, that it's, but the money printing happened also from the government. The policy objective of it, taking interest rates up is going to mess up about 30% of our companies. So the NPL infection is going to come from that side. I, I think we need to put that out there. Coming to the point of the insolvency laws, before I get to insolvency laws, I'd like to give an anecdotal uh, thing that happened to me. Uh, in 2009, a friend of mine, quite excited that um, Sri Lankan war had ended, wanted me to incorporate a company for him. Um, he lived in the US. I incorporated this business for him. He was going to come and do a software business in Sri Lanka. Then the husband and wife decided, no, they are not going to come back to Sri Lanka. And then they told me, what, can you give this company to somebody? And what? I said, no, I just, so I just made the decision, no, I'll, I'll close it up. So I told the company secretary, please wind this company up. So I thought that was the matter ended. Then I get a very nasty letter from the Inland Revenue saying that I have not filed my taxes and to immediately come to the Inland Revenue. So I sent my audit firm. Now this company did not even have an audit, it didn't even have a bank account. To cut a long story short, in 2015, the Inland Revenue was threatening to, uh, to freeze bank accounts was, uh, of a non-existent company. It was threatening me as a sole director uh, to come to the Inland Revenue. And, and this was kind of unprecedented nonsense. Right? And now, that, now business has not even started and you can't close a company. Right? My first interaction Actually, this, this uh, one of the clients who had many S-classes and many sports cars uh, had a, a dispute with, actually, the, 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 the factory workers had a dispute in 2009, and uh, actually, they nearly smashed up my vehicle also. Luckily, they didn't react in that way with me, uh, but they smashed up the entire office and... Uh, I made the recommendation to the board, uh, with unruly labor, you cannot continue this business. So let us wind it up. And we had enough grounds, and I took on the responsibility of, you know, helping the lawyers frame the case in court. That case went on for six years. The bank basically felt these people are rich, so we can try to bring personal liability on them and shake them down to that there is the go beyond the aspect of limited liability. Uh, one bank, two banks couldn't agree on how to execute the Parate execution. So there were other complications. Uh, there was a dispute as to whether a particular asset was a movable asset or an immovable asset. Uh, and the list of issues went on, and at the end, a poor judge who had no commercial experience and no understanding of how to read a proper balance sheet had to make judgment on this. So those are two experiences, one where I hadn't even incorporated a company, and right through I feel that if I had to avoid one of my clients going to court, I would take that option. Uh, I have another client who uh, has a BOI business. And the business is in difficulty. Uh, and the BOI would send... The BOI has, I think, about 800 people in a unit called enforcement. Right. Every politician who comes and makes grand pronouncements about the BOI, that they are going to bring the billion dollars and the two billion dollars, 
the, look at the staff and say, no, I'm going to bring my team. Then what do they do with the existing team? Put them into that division. Right? So those people have to keep busy. Right? So they are checking on whether the company is paying their EPF, ETF. They are checking whether the company is uh, filing taxes. Now, all these jobs are, can all, are already being done by the EPF department, by the Inland Revenue, right? But the, these people are also busy digging holes and covering them up, right? So, now this company is bankrupt, and we want to pr proceed in court, but can we convince now that this, this company has a license to operate, right? We can't convince the BOI to come into a compromise, to give us time. They say, no, whatever you want to do, this has to be paid. Our fees have to be paid. Otherwise, we are going to basically terminate your license, or terminate your company, your approval process, and then you, you lose everything. Right? You, you lose your approval. So there are instances where we've looked at the compromise solution that uh, uh, Dr. Harsha uh, Cabral uh, look, uh, talked about. But again, the aspects of commerce and the aspects of debt are so complex and the creditor arrangements are, you know, quite complex that we feel that when you go into court, you're going to have, if we have to end up for two, three years trying to resolve the matter, you're going to kill the company anyway. I want to take a step back and say, now, in this economic climate, why is it important that we try to use the law to protect these distressed assets? It's because it's, they might be in difficulty, but those are some of the most productive companies in the history of Sri Lanka that have gotten into a bad space. If you let them go, and if you frustrate those directors, and if you frustrate that capital, you're going to lose productivity of about 20 to 30 percent of our private sector over the next 24 months. So that's why it's important, if we are actually serious about our, uh, the health of our private sector, that we need to try to harness this. I want to spend two minutes, I, I asked permission from Shanaka, and I also in the morning spoke to Murtaza. This crisis is going to have certain impacts on our financial system in varying degrees. And it's very important that our regulator uses regulatory sanction properly and quickly in an appropriate manner to resolve matters. As a child, I remember going to buy a ticket at the Savoy Cinema. And uh, my father drove into a side road. And he said, uh, Puta, I can park here. Then I said, uh, you might be blocking somebody. And he said, no, no, don't worry. This is the mercantile receiver's office. Uh, I'm the one who picked the building. I can park here. My father used to work in the central bank. And uh, so I went and bought my ticket, and that was it. Then we went off. And the, but on the way out, I remember, as I would have been maybe first year university, him telling me, Puta, this is an ex I thought when we took it over that we could have managed this, but it's become an absolute nightmare. In 2009, there was a, a well-run finance company with adequate capital that the central bank took over. And about, I think about six months ago, they put it to bed, they put it to rest, permanently. Right? They tinkered around with the finance company for 10 years. Nothing was broken. They broke it. And that cannot happen in this impending next 12 months. We are going to have much more challenging times 
and I feel there's a lot of capital that can be raised from overseas markets, both for our private sector entities, and if we can use the legal system, the reformed legal system, to support these struggling companies. There are some good brands that are going, that are going to get knocked out of the market. Those brands can be brought back with foreign capital. Those financial institutions also can be taken to the next level, and a financial sector consolidation can be done using foreign capital. We are all talking about how to get foreign capital. Right? These reforms in the legal system and reforms at the regulatory level can be that conduit for foreign capital. And I think that's very important for us to understand how much is riding on these reforms. Because if we fail to take this opportunity, we are also failing to act, basically bring in much needed foreign capital to Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Um, listening to both Harsha and Nirosh, it becomes increasingly more evident that we need a process and a mechanism outside the court system. Uh, <clears throat> Dijani, I'd like to move to you. Now, you said that within the existing company's law and act and recent amendment, I think, there are two provisions, compromising with creditors and voluntary administrations, uh, vol appointing a voluntary administration. So my question to you is, why do you think uh, those two mechanisms haven't worked. Um, uh, Harsha mentioned how, you know, trying to get a whole bunch of creditors to agree is impossible given, you know, sort of the uh, diverse interest. He also pointed out a, a scenario where uh, uh, Mr. Nilakandan, I think, was a, appointed a voluntary administrator and, you know, uh, he faced challenges. So, is, so uh, are there tweaks to those two uh, ordinances that we need in order to get greater buy-in and usage uh, uh, for them to be effective? Okay. Um, uh, with regard to compromise with creditors, as Harsha said, it's true. You can't get two people to agree. And one of the ways this was tackled in the UK during the COVID-19 crisis was, as I mentioned, they brought this new piece of legislation in 2020, a Corporate Insolvency Governance Act of 2020. Under that particular piece of legislation, they obviously knew you put five creditors in one room, they are not going to agree saying, you know, this is how we are going to take a haircut, why is he getting a haircut like this, why is it more for me, less for him, so on and so forth. So under this particular legislation, court can even force a creditor if it is for the greater benefit of resuscitating that company. And as I said earlier, under this particular act in the UK, which was particularly brought to combat so many companies and businesses that was going under during the COVID-19 crisis, was to ensure that the macro aspect of is more important. That is to make sure that the company survives for the greater benefit of the employees, the state, so on and so forth, and not the pity potty bickering of a particular creditor. So I think in terms of why it hasn't worked in Sri Lanka is because there is no um, sort of compromised when the creditors are called in to say, okay, we are going to compromise on how this particular agreement has to be, 75% of them must agree. So as leave alone two people, 75% of the value of the creditors must agree at a meeting of creditors, okay, this is how we are going to agree, and this is the binding contract. So why probably it hasn't worked is that that culture of compromise, give and take, bigger picture, doesn't work. As with regard to administrators, why it hasn't worked, is I personally think, this is my personal take, we don't have trained people, absolutely lack, there's a lacuna in people understanding how to structure a company. If you want to appoint an administrator, whom will they appoint? Some accountancy firm or some retired lawyer, or a judge. They have no clue 
how to take this business. They are not business. That you, first of all, you have to understand the business. Then you must know how to work the balance sheet. So we do not have this particularly um, trained set of professionals. Either we are absolutely bankrupt with our set of professionals or there is no will to sort of us create this professional body in every other jurisdiction. They have insolvency professionals. They are trained with a forensic mind to get into a company, study it, analyze it. In, in a period of a short period of time, you're not given, like in Sri Lanka, it, every, as Harsha said, it goes for years and years. Time is of essence. There, you are given 180 days or six months or whatever, and told, okay, you've got to turn around this company and you need brilliant minds to do it. I'm not at, at any point of time saying that Sri Lanka does not have that kind of mindset. We do. But we need to get them and to train them and to probably even create a particular professional set of body. And I think why these provisions which are greatly resorted to, in Australia they say that the, the most sorted out statistically provision is administration. They have, uh, uh, like in the UK, insolvency professional and when a company is in distress, they file a paper saying they are unable to pay their debt. When you say unable to pay their debt, I have to make it very clear. Unable to pay their debt is not the same as not having enough assets. Sometimes you can have be asset rich. But you are unable to pay the debt as and when they are due. So I think answering your question, Chanaka, is basically lack of having trained set of professionals to deal with this kind of situation. India has brought them, UK has them, New Zealand has that, United States have that, Australia has that. Maybe this is an opportune time we should look at. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I'm going to come back to all three of you actually with regard to how we can fast track this process. But just to finish off a, a couple of things on the existing companies law, uh, Diljani, um, I, I, is my understanding correct that uh, right now it is a company and its directors and uh, its creditors that can uh, call for, uh, who, who can call for uh, a restructuring of a business, not not a liquidation. I'm not talking of a liquidation. Who can call for a restructuring of a business? Okay. And does that provision need to be tweaked to be make it more practicable in in this current environment? When it comes to administration, it is a board of directors. The act is very clear. I think section four zero one says board of directors shall call for appointment of an administrator because they, at the end of the day are the very people who knows the true picture. Mm. It's a self-governing situation, so yeah. they know how good, bad, and indifferent yeah. the company is. So yeah. when it comes to administration, it's the board of directors. Mm. When it's the compromise of creditors, I think there is a list of people who can call in for. One is the board of directors, a receiver. The receiver is a person who's appointed under the Companies Act, where a creditor, for, for example, to execute a property, you mm. appoint a receiver. Administrator can ask for a compromise. Um, if I'm not mistaken, even a shareholder and a creditor with the sanction of court can say this company needs to have a compromise so that this, the survival of that company is so ensured. So answering your question, if I had voluntary administration, it is board of directors for a compromise. So many people, which includes board of directors, receivers, liquidators, administrators, creditors, and shareholders. Yeah, but again, through through the process of the courts. Compromise with creditors, yes, it is yes. through the process yes. of court. Yes, but in other jurisdictions, in your experience, do, do, they, do they have to go India through India is amazing. I, I just, just love the fact that they set up this tribunal, which is so yeah. extra judicial with... Okay, great so, expertise. So great. So, so, so just in, in the interest of time, let me jump to that uh, for all three of you. <clears throat> we need to get to a mechanism and even tweaking this mechanism pretty fast. We don't have the luxury of time. time. Um, so um, uh, let's to start with you. So there are three things in, in my view. One is we may need to tweak the existing laws, uh, you know, to, to circumvent the courts. 
the second is get the necessary human infrastructure in place, uh, insolvency professionals, bodies licensed, uh, properly trained, etc. And the third is the, the one thing uh, that you uh, mentioned with regard to India also is, is, is the uh, availability of information. Information. Right. So I'm going to put it on to all three of you. How do we fast track our process to get there quickly? In, I mean, we don't have the ideal uh, uh, scenario here, right? So India, you said, implemented it. It's still in record time, but still it took 12 months. We probably don't have 12 months. Harsha, to start with you, please. Yeah, I, I would suggest that amending laws or going for new laws is not the answer. Because if you see the Companies Act is now 15 years old, we are still struggling to amend the cosmetic changes. There are a couple of changes which have, we have listed out, which we listed out about eight years back. Still, that it has not become law. So forget about new laws. Country is now worried about the 1920 Amendment, 20th Amendment, 21st, going back to 13, what to do, right? So we have to work within the parameters of the existing law. Right. Existing law has the provision for administrator. Like the country is looking at my good friend Mr. Harshadi Silva to become administrator and fix things up. Companies do need such people, well, competent people to come forward. Okay, downsize is, do this, sell this. Okay, we have excess amount of staff. We were talking about BOI, I'm a former BOI chairman, my friend is there. I was on that board a couple of years ago. 1,800 people working there, we can run this place with 300 people. But if you do that, you lose elections. So, so, uh, to, uh, just to drill into that, who is an administrator? Who is classified as an administrator? The board can, they have Appoint. not given any qualification as such. That's mm. why I said Mr. Nilakan then was appointed once, then Mr. from uh, BDO, uh, not BDO, yeah, the yeah, other place, uh, Gerard uh, mm. was appointed in another case. They were quite competent. It's not a, mm. I mean, they are trained, I mean, they are either, either a chartered accountant or any other profession. Right, where you can have consultants for themselves, mm. they wouldn't know everything, mm. but they can hire expertise. Right, okay, this we have to downsize, give golden handshake to X amount of employees, sell this asset, do whatever. There are a couple of things they might mm. have to do fast, mm. but if that drags on for five years, then you're finished. Banks won't wait, mm. they don't want to join the party creditors right. club or moratorium or anything. So, Dilshani, do we need to tweak the provisions to ensure that this process, now Indian process, has a timeline? Yes. Right? They are very uh, emphatic about the fact that time is of essence here because you can't let this process drag on because the company's institutional and commercial capital in itself will, will deteriorate. So, we, do we need to tweak this to ensure that there is a timeline provision? I personally think so because India was experienced the same thing that we have in Sri Lanka. I think probably it's a South Asian mindset. You know, time is not that of a greater sense. And we are very litigious kind of a mindset, and I think Indians are no different. So they realize that to get the best out of, to resurrect a company, to turn it around, if you tell them, okay, guidelines are set, it won't work. So the law in its black and white legislative format said 180 days. Mm. If you want any extension, you have to go to court, not some, sorry, mm. not the court, the tribunal, justify. Mm. Why you want an extension, if not 180 days, and that's it and no further. Mm. Nirosh, in, uh, insolvency professionals, you've gone through the process, so you know the skill sets that are required. How can you fast track licensing people? What do they need to, you know, what kind of experience do they need? What kind of qualifications do you think they need? I feel somebody who has, um, who has accounting or or even an economics background with who have at least five to ten years of being on a board of a company who's, uh, who has some uh, management experience mm. of uh, at least mid-level management. I think that's the kind of caliber of person you're looking for. Mm. Um, two, two aspects I think uh, we, we've touched a lot on India. Um, so the Sri Lankan creditor who is extending credit I think lots of you are business people, so you would be doing this. You are extending credit without a dashboard or without any knowledge of the financials of a, the company you are extending credit to. And that's a very different scenario in India. 
I will, I'll be actually evaluating uh, buying into an Indian business for a client of mine. And I, I was surprised at the amount of level of detail he has. You can get into the Credit Information Bureau of India and you have access to their uh, to the credit report. So if there are check returns or if there are issues on the financials, you can have access to that as a creditor. Mm -hmm. So you are forewarned about the situation. Right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of information, if you can make the, the infrastructure is there in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. If you start making that available, then the creditors start knowing a little bit about the problems this company is having. What happens in Sri Lanka is all of a sudden the company can't pay. Mm. Right? And by that time, it's generally too late. So if you can open up the, the credit scoring system mm. to uh, all people who, I mean, if you want to take credit from a third party, you have to open, your, you have to open yourself to the credit scoring system and allow, so if, if I, I want credit from Murtaza, Murtaza has to have access to my credit. Mm. That's one. The, the second thing I feel that's, that's uh, important in, in, and that's working in India is that um, uh, the whole aspect of trying to resolve matters. I think India is, pe while people are litigious, they are also they are more pragmatic in their approach. Okay, let's, let's try to sort this out like this. We don't have that in Sri Lanka. Uh, one of the other... The, the third point I would like to see is whether within, I know the banks are going to get very upset with me for saying this, but if a compromise or an administrator is coming, right, being considered by the board, by the, by the court system or recommended to court, then the Parate execution should be stayed for at least six months until such time the plan is brought. Now what happens is the, the, the person with the Parate execution has almost like a can it and you know it doesn't have to wait. Just correcting that, yeah. Nirosh, yeah. for administrator moment an administrator is appointed, everything freezes. Freeze. You okay. cannot go for parate. Okay. Compromise with creditors, you yes. don't have yeah. the moratorium. Yeah. Yeah. So but on... for administrator, everything ceases. That's kind of a breathing space. Right. The company can truly look at and say, okay, this is how we are going to restructure. And even no, a parate... but, but the, again, in that, the point is the, the bank cannot agree. Yeah, there is an issue because the, the bank cannot agree. The banks no. are very powerful, yeah. so they can even go and get an injunction. Yeah. Drop off a hat, you can get an injunction. Mm. The plan. Mm. No, but I must, I must add something yeah. uh, to the credit of certain banks. I think uh, Mr. Ranjit Fernand will agree with me. Banks have helped a couple of companies mm. to restructure. Mm. They have the expertise. They have, I mean, mm. forget about the law and the courts. That is the biggest mm. problem we have in this country, right? So, leave the lawyers out. My heavens sake, I'm also a lawyer, but you know, they are the worst fellows to trust. But you keep them out in a very commercial way, get some competent yeah. people who, are, who have experience in restructuring, yeah. maybe double accountants or whoever yeah. who have experience in uh, reforming companies. Yeah. Get those people and do something. Yeah, yeah. My, 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 I mean, my sense is I'm hopeful that the banks will see this. That's, there's a lot of value getting destroyed. That's that's my what I mean. That's my concern. You know, we we these companies all have a have a history. They have brands. They have knowledge, and we are losing all that in these closures. And the fact that we have a legislator in the in the audience, so we need to give him something to take away from this. Uh, uh, otherwise, he's wasting his time. Yeah, I would suggest uh, that, so, you know, especially the time frame. For yes. example, you just can't postpone. Say, look at Sri Lankan. Every month you postpone, you're adding tremendous pressure on your coffers. Then the others, like now you've all started something, I think the CEB, petroleum, let the players come or do whatever. But those are things you have to decide then and there. I mean, to, I mean you have been talking about this... Uh, Sri Lankan issue for how long? During your regime, then the later last regime, every time a new board comes. So they happily go on and they will... Uh, not... yeah. So, again, just to wrap up, 
we need a few tweaks to the existing laws and provisions to ensure things like uh, timelines and things like that. We need a licensing regime for administrators, uh, insolvency professionals. Am I right? Insolvency professionals, just to add, uh, in most jurisdictions, there is a, it's a professional body itself. Mm -hmm. You cannot be an insolvency professional unless you complete the examinations. Right. Then you are affiliated with ACCA, right. CIMA, all right. sorts of bodies like that. Right. So, And you, to renew your license, you have to keep constantly, you have to pass an exam every year. So yeah. they are, not only do they, yeah, you should know your finance, technology, yeah. everything. Yeah, but Dishan, we don't have time now. We don't, Let's have, say time. We don't have time. Yes. So we need to try and find the mechanism to, you know, filter people uh, based on their experiences and qualifications, existing experiences and qualifications and license them into these roles quickly, right? Um, uh, do do we need to do anything in law to uh, improve the flow of information? Wouldn't the uh, existing information available through the audit auditors, etc., be uh, would that suffice, Nirosh, uh, for 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 an insol insolvency process? No, every company has their own accounts, mm. right? So they all know about the accounts, right? Yeah. Any, any audited accounts enough to start with. And uh, basically, with that information, you can do that. I mean, that's why I always say, keep the courts and the lawyers out of this, retired judges or mm. present mm. judges or whatever, mm. because then we think in a different way. Mm. How to block this? Mm. How to get an injunction? Right. How to drag this? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the common perception. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the bottom line is that the existing laws and provisions are adequate. We need a bit of a mindset change amongst the banks, particularly and the creditors uh, uh, to be able to function under a, un, into a One uh, thing I would like process. to add to what Nirosh said, um, basically when the creditors get to know uh, how bad the debtor is, it's basically closing the stable doors after the horse has bolted. It's mm. too late. Mm. Uh, India has addressed that in their new code by setting up information utilities. So you have mm. a, a center forum where you file on all the in information. So the creditor is in par with what is going on in the debtor. Mm. So if he wants to step in and say, you know what, let's go for a compromise, your, your balance sheet is deteriorating, or uh, you know, see the debtor in distress, you have mm. that possibility. Mm. Right now, the current scenario that we are currently in, the de creditor gets to know when you're completely gone belly up. Mm. So that is something we can look at too. Okay. I think so, the, the, the point, the, the important point is the, the creditor, the, the, the creditor, oftentimes things of restructuring too late. I mean, that's happened. So, so in my practice, I've restructured about 25 companies over an average span of about two years for the last 20 years. That's been my practice. I would have got about maybe another 50 to 75 more clients who, you know, who seriously I looked at to consider for restructuring. But most of the time I noticed that they've come to me too late. And there is no value to be created. It's just like uh, they're trying to come to me and try to keep the bank prolong the thing for a little longer. So I don't take clients like that. Um, and, and I believe that's the, that's the other takeaway I can give. I mean, if you're in business, uh, what's very important is getting the credit information across to the, the counterparties. That's, I think, one thing uh, Dr. Harsha can do if you can get that enacted immediately. Uh, number two, I mean, in consultation with the banks, see whether we could get a bit of extra time uh, for, for uh, uh, administrators and compromise situations both. Uh, and uh, I think if those two things can be achieved today, the, 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 the qualifications of the administrator, those things can be long-term work in progress because I don't believe that you can have shortcuts to that. That's improving the skill level, right? That there is, I, actually, there's another one point. Um, I feel that uh, when you start taking on these roles, there is absolutely no immunity in, in law when you take on these responsibilities. And being an administrator can be a very challenging role because you're dealing with a bunch of people and you're putting on a proposal. And... I believe that's something that also needs to be looked at because that profession can't undertake unlimited liability on account of a professional engagement. Uh, 
Do we have... Contrary to that, okay. I can say if you want to kill a company, go to the lawyers. <laughs> I don't think that will be in the interest of the financial sector, to be honest. So, uh, I don't know whether we have time for questions. There's a clock ticking here that says two minutes, but I'll open it up. You done? Oh, sorry. Mr. Fernando Pulle and Mr. Ranjit Thuri, Mr. Fernando Pulle is probably we'll take his first. He's, uh, he's, he knows how to kill company because he comes from Mr. Romesh Silva's chamber, so you have enough experience we have, no, Buddha? Yeah, go ahead. Just a thing, I mean, we, interestingly, we are at the moment restructuring our country. So, I mean, what if a chance and Hogan, uh, uh, this uh, Lassads are doing is actual restructuring because they, there is there is, there, there is no court process because there, you can't bind up a country. Which, but uh, New York law is at the moment looking at uh, a Chapter 7. So there, are, there is a Chapter 7 process that's been going, consultations going on. So but what is happening is the Chapter 9 is being mirror, mir mirrored in uh, consensual process. So what happens, I, my understanding of Chapter 9, I'm not expert at Chapter 11, is that there's a DSA involved. There's a debt sustainable analysis. And using the distance analysis, you come up with instruments and valuations which allows you to turn around the company. And that's where the basis of this. So I think in Sri Lanka, we would probably challenge is to understand judges who can look at this debt sustainable analysis. And in what happened, I, my understanding is in London, the high courts opened a special division and who are trained to understand debt sustainable analysis. Next thing is the development of a bond uh, uh, debt market. Because you need, might have to sell off the debt or transfer the debt. And people are willing to take a risk. Uh, conversion of uh, debt into equity, creating options. Those are things that judges have to understand and to turn around a company and give time and space. That's what I, my understanding of what has happened. Uh, one question, issue that in India, I think it's because uh, India has a series of tribunals from the company law tribunal, the debt tribunal. So India gets around its federal... Uh, federal structure by creating these tribunals in in Australia, England, uh, Aust all of the Commonwealth. It seems to be they have escaped the courts because they use the equity equity provisions and the trust on trust provisions to as powers of the judges to restructure companies. And that's I think important. That uh, unfortunately uh, because there is question whether we our judges have equitable jurisdiction in that sense. But that's what they've used. For example, they use tracing, they use, uh, they use uh, constructive trust and resulting trust provisions. So I think it's then using the equitable jurisdiction, they, they, they can use the change uh, debt into equity, give them, give them instruments. Uh, one thing about the com creditor compromises, I think credit, what you define, definition of creditors in the voting, you let the biggest thing in what you call teams of arrangement is. Uh, 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 the, the creditor classes. So you, you look at, you, instead of looking, if you look at uh, classification, like if you look at uh, secure prop, 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 uh, definite immovables, mobiles, you, you get them into a creditor class that they can, voting structure allows you to vote on it, like what's happening in, like in, Sri, in, for, uh, in Sri Lanka also, there's in, um, in uh, what you call um, the collective action clauses. It's all about Creditor, creditor classes, so they did. They have credit, like they have creditor committees that are being appointed, and that's why I think what what you need to think. Look, judges need to be understood is that you don't need to let all the creditors. When you mean seventy five credit percent of creditors, you may push all the all the um, secured creditors and unsecured together and change and use the equity provisions and get them to vote. Thanks, sir. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Being a banker for all my life, uh, I just can't stop myself from making some comments. Uh, I think the, the core issue in a restructuring is not a legal issue. It is a financial restructuring issue. It is a job for a financial professional. So that is the first mistake we are making by trying to look at handing over to courts and the lawyers, with all due respect to the lawyers, I'm myself a lawyer, but uh, I think it is not the remedy. I think it must be given to a, a financial professional. And I like to relate uh, experience of mine. Uh, 
during the past few years after retiring from the bank, I was invited to become the, uh, what they call the competent authority under the Underutilized Assets Act, which was passed some time back. Under this act, several companies and other state-owned enterprises which had become defunct and were not functioning, and there are a lot of assets lying with those companies idle. So this act was passed in parliament, which took over all those assets and vested the land and the assets in the state. And there was a competent authority appointed to look at the re restoration of these industries, restructure of the industries, or the sale of these assets, so that the country would benefit from idle assets lying over. So uh, under this, there were many companies, uh, like big straight companies, like the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I think some of the bigger ones were spinning and weaving mills and things like that in the, uh, in the Minuangoda area. But those, there was a specific uh, competent authority appointed for one of those. But there were 26 industries of the BOI, which were in this category, which were taken no under that. And a competent authority was to be appointed, and I was invited to uh, take that role. And uh, in one of my weak moments, I agreed. And uh, I really handled that task. And I must say, out of the 26 industries that were handled over, 21 was restored within a period of three years. Now, there, the, the procedure was, now this land was already vested, the assets were vested in the state. So I had to start by calling the earlier entrepreneur who had, uh, you know, stalled the operations and asking, are you prepared to restart the thing or have you finished? So some of them said, um, I had different problems. Now I am ready to restart. So in that case, I had to ask them, okay, what is your plan to restart? I had to look at the balance sheets and the borrowing from the bank and the viability of the restarting process. That is a judgment that you have to make. Otherwise, you are pursuing a dead horse. Sometimes euthanasia is a better option. So uh, I had to decide whether there was a chance of this person uh, restarting the thing. Either there was lack of equity, in which case he had to bring equity. And if there was a debt, I had to speak to the banks and see whether it can be rescheduled. But all that depended on whether the first judgment that there was a chance that this would be operated on a viable basis. So if that was the case, we worked with that person, uh, spoke to the banks, rescheduled the loans, and brought in equity if necessary, and allowed him and got recommended to the BUI that he be given a license again. The license was cancelled. So BUI went through the appraisal again and uh, got an approval from the board, and he restarted. Now, there were cases where the person said, I'm not prepared to restart. I have finished. Then in that case, we had the opportunity to sell the assets. So we had to advertise in the press, call for quotations, and call for any other person who wanted to take over the industry and run. And again, we had to look at the viability or sell the asset. So it was a process, streamlined process, where the asset was first vested in the state. So I think some model like that, where you take the business and really vest the assets and really so that no one can interfere with you working and call the party and call any party, whether it is with the same party, and assess the viability of the proposition that he is making, what conditions brought him down, and whether those are rectified now. I think Nirosh has done a lot of successful ones. We are the same process. It's the question of trying to see whether there is a viable thing or whether you are flogging a dead horse. So it is a professional for the financial person rather than a legal issue. Thanks, sure. uh, Dilan. O only 60 Dilan. seconds. I'll take only 60 seconds. Uh, number one, Harsha, I, though you're my friend, I disagree. I think we need Chapter 11 legislation. Companies like Sri Lankan Airlines would have had more choices. And I must say that legislation taking time is an excuse because yesterday I was attending the first meeting of the CB restructuring committee uh, that I've been appointed to by the n new minister. And we were told to, that he needs to come to parliament with a new bill within two months. Uh, number two, um, our financial markets. I agree on one point. Our financial markets are underdeveloped, 
and we need to develop our financial markets to address some of the restructuring issues. I've been talking for five years for LLP legislation to be brought into this country so that private equity can come in to restructure some of these companies, but, that, that, but we failed to introduce LLP legislation despite my putting a team together, doing it pro bono, handing over to the former finance minister, Mangala Samarivira, got it into a budget statement, not implemented. Number two, one and a half years ago, when I saw this crisis coming, my team and I, we did pro bono work and gave it to the then Deputy Governor Nandalal, a draft proposal connected to creating a bad bank, because we saw the distress assets coming in the hotel sector, which has been under stress for three years. Nandalal said, it's a good proposal. I was told it has to come through Dr. P.B. Jayasundara. I then knew he doesn't like me, so I went to my friend at uh, PwC, Mr. Sujiya Mudelige, and we put the PwC uh, logo on it, took my company's logo out of it. PwC added a lot of value into the policy document. We've spoken of the necessity to introduce legislation to create a bad bank so that toxic assets of bank into these, because in my team I had two people who were involved in the uh, trouble assets restructuring in New York. So officials, both at banks and the central bank, need a mindset change. And if you go with the mindset that we will take years to implement legislation, I'm sorry, we are not going to dig ourselves out of this hole. Yeah, okay, uh, that's a wrap. Uh, sorry, when uh, lunch calls. <laughs> been asked to stop. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the 2008 crisis, I was walking past the Fed Reserve and a friend of mine was showing all the lights were on. All the lights were on. Everybody was working. And when you pass our central bank, I wonder whether all the lights are on. I hope everybody's working hard, at least working from home. My question actually is leaving with all respect to all the problems faced and uh, the challenges of passing law reforms and other reforms that we need through parliament uh, and even the legal fraternity, as you mentioned. Ideal case, how long would it take to get a 60% working key reforms set up? Like, just to get all the key reforms set up, how long would it take? Exactly. I think... Uh... Well, we draft, there are so many drafts that are in the pipeline for years and years. Unfortunately, they have no votes. Right now, everybody is interested in this amendment of the constitution and things like that. So these other laws which have, have no votes are the least concern. So that is the problem. So new legislature, the, the, we expect uh, uh, my good friend to become administrator and reform all this. Political will to forward the pipeline. They've been sitting there for. There's one particular uh, draft that I personally was involved with, and it is now last 16 years. It's in the in the pipeline. Reciprocal enforcement in judgments that is still in the pipeline for the last 16 years. Yeah. It's a political will, and probably if you want something really done fast if the financial sector could lobby and say, you know, this is the time that we need to press and bring change, anything can happen. Uh, Harsha, I'm going to ask a cheeky question. Did the banks lobby against it? Yeah, so the problem is how strong your lobby is, you see. So now, you know, even the legislature, you know, you can see if the banks lobby, definitely the other side will lose. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Uwe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harsha, Nirosh, Dilshani, and Chanaka. Your discussion has certainly not left us bankrupt of ideas. We will now break for lunch and recommence our next presentation.
Advocata Institute under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. And here at BMICH, we are now breaking the conference for lunch. Um, but during the lunch break, we thought to keep you occupied with an important story we shared yesterday in the day one of our conference, which is the Air India privatization story. And we have a lot to take from their story. And we are going to, uh, we also discuss the takeaways for Sri Lanka. And a, lo a question that we all have is, should Sri Lankan Airlines be privatized or not? And this was discussed yesterday, and we feel it's important that you all get engaged in this discussion. So we are going to uh, show it to you during our lunch break here at BMICH. To give you an overview, this panel discussion was conducted between three personals. Um, we had Ashwini Padnis, the journalist, and also we had Mr. Thilan Vijay Singh, the chairman and CEO of TW Corp Private Limited. And also as a panelist, we had Akhilesh Tilotia, Ministry of Civil Aviation, Government of India. And this was a very important discussion. And just like I said today as well, we have a lot to learn from other countries if we are to grow and pass this recovery. So ladies and gentlemen, do enjoy the session and leave your comments in the comments section so that we get engaged with you. And we will get back to you soon after lunch for the next session to restart the session soon after lunch. See you soon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce the speakers and the moderator for the next panel discussion, which is a discussion showcasing the Air India privatization and thereafter drawing parallels to a potential privatization of Sri Lankan Airlines. Introducing the speakers for this discussion, Mr. Ashwini Padnis, journalist. Mr. Tilan Vijay Singha, chairman and CEO of TW Corp Private Limited. Along with Mr. Akhilesh Tilotia, public policy strategist, and an author joining us virtually. This event will be moderated by Anita Varusavitharana. everyone and welcome to today's panel discussion on Air India and its privatization process where we'll be discussing how this process took place um, and what are some of the key takeaways that we can take um, and hopefully use in the case of Sri Lankan Airlines back home here. As um, I, uh, we have with us today a very esteemed panel of experts from both Sri Lanka and India. Um, with Mr. Tilosha joining us online, uh, with Mr. Padnis here in person, and of course Mr. Vijay Singha as well. Um, so without further ado, let's kick off the discussion. Um, Mr. Akhilesh, would you like to start by giving us a little bit of context to the first round of privatization that was attempted with Air India? Hi, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Uh, Sorry, there is a feedback that I can hear. Uh, I think it's clear on this end, uh, Mr. Akhilesh. Okay, I, okay, okay, let me uh, go ahead. Uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, if you are uh, I am speaking on this topic of how I was actually associated, associated with the minister in the first uh, round of privatization uh, was attempted. Uh, I must say that uh, India had attempted to uh, privatize the air India earlier in the century ago, around uh, 2000 or so. Uh, but in the recent uh, few years, around 2018, uh, it was when uh, kick started the process of uh, uh, privatizing air India again. 
before i get into uh, how of the privatization uh, we need to also understand why we are thinking about this uh, this is of course uh, the guiding philosophy of uh, uh, in of the car- uh, current government in india that uh, it is not the business of the government to be in business and hence to that extent there have been significant privatizations and as you pointed out uh, in india we have uh, privatization that took place over the last few years Uh, the why of uh, air india privatization obviously of course one of the key points and moving into the uh, key discussion that was taking place uh, is of course driven by the fact that uh, losses can be very very high in private sector in public sector airlines and that typically becomes a trigger uh, that was the case uh, with air india also there were reasons as to why they were doing the type of losses that they were um and we don't need to get into that uh, with respect to the reasons uh, happy to speak about that uh, and it was uh, it was thought that privatization could then bring in the sort of efficiency or at least reduce the losses that the government had to bear uh, there were of course a few things that we needed to take in mind before uh, the privatization could be kick started one is there were concerns uh, and rightly so with respect to connectivity uh, whether there were regions within india that only a public sector airline would connect and whether there were regions or countries outside of india where india could lose connectivity uh, without the presence of its uh, flagship national carrier uh, from the perspective of the internal connectivity there were concerns with uh, respect to whether smaller towns or uh, remote far remote areas uh, which were beginning to see airport uh, airports come up and airline connectivity come up whether there would be in a private sector interest and to that extent the udan scheme that india had put in place uh, around that time uh, was significantly helpful which saw a lot of private sector players come in there was also concern uh, with respect to uh, whether there will be enough talent and skill uh, within the community uh, and that's something i think is an important consideration uh, to think about uh, if the national carrier would be privatized there i think over the last couple of decades uh, maybe over the last 3 decades or so Uh, what has happened is that the private sector in india uh, with respect to its airlines have become very very strong i think uh, by the time air india got privatized uh, almost 80% of the domestic traffic uh, was being handled by private sector and to that extent there was enough skill set and enough talent that was built into the ecosystem uh, that we did not need to justify having a public sector carrier uh, which would create that sort of a skill and ecosystem indeed if you go back even further back in time the idea that uh, entities like airlines need to be in public sector was driven by the fact that whether private sector will have enough capital uh, in such capital intensive industries and the private sector had demonstrated that uh, they indeed do uh, and they were also doing uh, a fairly robust job at it uh, especially some of the airlines were uh, not only uh, far more efficient in terms of turnaround times but also profitability etc and finally as we uh, thought about this the why of this uh, w- other important uh, thing to think about is how, what does it do to the market structure uh, does it consolidate it into one player does it, uh, is there enough competition that would remain uh, who the buyer could end up being uh, what would the and because the pro- process of privatization uh, could throw up some interesting outcomes uh, in terms of who the buyer could be what sort of implication that would have on the market so those were some of the considerations Uh, that went into thinking about uh, the air india privatization uh, just talking about the process and the how of how this happened uh, the most important point is the political will uh, to start out with and to make the public case as to why uh, a private privatized uh, uh, airline sector is not something which is uh, either harmful for the nation or creates the sort of challenges with respect to connectivity or talent etc that i spoke of and then one needs to do uh, which is what uh, we ended up doing uh, is a large number of stakeholder consultations uh, which obviously includes the airline uh, but also other stakeholders in the ecosystem uh, the process was driven not just by one ministry uh, which is the ministry of civil aviation under which the public sector enterprise was uh, but by an interministerial group uh, which was headed in the first instance uh, by the finance minister and included uh, five ministers in all Uh, that helped create uh, interministerial consensus as well as create uh, a more political consensus on taking this forward the other thing that we learned as part of our uh, iteration uh, out of our process is the aspect of iteration uh, 
uh, we ended up uh, creating a 24% stake for the government in the first of privatization. Uh, and then Ashwin, Ashwini ji will speak about the second round. Uh, you will see that uh, at least the market came back with a feedback that uh, if it is to be privatized, uh, they would want to take 100% uh, stake. Uh, there were also considerations that came in which said that uh, Air India could potentially be split into two entities, uh, one looking only at the international operations, uh, which are typically more profitable, and the domestic operation, which may not be so, and there could be market uh, for only one set of uh, operations. Those were sort of feedback that kept coming in. Uh, we had to choose on how to think about it. Uh, happy to talk about uh, that process in some more detail, but that's in some sense the background on how uh, India went about it. Thank you, Mr. Akilesh. I think we'll come back to you to, to delve into that a little bit deeper. Um, but for now, um, Mr. Partners, if you could talk to us a little bit about what went right with the privatization process um, of Air India in the end. What were the kind of, um, what, were the, what were the processes that can be earmarked as successful um, that really drove uh, this privatization process? Thank you for that. Um, before I start speaking on the second privatization process of Air India. Um, let me try and give some context as to why it had to be done. So um, I'm not going to go back into history. Let's say we started about 2005. Um, the government of India got Air India and then Indian Airlines, which merged into Air India, um, 111 brand new aircraft. Now you can imagine how much that kind of a deal costs. Um, there were 320s which were to be used for within the region. And then there were large uh, 787 uh, Boeing Dreamliners which would have fly non-stop to Europe. And there were even bigger aircraft which are flying non-stop from India to the US, including doing being the only airline in India which flew non-stop from India, from Delhi to San Francisco. Um, all this sounds very nice on paper, but in 2013, the then Air India chairman uh, went to the government, Modi ji was not in power at this time, um, and said, look, I'll have to lock up the airline, we're broke. So they said, okay, we'll come out with a package they come, came out with a package of 300 billion Indian rupees to be given over a period of five years. Now cut to 2018-19, as Akhileshi was talking about. Um, the then Minister for Civil Aviation informs Parliament that Air India has posted a loss of 76 billion Indian rupees. And this is the third straight year of loss. So that gives some kind of a perspective as to why it was necessary. Why it went through this time was because the government was very, very, very nimble. Um, please remember that Air India privatization started when COVID had hit the entire sector. So nobody knew when it was going to bounce back. The International Airport Transport Authority was talking about bounce back in 24, if you're lucky. But the government said, no, it has to go. And as Akhilesh was saying, this time they decided to sell 100% stake. Um, that was also a slow process. It started sometime in December, January. And when I say they were nimble, there were five amendments that they made to the bid document that was issued, including the last one a few days or weeks before uh, the financial bids were called in, where um, they said the two bidders, the Tata and um, Ajay Singh, who's the owner of SpiceJet in his personal capacity, um, they can decide on the amount of debt of Air India that they want to take, which at that time was 600 billion Indian rupees. Now, if you make an announcement like that, days before or weeks before the financial bids are going to come in, it enthuses the people who are participating in the bidding process. And true enough, the Tatars and Ajay Singh put in a bid, and 
eventually um the tatars won the air india bit um now you're going to laugh when you hear these numbers probably because the tatars bid was um they were taking 15 to 16 crores of uh, 15 to 16 billion rupees of the 600 billion rupee debt that air india had and they were giving the government about 3 billion rupees cash but given the fact that air india was losing 150 200 million rupees a day indian rupees a day um the thinking was just let it go out because then we can focus on other things like uh, health social development um creation of schools um roads and things like that thank you mr padnes um it was very interesting to hear you speak about the three years of consecutive losses that air, air india faced that kind of drove this uh push towards privatization i think in sri lanka we have seen a lot more than 3 years of consecutive losses um and um i think mr thilan vijay singh can probably give us um a bit of context to uh the sri lankan experience with the national carrier and our our previous experience with privatization and uh then shift towards national uh, back to a national carrier uh, thank you anita uh, i was first involved with the privatization of sri lankan airlines in 98 as a board member of the now defunct public enterprise reform commission or perk on which uh, i served as an ex officio mem- member in my capacity as a then chairman of boi so at that time in 1998 we issued rfps we received three bids uh from emirates french airlines and korean air and it was decided by perk at that time that emirates gave the highest financial offer and the 44% stake of sri lankan airlines was divested for 73 million dollars 73 million us dollars on a 10 year management contract where the chairman of sla would be appointed by the government but there would be certain checks and balances imposed under the management contract but board control remained with the government particularly in order to retain the national airline status now the before and after uh privatization scenario is best exem- exemplified in one slide uh, which i'll ask the organizers just to put up if you if you don't mind or oh, there it is so this is a slide that i compiled in my capacity as chairman of the now defunct for public private par- partnership agency in 2018 and this slide shows that under emirates management up to until which ended in 2008 it shows the number of passengers carried and it also shows post the end of the war in 2009 the growth of tourist arrivals now 2008 was a catalytic year because that is the year in which the government under a false pretext took back or renationalized sri lankan airlines paying emirates 53 million dollars 27% less than what was paid to walk away so emirates effectively walked away somewhere in between, uh, in in 2008 prior to peace returning to sri lanka and despite the exponential growth of tourists much faster pace of growth in passengers carried you can see the red ink post nationalization under gosl management so this slide pretty much uh, exemplifies the fact that the government uh, cannot run an airline nor can it in my view run any industry that either a monopoly or in a in, in a competitive environment now in order to look forward uh, i i can summarize in about 5 7 minutes um where the and how and where the losses came from despite the fantastic performance of tourism growth that we've seen up until 2018 and obviously uh, since then the situation has eroded because we had the easter attacks in april 2019 and then subsequently covid so my numbers would primarily relate to 2018 but you probably have to add a few hundred million dollars of losses to these numbers so 
If you look at the accumulated losses up to 2018 of $1.2 billion, 90% of those losses were incurred under government management. I'm talking carry-forward losses, right? So technically, Sri Lankan Airlines, even today, is insolvent. The heaviest losses of around $160 million a year in average were incurred between 2011 and 2015 under a relatively incompetent management, I must, I must add. And it's also important to note that in 2018, the airline alone lost $210 million, which was cushioned primarily because of profits of the ground handling and um, the catering business, which generated about a $70 million profit or something thereabouts. Now, in 2018, Sri Lankan Airlines had a total debt of $750 million. My view is that number is probably close to a billion or exceeds a billion at this moment. Now, where did these losses come from? 38% of the loss in 2018 came due to debt service. The debts were primarily short term in nature. And of the $750 million, two thirds or slightly more than two thirds of the debt was owed to state institutions, the two state banks and the Petroleum Corporation. And the exposure to the state banks, uh, I don't believe has significantly reduced because I have not seen the numbers after 2018-19. Then about 25% of the loss was caused by aircraft leases being above market rates. Now, these were leases signed primarily in 2011 and 12, and our calculations showed that the aircraft leases on average were $45 million per annum above market rates, or roughly $350,000 per month in terms of lease payments. Um, so obviously, there was a problem post-nationalization. Uh, then the next source of loss, roughly 25% or sorry, 29% of the loss came from about 2,500 people or roughly 30% of Sri Lankan Airlines staff being overstaffed in comparison to other typical legacy airlines that uh, you would come across. Then about 7% of the loss came from Petroleum Corporation charging above market rates for aviation fuel. And then, of course, certain smaller percentages of losses were caused by highly unfavorable GSA agreements signed by various politically connected GSAs that were operating throughout the world. So that's basically as far as history is concerned. I mean, do you want me to go into the future? So in terms of Addressing the issue of privatization, when I was chairman of the PPP agency, working with two of the ministers then who are present here, so I'm a little intimidated uh, to see two ministers with whom I reported to, um, we looked at four options. Obviously, uh, the option that was selected was to implement a deep restructuring plan and divest the airline to a strategic investor. Other options would be shut down the airline, and of course that's not an option because of the exposure to the state uh, state banks, uh, do nothing was not an option, and of course chapter 11 bankruptcy was thought of, but we didn't have the legislation, and I'm thankful for Advocata for years advocating that we should have chapter 11 legislation. Now, why should a government, why should a state have a national airline? Uh, data has shown that for every one dollar that an airline brings as revenue of a tourist being brought in, four dollars of uh, benefits are generated to that country. But does it justify the losses that Sri Lankan Airlines has been incurring? No. So, so the overall strategy, and I believe this still holds true even today in terms of privatization of Sri Lankan Airlines, and I'll also tell you briefly, we failed in the second attempt to privatize during the government of 2015 to 2019, primarily on account of issues that arose due to the Easter uh, attacks, and secondly, the infamous 52-day period after which uh, the board and the chairman of Sri Lankan Airlines was changed uh, and there were certain uh, delays encountered, administrative delays and policy delays, and of course uh, it remained as, 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 a, as an airline owned by the state. But the overall strategy remains the same. First and foremost, what should be the vision? 
to retain and 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 have a have a national career hopefully under private ownership in the not not too not too distant future so one of the key visions that was decided at that time was that sri lankan airlines should follow what is called a value model which is something in between a legacy carrier and a budget airline but focusing on regional markets because we have to compete with the emirates and the qatars of this world and also the strategy was first to shrink the airline in order for it to grow so based on these um the summary of the restructuring plan was let's address the commercial and network inefficiencies for example at that time it was noticed that sri lankan airlines had too many wide body aircraft and by reducing this network of wide body aircraft it was forecast that about 40 to 45 million dollars of savings could be achieved then there was uh, the infamous airbus order for seven airbuses a350s uh, which had been ordered by the government of 2011 12 which uh, Uh, a, a former minister here had to actually renegotiate the cancellation of these leases at a rather a, uh, unfavorable uh, terms because there was no escape clause these agreements were fundamentally flawed um then the other aspect was staff rationalization how do we do that and then the most important aspect the debt restructuring um now when it comes to debt restructuring one has to remember that we cannot forget the role of the state rightly or wrongly and the state banks that have extended almost a billion dollars to sri lankan airlines so therefore the question has to be asked what is the amount of debt that the state should absorb and refinance so in 2018 we concluded that the right amount for the state state to absorb and refinance and at that time we were planning to do it through aiib via a 17 to 20 year loan and take it out of the balance sheet was around 500 million dollars and keep about 200 250 million dollars including the international bond within the balance sheet of sri lankan airlines um and immediately there was a value creation that was created the mm -hmm. second aspect of the restructuring is that is end? very important and am i okay if we can so, wrap up briefly so i we'll... i will i will i will wrap up uh, just you. my making this one point the most important aspect of sri lankan airlines uh, privatization is to understand that airlines ground handling and catering have different valuation principles so having bundled these all together and saying oh you know we want to attract a uh, 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 a strategic investor no first and foremost we must generate separate pnls in order to obtain the optimum valuation and that's a job for specialists so i'll i'll, I'll stop on that thank count, you very but, much uh, we, we can we talk will, more later we will come back and and uh, delve a bit deeper into into those last few points um to continue with the discussion i'd like to remind the audience that um, especially our online audience that we have a slido.com open the the hashtag is reform now and you can send your questions in we will be having a q and a session at the end of this panel um so yes moving on um we've heard a lot from mr thilan and from mr padnis about both how privatization has gone well and also some of the very unique challenges that sri lanka faces um mr ashwini could you speak a little bit uh, or shed a little light on the impact privatization has had uh, to india uh we've there has been a, a a decent amount of time has passed since this privatization process was completed what have the implications of this been has it been positive have there been some fallbacks um what would you say if i might digress a bit i yes. think the biggest positive outflow from this divestment process is that um, at a conference i met uh, sir tim clark the chairman of emirates and um, when i asked him are you worried about air india now going to the tata he said of course we are worried they're going to become a major threat for us because now you have somebody in looking after air india who is going to take decisions which are market driven who is going to make sure that they order aircraft and deploy aircraft which are required on certain routes rather than just doing whatever they feel like because there's some pressure from some point to the other um as regard what has been the fallout of it um early days because um, even though the bid was um, announced in october um the handing over taking over process 
um, was completed only in end January this year. So it's hardly been um, six, seven, eight months since the Tatas have come into Air India. But um, restructuring an airline, ordering aircraft, um, these are all things that take time. And you, they've got Air India, which um, there was no Wi-Fi on board. Um, the seats need, needed refurbishment. Um, the aircraft were old. Now, they have started in a slow and a steady fashion. Um, baby steps. Um, they've restructured the website. They have offered better meals on a number of flights, and that's increasing as we talk. Um, the call centers have been made more responsive. So now if you call, um, your calls are picked up within the first two or three rings. And now there's also talk of the Tata-driven Air India um, buying new aircraft. Now, uh, the aircraft that Air India got in 2005-06, they were brand new then. But since then, technology has moved. And you got the Neos, you got the, C, uh, the Maxes, um, all of which are much more fuel efficient than what the aircraft were at that time. So at this point in time, they're also looking at, right now, Tata's have four airlines with them. Um, Air India, Air India Express, which is uh, a low-cost operator operating from largely Kerala to the Gulf. Um, They've got Air Asia, which they're in the process of um, buying out completely and submerging that with Air India Express. And they've got another venture called Vistara, which is a joint venture between Tata's and Singapore. So now they're trying to work out the complexities of how they manage with four, soon to become three airlines in a market like India, which is the domestic predominantly driven by low cost. So Indigo has a market share of over 50% in the domestic market. Um, the, the, the full service carriers, they're adapting to this model. So Vistara um, has a few, it's full service, but it offers you the choice of getting onto the aircraft just buying a seat and taking seven kilos of bag. So your price comes down. It has an all economy configuration, quite a few of the, about seven of the aircraft. And on the other aircraft, they offer you economy, premium economy, the only one in India who offers premium economy and business. So the entire spectrum is now with the Tata group, which nobody else in the Indian market has. Thank you, Mr. Padmis. Um, Mr. Akhilesh Sidosha, would you also like to weigh in on that? Uh, so as uh, Mr. Padmis said, early days to uh, assess the privatization, uh, if you are OK, I just wanted to uh, pick up on a few points uh, that came up earlier in the discussion and react to some of those. Uh, maybe something of interest there. Uh, I think an important point is uh, just following through and ensuring that if a decision is taken to privatize, that it is, uh, it is, I take it to commission. Uh, the idea that it is uh, debated and discussed for a long period of time can sap the confidence of the boys. There are challenges with respect to doing uh, CAPEX, uh, again, especially in a growing market like it can become a big challenge. Uh, we saw the tourist arrivals in Sri Lanka. The need for capacity is going to be high. Uh, and it also saps the confidence of uh, lessors, uh, who, again, uh, at least in the case of Air India, uh, there, were, there used to be sovereign guarantees uh, with respect to the leases, etc. You don't want to create a situation where all stakeholders uh, end up in a situation where, uh, where there is a gradual loss in confidence in the uh, enterprise, and that continues to seed value on in and of itself. So. Uh, the decision to privatize has to be a very well thought through one. We discussed uh, issues about market structure, connectivity, et cetera. But once done, uh, needs to be followed through. Uh, it is, again, not an easy process. We were discussing how uh, the entire process took almost four years uh, from the first uh, 
thought on privatization uh, being tabled uh, more publicly uh, and to out uh, iterations, but one has to follow through and take it to a final closure. I think an important point also, and which came up uh, in the discussion earlier, is about the nationality of the buyer. Uh, there are uh, considerations with respect to bilateral rights, etc., uh, which require that uh, the entity be a flag carrier or at least be recognized as a, uh, as a, uh, owned and controlled in that entity. Uh, the technical term we used was IOCC Indian owned, uh, uh, controlled uh, Indian owned and controlled here. Uh, so to that extent, what that does is also reduces the number of people who can potentially bid. Uh, the local market needs to be strong enough uh, from where you will get bids. And that's something uh, of an important consideration that one needs to think through. What one also needs to think through uh, is the aspect of what happens if the local buyer were to fail uh, and the losses were to continue. Will that, again, stress the local banking system, etc.? And to that extent, the fact that the Indian... Uh, aviation industry was able to work through uh, profitably, reasonably profitably, uh, gave us some amount of confidence, but that's something to be thought through whether if it has to be locally owned and controlled, uh, how do you make uh, the decisioning, which is a lot more, uh, uh, if it is not the government and if it is, uh, then how do you think about uh, the buyers who may come in and how will they fund it? Uh, and finally, a very important point, and uh, Ashwini ji referred to that uh, uh, with respect to the amount of losses that Air India had, which were also represented uh, largely as the debt that Air India had. Uh, so about uh, 60,000 crore rupees, rupees 600 billion or so of uh, accumulated losses, uh, which were also equal to the sort of debt that the government took on itself. And eventually uh, effectively wrote it off uh, in the budget, in the union budget. Uh, what that meant is that all the sort of uh, players that was spoken of, whether it is the local or uh, the local uh, uh, public banks or private banks, or whether it was the oil companies to which uh, Air India owed uh, monies uh, to a wide variety of uh, people where uh, monies were owed, uh, were taken up by the government. Uh, and the government took that loss uh, in one full swing in one of the budgets. Uh, that can be a material drag on uh, the fiscal finances. And that's something, again, requires uh, both the space uh, where you have it, the fiscal space where you can do it, and also the political will to do it. So I just wanted to uh, highlight these two or three points that I thought uh, came through. Uh, too early to talk about uh, how the privatization will pan out. Uh, having said that, uh, the overall... Uh, private sector being a strong uh, player in the overall aviation ecosystem and, uh, in a, and in a position to provide both regional as well as international connectivity, I think gives India a lot more confidence with a completely private market. Thank you very much, Mr. Thilosha. Um, Mr. Thilan, if we could revert back to you. Um, We've heard a lot about the Indian experience, um, but right now in Sri Lanka, as we know, um, the economy is struggling. Sri Lankan Airlines itself carries a lot of debt. Um, how can we attract buyers? How can we uh, actually push this privatization process forward? It actually, as mentioned earlier, delaying will not help. Uh, but the approach to privatization should be with some international experts uh, who understand the aviation industry to see how in the short term uh, we can enhance value within Sri Lankan Airlines. Now, some of these recommendations can be considered contentious. Should we, for example, or not extend the ground handling monopoly for a limited period of time with some provision on what sort of charges to be levied for budget carriers? Uh, the Sri Lankan catering uh, operation, which are the profitable ones. And then you obviously have the bilateral uh, routes, I think, to India uh, when open skies were adopted, some very valuable routes to India and to China, and of course to, 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 to Europe. Um, what is really important is to essentially demonstrate uh, that the government has thought through a path to profitability and present that particular forecast, which can be done with experts, uh, to show that this path to profitability is in fact available as and when tourism turns around. Now, the last time we did that, we showed that in year of Sri Lankan Airlines would 
I'm talking going back to 2018, that by 2022, Sri Lankan Airlines would make a profit of $100 million. And that path to profitability was shown via the analysis done by the local and international uh, experts who looked at the prospects for the airline based on a deep restructuring plan, uh, which I outlined early, earlier in my um, sort of uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, uh, uh, another sort of uh, point of contention that we've seen in Sri Lanka is that there is mixed public opinion as to whether privatization of a national carrier is a good idea or a bad idea. Um, Mr. Padnis, as a journalist, you've been covering this issue uh, from various aspects for many years. Uh, how did you, did, did national sentiment impact this decision or impact the process in India? Um, did you did you see that weighing in? So I'll step back a bit. Mm. Um, what the president said, His Excellency the President said this morning, should give great comfort. But mere words are not going to work. There has to be something in black and white that a transaction advisor or anybody who is keen on investing in Sri Lanka um, can look at. And um, spoke about um, the open skies with India. That's an absolute gold mine. I mean, um, you have historical slot rights in an airport like Heathrow, London Heathrow. Um, that's worth its weight in gold. And there will be other such instances which can be marketed properly so that you can actually ensure that the sale goes through and it needs political will. Now, that is the most important thing because, I mean, um, you can't say that you will privatize and then not come out with a document which shows your intent to privatize. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can now open the floor for questions. Welcome back after the lunch break. I hope you enjoyed the session we shared about yesterday on the Air India privatization story. I think we have a lot to learn, don't we? As a country, we surely do. So ladies and gentlemen, now soon after the lunch break, we are now entering the second half of day two at the conference. This is Reform Now conference organized by Advocata Institute under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. Now, just to give you a brief on how the day went today, we started off with a session on debt crisis, structural adjustment and trade policy. And soon after we went into talking about labor market, we had a context setting uh, presentation on labor market and which was followed by a panel discussion on labor market reforms for more inclusive growth. And then after the tea break, we had a discussion on termination versus resuscitation. And now, soon after the lunch break, I promise that we are going to go for a reform discussion on agricultural land. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to start off with current land utilization, a presentation on current land utilization, unlocking land for development, which will be followed by a panel discussion on agricultural land, which will focus on the existing laws on the ownership allocation and use of agricultural land and the reforms necessary to make the sector more efficient and productive. Now, since we have a little bit more time to go into the main session, I thought it's a good time to remind you on the sponsors because they're the ones who are heading this whole, uh, making this whole event a success. So my thanks goes out to the sponsors. I'll start off with the platinum sponsor, Cal, and the gold sponsor, we have Expo Lanka. As silver sponsors, we have M2M, Veranda Services, John Keels Group, John Keels Properties. And as event partners, we have FNF, Jetwing Hotels and Atlas Network. Thank you so much to all the sponsors for making this day a success. We have another half day to go to make this whole conference, to bring it all to a conclusion. And I would like to remind you on the live streaming platforms as well. We, as you know, you must be watching us on any of these live stream platforms. We are going live on slvlogpolitics.lk, Sri Lanka Students for Liberty, the morning, the Sunday morning, daily FT, other, 
Economy and Business Sri Lanka, businessnews.lk and Citizen. Right, so I hope you are joining with us through one of these live stream platforms. So why do you watch these sessions during the conference and yesterday also you watched today, the second day. While you watch, you also have a part to play. What is that part? We respect your thoughts. We respect your views about how you look at this situation in the country because we know we are in an economic crisis in Sri Lanka. And we're trying to bring in reforms and talk a lot about different areas where we can bring in reforms and reset Sri Lanka. So as a citizen, I would like to um, request all of you to comment your thoughts and how do you think uh, we can go forward and what are your points of view in resetting Sri Lanka. And on that note, I would also like to remind you on the Advocata Institute, what they really stand for. As we all know, Advocata Institute is an independent policy think tank based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, which conducts researches and provides commentary and holds event events to promote sound policy ideas compatible with a free society in Sri Lanka. And let me remind you on their social media platforms as well so that you can stay up to date with what's happening in Sri Lanka because they're going to put forward their research findings and help us all decide what's best for us, what's really best for you and I as the citizens of Sri Lanka. So remind you about their social media arms. They're on FB, on Advocata Institute, Advocata Plus, Advocata Kural, and on LinkedIn as Advocata Institute, Twitter as Advocata Institute and Advocata Plus, and on YouTube as Advocata Institute and Advocata Plus. They're also on TikTok as Advocata LK and as Advocata Plus. And on Instagram, you can follow them on Advocata LK. So reminding you all the platform because um, if you're looking for valid and proper content, follow them on all their social media platforms so that you and I can stay up to date as they help us make our decisions and move forward for the country and help the country for a better future to reset Sri Lanka. And since yesterday, we started talking about resetting Sri Lanka. And as you know, yesterday, the whole conference, we commenced with the keynote speech of the president of the Democratic so Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, Mr. Ronil Wickremesinghe. And there also he mentioned that to stabilize this economy, we all need to go past recovery. So here we are going past the recovery. To go past the recovery, we all need to get together. We shouldn't be blaming any authority or any people at top saying they're not doing anything. No, I think it becomes our responsibility as responsible citizens in the country to get together. Because we all know, you and I have both, you know, we are both standing at petrol queues, at, you know, everywhere. You name it, you gas, electricity, um, fuel crisis, we are all going through this. But if we all get together with a positive mindset, we think we, we all can get through this uh, situation, get through this crisis, and that's exactly how we can reset Sri Lanka. Let's not leave it only for a few people to uh, take the responsibility and uh, let's not blame them, shall we? So with that, I think, ladies and gentlemen, let's keep an open mind for the rest of the day as well because your open-mindedness is needed to go forward as a country. And this is exactly what Advocata is trying to uh, stand for. And bringing this conference to you is the best that they're doing right now. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving into the main hall to see what they're going to talk about. This is, they're going to first of all start off with a presentation on current land utilization, unlocking land for development, which will be followed by an agricultural land presentation focusing on what's best for Sri Lanka. So, enjoy. Existing laws on the ownership, allocation and use of agricultural land and the reforms necessary to make the sector more efficient and productive. We will first start with a presentation by Migara Rodrigo, researcher at Advocata Institute.
science. <laughs> Land. It's a complicated and interesting topic, and an area which, in the spirit of this conference, is in dire need of reform. <clears throat> the aim of this presentation is to give a quick overview of the key facts about the context of land in Sri Lanka, so everyone is on the same page before our esteemed panelists take the stage. Issues relating to land have contributed to greatly reducing Sri Lanka's overall ranking on the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. Sri Lanka scored a very poor 51.9 out of 100 for property registration. World Bank officials found that having gone through the eight processes required to register land over an average of 39 days, an individual or firm would incur a cost equivalent to 5.5% of the value of the property. For context, an individual registering land in Singapore would have to go through six processes that can be completed in just 4.5 days at an expenditure of 2.3% of property value. Also of note is the fact that 82% of land in Sri Lanka is government owned. This is one of the highest in the world. Here are some key facts about Sri Lanka's land distribution, both in terms of land area and in terms of land area by climatic zone. Of the total 65,600 square kilometers, the majority is classified as agricultural land. By zone, most of the land area of the country is in the dry zone. Note that forest area counts all of the land classified by the authorities as a forest and not the actual tree cover itself. There's a distinction that becomes clear in slide six. This slide provides a significant amount of information about Sri Lanka's population, economic activity, and how it relates to our natural geography. There is clearly an agglomeration of people, infrastructure, and economic activity in the southwest wet zone and in the intermediate zones. This agglomeration began occurring largely in the 18th century and later, as the capital of the country switched to Colombo under the colonial powers. As a result of this agglomeration, there was a significant amount of deforestation as land converted to urban and agricultural applications. This continued in the wet zone until the ban on logging was imposed in 1988, which is why there is so little forest cover despite favorable conditions for plant growth. Indeed, the only parts of the wet and intermediate zones where there is still significant forest cover and limited infrastructure, agriculture, and population density is in the high elevation areas. These are areas above 500 meters from sea level where there is likely limited economic incentive to settle. On the top left, you can see Sri Lanka's current land use. The bottom left and the right of the slide show the change in land use in Sri Lanka between 2000 and 2020. Notable land use conversions can be seen from agriculture to settlements. These are the red patches. In addition, significant transformations can be seen from bare land to agriculture, yellow patches in both decades. Agriculture land use to settlement land use conversions were 485 kilometers squared from 2000 to 2010, and 1,536 kilometers squared from 2010 to 2020. Further, significant land use conversions can be seen from bare lands to agricultural lands and forest lands in both decades, approximately 6,000 kilometers squared in total. Population growth and finishing the civil war can be two possible reasons for these land use conversions. It should be noted that water sources have remained fairly stable despite the developments of the last two decades. This is a positive sign that bodes well for Sri Lanka's future water security and supply. This slide shows an overview of the forest land situation in Sri Lanka. There is slightly more state ownership of forest lands than the national average for all lands. As seen from the forest land breakdown, slightly over 20% of the land classified as forest does not actually consist of forest cover. The map on the right shows the different types of forest cover in Sri Lanka. 
It should be noted that although overall forest cover in Sri Lanka still remains at over 34%, a significant amount of the dense lowland rainforest that originally covered much of the wet and intermediate zones has been lost. On the top left of this slide is a breakdown of how agricultural land is used. The major plantation crops, which include tea and rubber, predominantly consist of export crops. From the top right, you can see that agriculture still contributes to 25% of employment, a significant percentage. However, there is low productivity in this sector, which contributes to the low but still significant contribution to GDP of around 7%. By comparison, China, which also has approximately 25% of the population in agriculture, obtains 16.5% of GDP from it. One reason for this low productivity and output is excessive state involvement in agricultural policy. The state both directs farmers on what types of crop they can grow and on how large their farms are. A result of this is that average farm sizes have been steadily falling, particularly since the 1972 land reforms, which has been causing fragmentation and low productivity growth. This also limits incomes for farmers, particularly when they are directed to grow low-value crops. Sri Lanka is one of the least urbanized countries in the world at 18.1% urbanization by official metrics. However, this may be due to current administrative practices and methods of classifying urban areas. Currently, only those living in areas with urban councils or municipal councils are considered as urban population. Independent experts have calculated that the actual figure, when accounting for agglomeration, is around 45% of the population. In any case, most of our urbanization has occurred over the last 20 years, and particularly in the post-war period, as seen from the diagram above. In fact, Sri Lanka had the highest rate of urbanization in the region from 1999 to 2010, and this has traditionally followed the ribbon development type, in other words, along established roads and highways. Predominantly, the population and urbanization in the country is concentrated in the western province, which accounts for almost 40% of GDP. Sri Lanka's extremely high state land ownership is the result of colonial land policies and subsequently the 1972 land reforms, which imposed a ceiling of land ownership on land ownership of 20 hectares that still exists to this day. As the statistics on the bottom show, there were many negative impacts as a result of these reforms, and some of their objectives, such as to provide land to the landless, still have not been accomplished today. The 11 to 21 percent reduction in land value is assessed by the World Bank. It comes about because farmers, who often do not have the full freehold titles to their land, cannot utilize its full value as collateral for loans for investment, which will potentially reduce the future output of the agricultural sector. Degradation of land occurs as a result of high state land ownership. Farmers and even plantations and companies do not really have an incentive to properly preserve their land as they only have it on a short-term lease. Meanwhile, encroachment on state lands remains high and has contributed to our high deforestation rates, particularly in the wet and intermediate zones. The 1970s land reforms expanded upon the Land Development Ordinance and introduced the Land Reform Act, both of which contributed to our high state land ownership at present. A significant amount of this land was expropriated from foreign corporations, sometimes without payment. Although that land was supposed to be redistributed to the landless, as you can see from the chart on the right, it was primarily redistributed to public agencies and cooperatives, often at the expense of productivity. Sri Lanka's productivity in a number of export crops, such as tea, fell, and they did not recover until privatization reforms were implemented many years later. As the statistics on the bottom show, these reforms greatly reduced the rights of farmers and have had other negative consequences. Finally, BOI zones. BOI zones primarily consist of export processing zones, 
though industrial parks and industrial zones are also significant. At present, there are 3,800 acres devoted to BOI zones, a figure that is expected to double with new public-private partnership EPZs being planned. BOI zones greatly punch above their weight. They contribute, although they only employ around 6% of the total workforce, they contribute to 42% of total export revenues, particularly from the textile and garment sectors. However, many BOI zones, such as the EPZ in Katunayaka, are currently operating near or at full capacity. It is therefore imperative to expand the capacity of these zones, to construct new ones, and to implement policy to liberalize trade and simplify tax structures in the hope of replicating the success of these zones island-wide. On that note, I'll bring this presentation to a close. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Migara. We will now begin the next presentation by Mr. Roshan Rajdurai, the Managing Director of Kalini Valley, Thalavakali, and Horona Plantations of Haley's PLC. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Till the PowerPoint comes on, as I stand here, I'm acutely aware I'm speaking to an audience who had a sumptuous lunch, and it's be a challenging and a daunting task to keep your attention riveted on my subject. I have a different proposition regarding agriculture. I've heard in the morning certain comments and opinions about the agriculture of Sri Lanka, and very quickly, sorry, PowerPoint, to get to the subject, I want to make a proposition that the inherent geographical, topography, climatic, and ecosystem of Sri Lankan land provides a favorable platform and can uh, invigorate agriculture on which about 28% of our people are directly employed and more so 77% of our national population is rural based and most of these agricultural holders or operators are in the regions. So by invigorating agriculture, we can uplift the quality of life and the lifestyle of about 28 million, 28 percent of our population. Uh, looking at the composition of GDP in Sri Lanka, you can clearly see that services and agriculture and industry sector. And when you look at agriculture, uh, paddy is a main crop, apart from coconut, which is a a uh, huge extent in terms of plantation crops and the traditional export-oriented plantation crops like tea and rubber. We have export agriculture crops of 120,000 hectares, fruits, vegetables, and other crops. And very quickly, just to uh, support my contention uh, that agriculture is a very positive feature and that we have to look at it in a very positive way, the objective of our agriculture land use must be to derive or extract optimal utility value from a unit of land on a sustainable basis so that the people and the country in the social, economic, and environmental, ecological areas benefit. Uh, talking of Sri Lanka, we are a small, tropical, maritime, humid island close to the equator, and we are blessed with adequate rainfall. More so, we have seasons where the whole country is covered in rain, as I will explain later, and about 40% of the rain is a surface runoff. Even that uh, is captured in terms of the uh, tanks and reservoir systems in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has 103 rivers, and 15 of them in the wet zone, 20 in the intermediate zone, eight rivers crossing all the three zones, and the largest river covering 10% of our land area. The extend, uh, sorry, extensive riverine system is supplemented further by 7,600 tanks. If you look at the employment profile of the 8 million, 27% uh, is in agriculture, and in industries, about 46%, and in services, uh, another 26%. Sorry, it's the other way around. Agriculture, 20, 27%, industries, 46 and services, 27%. Uh, we are blessed with uh, six 
uh, different land zones uh, so that different variety of crops can be grown in Sri Lanka. Uh, because of the advantageous location of our central hills, which is north-south oriented, all the water is radially flowing down to the low country, and which is a very good advantage for Sri Lanka. You can see the land zones and soil map. We have 23 great soil groups, and all these soil groups in their own support different vegetations, different crops. For example, there is soil type that favors paddy, then cereals and plantation crops. As you see, this is how the land is used in Sri Lanka. We have about 42% of our land devoted to agriculture. Then, as the previous speaker mentioned, about 20% in forest, about 5% in water bodies. You can look at the land use map in Sri Lanka, and 42% of the arable land is distributed mostly in the wet zone. So if you go to the next slide, this is how the cultivated crops are situated in our country. You can see the paddy lands, the concentration of paddy land in the middle of the country. Then the economic crops are towards the west and the center of the country. And the forested area is more towards the north and the south of the country. Uh, if you look at the extents of the cultivation, you can see that paddy or rice cultivation takes prominence. Almost close to 850,000 hectares of paddy is cultivated. Uh, with uh, two seasons, we cultivate about 1.2 million hectares. The important thing is that more than the extent involved, the number of households uh, engaged and dependent on this paddy cultivation. Other important food crops, like other food crops, is 175,000 hectares and coconut is close to 400,000 hectares, and the traditional tea, 202,000 hectares. Uh, cultivated food crops in all totally surpass 2 million kilos out of a total 4.5 million hectare cultivated. If you look at the agriculture sector of Sri Lanka, where 2.2 million people are engaged, what is significant is the number of people employed. You can see that paddy employs 1.8 million households in Sri Lanka, out of a possible 5.5 million households. Then 700,000 people are engaged in coconut cultivation at ground level. Then another 100,000 people are engaged in coconut production. Then there are 450,000 tea smallholders and 200,000 rubber smallholders and another 1 million people cared for by the regional plantation companies. So when you look at the agricultural profile, you can see the extent to which the majority of the people, rural folk base, are dependent on the industry for their sustenance and livelihood. Now, when you look at paddy, I think uh, just to give an illustration of the paddy sector, you can see small patches of paddy land right throughout the country. And so tea and rubber, you can see exclusively, they are concentrated uh, in the western uh, Sabaragamu and the central hills. And when you look at Mine ex export crops, we call it export agriculture crops. Again, you can see the concentration of those crops, uh, not uh, mainly in the dry zone, but in the central, western, Sabaragamo, and the Uwe areas. So why is agriculture important for Sri Lanka? Number one, it is very important for our food security. Before the pre-pandemic period, we had 90% food security. Of course, we don't know the latest figures now, and Again, it's important for nutrition and health. Uh, we have 2,030 kilocalories national average, and it is well within the recommended rates by the Medical Research Institute. Although other South, East, uh, South Asian countries have a higher kilocalorie intake than Sri Lanka, then it's important for our national sovereignty. If we are secure in our food and we can feed ourselves, we don't have to be indebted and go on our bended knees to other countries to ensure our food supply. Then it provides social security, cohesion to the society. Uh, we have seen countries uh, leading on to food riots in the absence of food. So social security aspect, food is very important. Then poverty alleviation. As I mentioned earlier, 77% of Sri Lankan population is rural based and agriculture is their main source of income. Then, for obviously, for human well-being, for good health, fitness and longevity, agriculture is important. 
And as I mentioned earlier, uh, almost one quarter, almost 27% of our employed people are employed in agriculture directly, apart from the other amenities and other businesses that are connected to agriculture. Then foreign income. We need dollars, and agriculture is a sure source uh, of foreign income, and more than anything, it provides for effective land use. So let's look at the country scenario. As some speaker mentioned, uh, we have 6.6 .6 million hectares of land, and excluding the water bodies, we have 6.3 million. And agriculture land is 42% of the national land base. And the Central Highlands has 14% of this land. The important thing is 83% of country land and more than one third of the country's ag agriculture land is state owned. We talk of the British colonials taking over the land, but we have persisted with the system even after 150 years. The state has an absolute grip, absolute control over the land of this nation. And we have almost 1.3 million state owned agriculture land compared with 880,000 privately owned agriculture land. Or 42% of the agriculture land of that. 40% in plantation crops, including tea, rubber, coconut, then probably cinnamon, sugarcane, and such. And 28% of this agriculture land is in paddy, our staple crop. Then per capita land area is only one-tenth of a hectare per person, uh, decreasing very fast. And land-to-man ratio is 0.3, one-third of a hectare. And temperature in the low country and the hill country is ideal temperature for any crop growth. I think this is an advantage we in Sri Lanka have, whether it's a wet zone or the dry zone, or even the low country, the hill country, we have suitable temperature. And 64% of the land is in dry zone. When I say that, people might think that we are having a water shortage, but later on I'll show you that even this is a surmountable, this is a surmountable issue. And 23% of our land in the wet zone, and of the land in the wet zone, uh, statistics provide that 50% of the land is already under cultivation. For example, Mathura district has close to 70% of the land under cultivation, Kegol has 4%, and Gampa 63%. Uh, dry zone, only 13% of the land is under cultivation. Of so we have over 2,000 millimeters of annual rainfall, uh, and we have a rural population of 77%, as I mentioned earlier and urban land use in only 6.8%. So other advantage for Sri Lanka to promote agriculture is that 63% of the population is in that age group of 5 to 59 years. We are not a very old generation, so there is a ready pool of labor coming in the future even to sustain the agriculture. And the significant feature in this agriculture, I heard, sorry, I heard, uh, sorry, I heard uh, many comments about the uh, low productivity in agriculture. Yes, that is a fact. That is driven because 71% of the lands are below one hectare in Sri Lanka, and 27% of the farmers are landless, and 82% of the farmers or people involved in agriculture have less than two acres. Anyone in involved in agriculture will know, with this kind of a small scale, you cannot have a productive agriculture base. So if you look at the distribution of agricultural land in the districts, you can see that six districts, Kurnagala, Putlam, Andradapura, Badulla, Mondragala, and Ratnapura, they cover 46% they cover of the agricultural land in our country. And when you look at the population profile in matching to this, about four districts, that is central, southern, northwestern province, and western province, have 65% have of our population. So this is how the spread of the land is. And most of the arable area uh, is available, in, unfortunately, in the dry areas like Waunia, Mana, and Kilinochi, and Batiklo. If you look at the agriculture employment, out of the 8.4 million people sorry, sorry, employed in agriculture, 26% that is 2.2 million people are employed directly. But unfortunately, as mentioned, our GDP contribution is only 7%. Uh, this is with 700,000 people engaged in coconut and 450,000 tea smallholders. These are major uh, foreign income earning crops and 2,000 rubber smallholders. 
uh, main feature of this is that our agriculture is subsistence scale and not large commercial scale agriculture in general. So, uh, of this agriculture employment of 2.2 million, we have 1.2 million, almost 50% own account workers and contributing family workers and other 21%. So when you combine both own account workers and the family workers, they constitute 70%, sorry, it's, uh, technology, 70% of the agricultural labor force. And this is also another uh, issue in having commercial and productive agriculture because family labor and uh, account workers do not have guaranteed regular work. They don't have regular salaries or statutory dues and other benefits and facilities of corporate sector workers. I'm comparing them with the workers engaged in tea and rubber plantations. And out of the total population of 9.1 million people engaged in agriculture, there are 2.6 million households. That is, out of 5.5 million households, almost 2.6 million households in Sri Lanka are engaged in agriculture. Now, 66% of these households own less than two acres. So with this kind of a scenario, I think it's not practical to look at large-scale commercial agriculture. And therein lies the solution that I think is a good point to convince the government to let go of the available agriculture land for commercial agriculture. Then uh, research has found that 56% of these agriculture households, uh, their highest share of income uh, comes from agriculture. So the balance, although they're engaged in agriculture, the balance, 46% of the people, their highest share of income comes from employment outside agriculture. So if you look at the, their wages and salaries, uh, sorry, sorry, screen is not working. If you look at their wages and salaries, we find that the mean income for agriculture is 23,720 rupees compared to the in, people engaged in industry, almost 35,000 and services at 43,000. So herein lies, uh, it is not a very attractive sector to be in because agriculture workers are earning less than half of that of, the, of those employed in services. If you look at the median income also, it's about 20,000 as opposed to 30,000 for people engaged in the industry and about 38,000 for people engaged in the services. So this is one of the reasons that there is no attraction. There is no, uh, people are not coming in adequate numbers to agriculture because if you, agriculture is basically a daily wage based job. And if you look at the median income of agriculture based workers, it's only 16,000 rupees uh, compared to even 24,000 people in the industry. So this is a feature of our agriculture. And this is one of the reasons uh, that Agriculture is not an attractive proposition in Sri Lanka. If you go to the agriculture holdings, it clearly shows that almost 82% of the agriculture land is classified as small holdings, meaning less than 20 acres, that's about 8 hectares, and the balance 17% shown as estate sector is lands more than 20 acres. So most of the coconut lands would qualify under estate sector and any, any land perennial crop worth its name will have definitely more than 20%. Uh, so uh, while agriculture holdings and extent has increased, when you compare with 1982 to 2014, you can see an increase. One of the reasons is the population growth and the cessation of the hostilities in the North and East and having the war ended, people started settling down and restarting the cultivation. With all this, the picture clearly demonstrate that agriculture, although 27% of our people are engaged in it, our contribution is very minimal. It's only 7 to 8% in the GNI, in the GDP. And if you look at the, uh, oops, if you look at the distribution, you can see that service sector is providing 63% to the GDP, whereas agriculture is a measly 8%. And how this is, uh, Distributed is, you can see that main contributor to the gross national income at district level is rice and fruits. 
Uh, tea and rubber come down because they are mostly export agriculture crops. And this will show you the agricultural land extents. You can see that uh, districts in the northwestern province have more agricultural land as well as Saburaga more. Uh, and this is very interesting. Uh, in the provincial, the breakdown of provincial GDP, uh, northwestern province uh, has the highest percentage of oleaginous foods, that is coconut and associated, whereas fruits also play a predominant role. A feature of this is when you take the top three uh, provinces, uh, we find that most, in most cases, three provinces provide about 60 to 60 percent of the total uh, value of certain crops. For example, in rice, if I take rice, eastern province and north, central and southern province alone, these three districts alone, provide almost two-thirds of the rice income. If you look at the tea, of course, obviously, is centered about central, southern, and Uwa province. So likewise, we feel, see a feature where certain crops are concentrated, and this makes a strong case for zoning and concentrating on certain crops in certain districts where favorable infrastructure, the labor, and the climate is already available. If you look at the current trends, now that is agriculture features that I discussed, you can see that from about 18%, 18 to 19% in the 1995 to 2005 era, we have dropped down to 7% by 2020. So there is a steady decline in the contribution of agriculture to our GDP. Likewise, employment, agriculture sector used to employ 36% in the not too distant past in 1995, having come down to 25% or 27% now. Although contribution to the GDP declined more than 50% for the last two decades, it is the second highest contribution in terms of employment. So the main source of livelihood for rural population, which accounts for 77% of our population, is agriculture. But that is marked by lowest gross wage or salary in all the three sectors, as I explained earlier, with a median income of 20,000 per month compared to almost 40,000 in the services. So this phenomena, the attractiveness of agriculture, the real uh, salary levels and other benefits of agriculture is not a phenomena confined to Sri Lankan only. We find that in the South Asian region from 2010 to 2019, agriculture employment had a negative growth of 8.5% compared to a positive growth of 1.3% in services. So that is, uh, sometimes you might think that agriculture uh, is a no-hoper, it's, it's not an industry that people must invest, but look at these strides. Now when you look at the major rivers in Sri Lanka, every part of the country, every district practically is covered by rivers. You can see rivers going through every district and every part of our country. And look at the dry zone, which we consider that it is not suitable for agriculture, it has 64% of the land area, and you can see a concentration of rivers and tanks in the dry zone. This can be further explained. You can see the river system, it's a river network, is like a sieve over the country. Wherever you look, you can see a river and stream network, and supported by, I told you, some uh, concentration of reservoirs in the dry zone. So ours is not a country uh, that is uh, short of water, that we have to look for water. Uh, and again, apart from the rivers and reservoirs, we have irrigation schemes. And our groundwater is more than adequate for agriculture. And we are talking of climate change. If you look at climate change, it is project projected that by 2050, our intermediate zone will expand. So that means we are having less extent in the, what we call the dry zone, and more and more land will come in uh, suitable for agriculture enterprises. So while for most countries climate change has a negative connotation, I believe that uh, it is, in my opinion, it is going to be positive for Sri Lanka. Right. So having all the advantages, having a huge land mass uh, engaged in agriculture, one-fourth of our people employed in agriculture with this supportive uh, irrigation and rivering system, we are still in a very bad position. I just want to illustrate that. Paddy is our staple crop, 
1.8 million people are engaged in paddy, uh, paddy cultivation. But if you look at the figures, the paddy farmers are in eternal debt cycle. Uh, this explains uh, the loans they have taken, the green bar explains the loans they have taken, and the red bar shows you the loans they have paid. So there is always, if you look at uh, the last five years or so, the paddy farmer has not been able to pay up the loans that he has taken. So he is in an eternal debt cycle. And this is not only uh, applicable to paddy, this is applicable to other crops as well. So this is an illustration that while we have all the advantages, our agriculture workers, our agriculture sectors are not thriving. So if you look at the rice imports in Sri Lanka, in 2020, we imported rice worth rupees 2 billion, 1.936 million rupees worth of rice was imported. In 2017, we imported 740,000 tons of metric rice. You know, metric tons of rice. Uh, another important thing is, uh, it says other foods. We have spent 137 million, uh, 137,558 million. That is 48% of all our food and drink ex uh, expenditure has gone to import other food. So having all the supportive agricultural base, having 25% of our people engaged in agriculture, still we have to resort to import food. Now another interesting thing in Sri Lanka, it doesn't connect to agriculture, we are surrounded by the ocean, we are an island, but we are imported rupees 19,215 million worth of dried fish, food for thought. And other fish it says, probably salmon, tin fish, rupees 15,844,000. So we are imported fish in dried or other forms, being an island, 35,959 rupees worth, and that import is 73% of our fertilized import bill for the whole of agriculture, including paddy, tea, rubber, and vegetable, and other crops. Our food import bill is usually 2.5 billion US dollars. So I, I look at this sector as a sector having enormous potential to develop agriculture. It's not the dead end, it probably is a start because we have this kind of potential and this is the scenario currently. So what I feel is agriculture sector is like a huge giant tied down by thousands of small strings. I think all of you all are familiar with the story of Gulliver, right? Even thousands of small strings can tie down a giant. So I think that is what has happened to our agricultural sector in Sri Lanka. Uh, what are the features, very briefly, in the interest of time? Uh, why has the agriculture sector come to this state, or why is it a sleeping giant? How can we wake it up? Uh, if you look at our agriculture sector, one of the features is very low land and labor productivity. Uh, one of the reasons is quite obvious because it's a small scale of operations. When you have quarter, quarter acre or less, I don't think you can make an economic uh, go of running agriculture profitably or successfully. Then we have improper land use and resulting from that improper agronomy and agricultural practices. Then, as I explained earlier, uh, small size of farm holdings lead to low farm family income due to small land ownership. Now, for example, a major economic crop in Sri Lanka is uh, tea. The smallholder sector, right, they are self-supportive. Uh, they are not depending on the government. The tea industry runs on its own. The smallholder sector with 450,000 operators, the average land holding size is 59 to 60 purchase. So with 59 to 60 purchase, they make their living. And of course, paddy is only two acres. Anyone involved in paddy knows that with two acres, uh, you cannot make a successful enterprise. Uh, and declining land under cultivation. Because of this reason, uh, sinking of cultivable, cultivable land due to urbanization, population growth, and mainly since of late, land degradation. We had a classic example of that in the last week, flash floods that probably destroyed many hectares of vegetable cultivation and crop land in the upcountry. Then poor knowledge and awareness by operators and underutilization and misuse of lands. Land degradation comes under misuse. High labor component cost in the cost of production of agriculture produce. Because of our small scale, because of the low use of technology and appropriate agricultural tech, uh, practices, 
the labor cost component is fairly high compared to the other industries and other countries. And another important thing is insecurity of tenure and ownership terms. In terms of, even in commercial agriculture, uh, an example is the plantation sector where it's a long-term crop and we have uncertainties about the tenure. We have 20 years to go uh, before the lease runs out. Up to now, there is no guarantee or there is no indication that the uh, lease should be continued. So no investor would invest. Uh, normally a rubber crop takes 30 years and a tea crop about 50 years. So there should be some indication of continuity if investors are going to invest in land. So this applies in the small scale as well. Then I uh, already discussed uh, diseconomies of scale. Even if you take our major commercial crops like tea, uh, which I'm familiar, uh, in Sri Lanka, tea estate is about 200 to 250 hectares on average compared to the better tea economies like in Kenya, which is about 1,000 hectares. So these diseconomies of scale at a certain point brings huge disadvantages, but we have made that as a strength in Sri Lanka and we produce different types of diverse tea to keep uh, ahead of the competition. Then low use of technology, innovation, and the small size and lack of capital means low mechanization and automation in the agriculture sector, and the climate impact. Since ours is a small country, a slight change in the environment will have significant uh, impact on the ground in topography and climate. Then, as explained earlier, our agriculture is predominantly subsistence, subsistence and homestead crop farming systems. Even now, we have shifting agriculture that is a chain of system. So there is no guarantee of price for the producer. And as, because it's an informal sector, almost 91% of the agriculture workers are informal. That means their employment is seasonal because they don't own the land and there is no crop insurance or policy in terms of social safety net. And then the government policies is one of the key areas that has had a severe impact on agriculture. Most of the deficiencies in agriculture, follies uh, created by us, which could have easily been avoided. I have to point out the uh, unwise decision of first banning glyphosate in 2015, that had repercussions for not only the export agriculture crops, but also in the paddy sector because paddy farmers and maize farmers didn't have the glyphosate for wheat management. And you can see that the country had to import rice. And of course, the latest that everybody knows, the ban on fertilizer and weedicides and fungicides. Already, uh, we see a decline of 20% in export crops such as tea and rubber. We have had a drop of about 40%. And I'm sure the paddy harvest also will be impacted to a significant amount because of these inputs that had not gone in the appropriate time. And these have long-term irreversible uh, effects. So then other features of the sector is, uh, I think this was discussed, multiplicity of state agencies and ministries. At one time, I recall, for the plantations alone, we had about nine ministries. One for cashew, one for sugarcane, one for tea, one for JDB. So this is uh, one of the salient aspects of our industry. Uh, then we have complex administrative and land governance systems. We have 39 operational land laws limiting flexibility. Uh, information system asymmetry markets and the farmer at the ground level doesn't know. Uh, I think we have all read about uh, gluts of vegetables at one time. They allow it to rot and farmers committing suicide. That is because our system is not attuned to give the right information, market information to the growers on the ground. Then we have poor infrastructure facilities for transport and storage. Then we have plethora of laws, and mostly excessive uh, regulations and controls, and long drawn out approval protocols, and some very archaic laws. Now in terms of agriculture, timing is everything. You need to do certain things at a certain time, and if you do not do it at that time, then that uh, exercise is useless. So we have enough of examples of all these um, bureaucracy and the delays it entails. Of course, we have archaic labor laws, as explained earlier. And people don't like to employ or engage uh, regular workers in agriculture because agriculture has its seasonality uh, feature. So then, that, then there are some uh, times of the year that you have to have less work, but our labor laws do not permit such a flexibility. Then political will to make unpopular decisions. 
Uh, classic case is the oil palm. Uh, there's much debate, but science has proved that it is not detrimental to the soil if properly cultivated. Uh, it's a very, very valuable crash crop, uh, at least one million rupees profit as opposed to rubber that you have to run it at a loss. So when you have profits, the industry and the people engage in it prosper. So these are some of the uh, decisions that the policymakers have to take. Uh, accelerated outmigration of skilled and talented people from the industry. Uh, most of the farmers are aging. Within four years, the average age of farmers uh, uh, has gone up to about 55 years, according to statistics. That means uh, young people are not coming in for work, the older people are remaining. Uh, for the age group of 19 to 24, less than 1% are in agriculture. So that means agriculture is definitely not an attractive proposition for them. So the, that is the most productive and that's the age people can uh, put their labor because agriculture is a very labor intensive job but you can see that there is no attraction in agriculture for youngsters then of course low status societal acceptance and dignity for agriculture work we understand that no farmer's son uh, or no one will want to continue as a farmer or a, even a tea or rubber estate tapper would not want the children to continue so we need to change and introduce different um, uh, working models to make the farming or agricultural work attractive to the people engaged in those areas. Then we have uh, commoditization of the product. And that is one important reason why agriculture has not taken off. Look at the case of tea. 150 years of existence in our country. Even now, we are sending only 10% in the value-added form. We call it value added, but it's boxes and bags. I don't believe that is real value addition. So the grip, the control of the retailer is very much evident. We can only send 10% as, uh, okay, uh, as uh, value added form. So then our product range and quality has to diversify. Uh, the uh, low institutional support for research and development, weak extension and research. So I'm not going to go through that. Uh, I think this has been the conference proceedings. So very quickly, I want to just touch on way forward uh, because of the interest of time. Main thing, the 82% of the land that the government is holding, they have to let it go in a scientific, methodical manner. How they can do that is to have a non-partisan expert panel to advise and set permanent policy on agriculture, right? And government must stop meddling in agriculture. They should not get involved in the business uh, of business, which is not the business of government. Uh, national land policy, GIS mapping, I say GIS mapping in Korea, they have mapped every acre or even smaller and identified the soil and the ecosystem there and recommended plants and crops that can be grown. So we also can adopt it, then centralize agriculture related ministries, consistency and uh, of policy, liberalize land tenure, free up land held by the state and consolidate the small holdings and support research, use state resources, surely we can use our resources and clear a lot of available agriculture lands and have agriculture zones like the BOI and give 100 hectares or 200 hectares for willing companies to start agriculture in the dry zone. We have enough uh, water facilities and irrigation facilities. Encourage wider technology, uh, level playing field for the producer giving fair value, uh, correct the information asymmetry and have supportive infrastructure. And all this will encourage external investments in commercial agriculture. Uh, so I will, uh, I have some more points. I'm sure this is uh, all very uh, quickly. Digital inventory, uh, land suitability and land utilization plans, uh, equitable land use policies, provide stimulus. Now this is very important. If you are going to promote agriculture like what the government did when the coffee industry was decimated and tea came in, they provided so much of stimulus to promote tea. So likewise, we'll have to provide a lot of stimulus uh, to ex expand our agriculture with and the uh, different crops to be grown, uh, weather and forecasting and early warning systems. And another important thing is stop illogical expropriation of land. We have many cases where productive crop bearing land have been taken over by the government and allowed to go to rack and ruin. Uh, then finally, degradation, encroachment, and erosive land use must be stopped and monitor agriculture land, fragmentation, scarcity, and conversion of agriculture land to other uses. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to finish now. 
we need to change the perspective. Enough time arguing whether agriculture is good or bad. There is a definite potential for improvement of our agriculture sector if we can take the right policies. And we need to look at agriculture as something positive and not something that is uh, deadbeat. Right? There is potential, the people, the culture, the history, and we have experience, people experience in agriculture to turn around the agriculture sector. So despite all the ups and downs in agriculture, uh, one product has kept Sri Lanka's agriculture in the forefront. I'm talking of Ceylon tea. For 150 years, it has been a global brand, and it still continues to be the most sought-after beverage in Sri Lanka. And I want to conclude that in the agriculture, we are the flag bearers, and Ceylon tea is still the best. So keep drinking Ceylon tea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roshan. Now I invite the rest of the panel on the stage. I would like to welcome Mr. Indrajit Fernando, the former Land Commissioner, along with the moderator, Sudharaka Arya Ratna, a research associate at the Advocata Institute. Over to you, Sudharaka. Thank you, Anuka, for that um, introduction. And thank you, Dr. Raj Dure, for that very informative presentation. Um, contrary to what it says on the name board, it should read uh, Dr. Raj Dure. In fact, I should mention that he has not just one uh, PhD, he has multiple doctoral degrees. So, so, so sorry for the oversight. Um, I think I will jump straight um, into the questions. So my first question um, is to Dr. Raj Dure. Um, we all know that uh, private smallholders in the tea sector uh, own um, just actually 60% of the land, um, but their contribution um, to the tea production is actually 70%. Um, so they um, actually are very more, like, much more productive um, than uh, the estate sector, where you know the land is originally owned by the government and now. Uh, managed by the private sector. So do you think the land ownership has something to do with productivity in this case? Yeah, it's obvious uh, because when you have such small holdings, in the case of the smallholder, as I told earlier, average uh, smallholder land owning size is 60 purchase. And generally now, uh, if you look at the figures, uh, they have come to a maturity stage. There was a period in the 1970s when suddenly the tea market changed. Uh, countries in the uh, former Soviet Union and the Middle East, uh, flushed with oil money, they were able to pay a very high price for the type of tea that the low country estates made. So everybody practically went in for tea cultivation, and as a result, the dynamics uh, shifted from the large estates to the smallholder sector, which has been a very, very uh, good sector, dynamic sector, employing uh, close to 500,000 people on the ground. And one of the limitations is the land, because there is no land, but there is enough cultivable land in the regions. And I, as I said earlier, the government should put in a mechanism to distribute that land to people willing to cultivate. Probably this is not the best time because we are beset with other challenges, but uh, people have the appetite to take the land. Very interesting fact that our, our data was not up to date. Up to about uh, 2000, we had 222,000 hectares of tea land. Of course, corporate sector is all uh, very accurate and is well documented. Suddenly, last year, I see uh, in a couple of days, Central Bank says, now the tea land is 267,000 hectares. That means for about 20 years, we have unaccounted, I mean, in terms of uh, statistics, tea land that was not included in the hectare age being counted. So the smallholder productivity in Sri Lanka is about 1,400 kilos uh, yield per hectare. A visa with the company estates at about 1,300. You cannot compare both because there are very, very peculiar uh, situations operating. Ours is a daily paid employment, whereas the smallholder is entrepreneurial uh, employment. So that's the difference. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Ajay, thank you so much. Uh, my next question is for Mr. Indrajit Fernando. Um, I think uh, we have guests joining us here from all kinds of backgrounds, and it may not be immediately clear to them how land policy might necessarily be directly related to the dairy industry or the livestock industries. Um, so it would be great if you could explain what exactly is the um, 
link between land uh, ownership reform and the dairy industry? Actually, uh, I, as you know, about 7% uh, is contributed to the GDP from uh, agriculture. And out of that, close upon 2% is from livestock. And in the livestock sector, major contributor is dairy. So, if you take uh, dairy, especially, uh, it will need a lot of land because you have to uh, grow pasture uh, to feed the animals. And uh, in Sri Lanka, most of the farmers, more than 95% of the farmers are rural uh, farmers who does not have land or very little land. And even when they have land, this land is used for other agricultural crops as well because they are not 100% engaged in dairy. They cultivate other crops also. So this has created a big problem because if you take the average daily production of a cow uh, is around 3 liters a day. That is mainly because our uh, animals are not fed properly. Otherwise these animals have a potential to produce more than that. But normally, uh, because these farmers does not have land, they feed the animals by the roadside or uh, some other people's land where the grass is available. This grass is not nutritious pasture which is meant for uh, dairy production. So because of that, these animals does not get sufficient nutrition to produce. And sometimes because of the the, the for roaming around to uh, get that grass, they spend a lot of energy uh, for their maintenance. So the production is also affected. Because, so now there is a requirement that we must have proper pasture cultivated and fed to these animals. And uh, still pasture is not recognized as a crop. So that is another problem. So now it is high time that uh, uh, we have, uh, we, we should uh, you know, think about this. And also, uh, most of the land, as Mr. Rajudre said, belongs to the government. So even when uh, uh, there are investors to invest for commercial scale farming, the main problem they face is to get proper land, a huge extent of land, at least maybe a few hundred hectares will be needed. So it is the only uh, place where they can get this type of land is government. So government ha must have uh, some clear policies uh, so that some land can be released for this because they are, uh, I know personally, there had been a few years back, some parties came, uh, foreign parties, who are interested to uh, invest here in dairy farming. And then they came and had discussions several times. And finally, they gave up because they could not get land because of certain, you know, uh, red tape. So I think uh, government has to think about that. And uh, even now, we are spending a huge amount of uh, foreign exchange to import milk powder. And uh, we produce only about 40% of our requirement. 60% uh, is imported. And I think uh, year before last, about 97,000 tons of milk powder was imported at a huge cost of about more than 90 billion rupees. So land is very important for dairy. Um, yes, Dr. Rajdure. Um, based on what I understand, you are a big proponent of formal zonal demarcation of uh, land for different agricultural activities. Um, why is that? As I showed very clearly, certain districts have a concentration of certain crops that they have grown successfully. So I think uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The infrastructure and the setup is already there. If the government can release the land that is in those districts for selected crops, I think we can easily enlarge our agricultural profile. And the other important thing is now, if you look at upcountry, other than tea, there is nothing we can grow in the upcountry. 
Of course, forestry we can do, but the government forestry policy, for example, one of the things is uh, very duplicious because uh, there is a law saying that you cannot harvest anything above 5,000 feet, right? Because you cannot grow anything other than tea and vegetable crops and some food crops. Uh, but uh, because of the attraction that agriculture has for uh, or does not have for informal sector workers, we can't attract people to grow those in commercial skills. They can do their home garden and grow some fruit trees. So if you are going to be a very strong agricultural economy, then we need to release or let go some other government land, even for fuel loot. I think when we say fuel loot, people get very alarmed, but one has to only go and stand near the Avisavela bridge to count the number of lorries bringing firewood to the tea, tea uh, country or tea estates. Uh, they don't have the uh, fuel wood plantations in the low country, so obviously they are denuding or cutting the government forests or low country forests. Whereas we have 20 or thousand hectares uh, cultivated with a loan from ADB. They did a scientific study and recommended cultivation of fuel wood, and we have cultivated for use. So fuel wood is not anything evil. Every country does it in a scientific way. When you cut a fuel wood tree, you leave the stump. There is no disturbance to the root system or soil, and it regenerates, it copies us. So things like that, I think we should have very, very clear policy, especially in the upcountry. We operate in the upcountry, we have nothing else to, uh, at commercial scale. So we need to zone, we need to uh, provide areas that are eroded, that are not suitable for tea or any commercial cultivation for fuel loot. Then we save the wet country, uh, wet zone for us. Like that, certain areas in the uh, central province can be uh, zoned for export agriculture crops, given all the support. So I think there's a good case for zoning, and we have a very efficient government infrastructure in terms of uh, resources to clear land, maybe 100, 200 hectares, and give a greenfield cultivator or company to grow certain uh, specific crops, like in the free trade zone. If they can clear about 1,000 hectares and invite companies to take 200 hectare blocks, I'm sure we can uh, enlarge our agriculture footprint because people are willing, as he mentioned, there are big companies and corporates willing to invest and participate in agriculture, but the, the space is not there. So much of bureaucracy, so much of permission, Raj. So then people just simply give up. So zoning is the first place to start, but before we do zoning, we must have a competent, nonpartisan uh, committee uh, deciding on land use and agriculture policy for the uh, province or a district. And we must go according to that blueprint, not uh, do things ad hoc. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Fernando, would such a uh, zoning blueprint uh, benefit the dairy industry as well? Or do you think much more needs to be done in terms of the issues uh, the dairy industry faces in terms of uh, the pasture and fodder crops? Uh, yes, because now, as I said earlier, our daily average production per cow is about three liters. Let, 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 you know, uh, that is very less. The main reason is feeding. Uh, you have to feed the cow properly, then only you can get. Now, uh, up to about six liters, you can produce mainly on pasture. Cow is a ruminant, so mainly you have to give uh, leaf, I mean uh, cellulose. It can digest cellulose. But when you don't have enough pasture or quality pasture, uh, you have to fill the gap. So when you fill the gap, you have to give concentrate feed, which is again made out of other agricultural products. Now, a few days back, I saw in news, uh, they have raided the place where uh, they were selling rice for animal feed. So now one thing is when you use uh, such crops, for concentrate, the cost of production goes up of milk. But uh, if you have proper nutritious pasture cultivated, you don't have to do that. And then uh, when you now pasture is a crop, it, it is converted by the cow for our food. It is converted into milk and finally we consume it. So it's it's logical that we you know, treat it as a crop because it has to be grown as any other crop with uh, right agricultural practices, fertilizing, irrigation. So if we do that, we can very easily increase our production. 
we have a cow population of about 800000 out of that every year half of that about 55% of that is coming into milking so the main reason is uh, normally you have to get a calf every year but because of your nutrition they don't calf every year the calving interval is uh, you know very long and also you have to get uh, 300 days uh, milk in one calving but because of poor nutrition in about 180 days the cows go dry so that is we are not harvesting our full potential now even if we some might say that you know we can import cows but even if you import cow you have to feed them if you don't have proper feed here even from those animals you cannot get uh, you no know, uh, desired outcome so productivity is low because one main reason is nutrition so they then uh, that's why i am telling we have to have proper policy and also this as i said earlier uh, there has to be because of these poor farmers or small farmers there are so many things they cannot do on their own because of that you have to give them the necessary support organize support like you know uh, even feeding when they don't have uh, land to cultivate maybe we can uh, develop some entrepreneurs who will cultivate pasture and sell and also uh, one good thing is now there's a dry period but you don't have to you know store water to cultivate in the dry period when it comes to pasture because we can cultivate pasture during the wet season and preserve pasture so uh, there are so many areas where you get enough water during the rainy season so if you have enough land and uh, have some you know organized way of tackling it you can produce pasture and store it by way of silage or something and which can be in farmers are prepared because now we have a very good price for milk liter of milk can be sold by farmers around 105 rupees 110 rupees so that is a very good price and we are importing so much of milk powder so there's a ready market for most of the products you know the most difficult part is finding a market but milk there is a market but no milk and i know uh, all to the all the processors put together right now has processing capacity almost three times the production of the country and because of that all the processors are fighting each other uh, for the available milk so almost all the factories are running at low capacity so if we increase the milk production mm-hmm. we can one thing is uh, rural economy will get more uh, money then also we can save uh, for in next year yes um dr rajdure um you mentioned uh, the fact that the government does on uh, around 80 to 85% of the land mass in sri lanka and that may be a deterrent to productivity in the agricultural sector uh, but we see even when the uh, government uh, owned land is allocated reallocated for agriculture uh, for example in the case of plantations um we see that a lot of that land remains uncultivated or underutilized um what are the reasons for these inefficiencies and in what ways can we improve this uh, the, the productivity of such land uh, uncultivated land uh, in this story we heard i think it's a misconception and some myth there is no uncultivated land in the plantation sector if you just travel up to nuarelia you would see that every nook and corner and every available space is cultivated by workers and balances in economic crop like tea uh, so much so that sometimes they have very good rules you if you are a manager you go on leave and come on friday uh, mon- sunday evening when you come there's a brand new vegetable plot with uh, inserted beets so there is a severe demand for vegetable cultivation and uncultivated land when they say there are areas that by compulsion that by law we cannot touch like steep areas landslide reservations these are the ones that people say uncultivated land there is no 
cultivable land that is not cultivated. So that I must make it very clear. I think the foreigners were very smart. They cultivated every inch of the land and ensured that the maximum productivity was got. But we have estates where the old seedling tea is there, which is not economical. That is, uh, we make a point to convert those into valuable fuel wood generating land so that it can feed the dryers and then we can save the trees in the low country. Uh, and a lot of people are asking, uh, we had a ministerial meeting, they said, will you all give the land to the workers? We were totally in agreement with that, but the reality is that uh, people are not uh, willing to now come and work on the plantation sector because of so many issues. We understand that in the current 150-year-old archaic model, I don't think anybody likes to come and work as daily paid workers. So here is a crop. We have a tea crop, which is a very good crop. People earn a lot of money. They don't want to come and just do the simplest operation of picking because of so many other issues, dignity issues and other issues. So I don't think even if we give land to individual workers that they are going to do large-scale agriculture. They might uh, do uh, home gardening if the land is near the, their home or their house but not, uh, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the willingness and the commitment to do large-scale, uh, commercial-scale, like one hectare, two hectare agriculture. They don't have the capital in the first place. So uh, we, uh, the plantation sector, we are fully supportive of the government initiatives to promote food crops uh, for their consumption. Not only food, we have made use of all the water bodies. We have introduced fingerlings because tilapia is a nutritious uh, supplement uh, for uh, workers. So likewise, every available space now, particularly now under these conditions, we are utilized for growing of food crops, like yam crops, tuber crops. It's, it's already work in progress. Um, in the interest of time, um, I will ask the last question uh, from uh, Mr. Fernando. Um, Dr. Rajendra, in his presentation, said that it's a myth that you know this country has a water shortage. Uh, that this country does receive enough rain. Uh, but what, from what I understand, uh, one of the issues that the dairy industry is facing, especially given that a lot of the farmers do live in the dry zone, um, is a shortage of water, again, for uh, fodder and, you know, uh, pasture crops. Um, so is this a problem of irrigation, then, that we don't have uh, proper allocation of the water that we receive? Uh... I think uh, Mr. Rajadure explained it very well. We have enough water resources. What we have to do is to manage properly. If we manage properly, uh, I don't think there's a scarcity. And also, as I mentioned earlier, for pasture uh, and fodder, we can cultivate during the rainy season when there's you know excess water also, which is going down to the rivers, to the ocean. So we can cultivate and then conserve. So as far as livestock is concerned, I don't think uh, there is any water shortage as such. Uh, I think uh, if you manage the available water properly, uh, there won't be any problem. Just to add uh, to what he said, uh, our annual average rainfall is close to two thousand millimeters and we have four rainfall seasons covering the whole year. So I don't know how we can uh, think that we have water shortage. In fact, we have an excess uh, because 40% uh, is surface runoff that is also captured. Balance seeps into the ground as aquifers. So we don't have water problem. It's how we use it and distribute it. I showed you enough maps to uh, <laughs> demonstrate that uh, tanks, rivers, uh, you know, riverine system, water is plentiful in our country for agriculture. Uh, I think that's why it's important to have this kind of conversation so that we can dispel myths and um, initiate the necessary reforms. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rajaturi and Mr. Fernando, for joining us in this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Indrajit, Dr. Roshan, and Sudharaka. To commence our next discussion on unlocking urban land potential, I would like to invite Mr. Nayana Marvel Mother, President, Property Group, John Keels Holdings, to deliver the presentation. Screen next.
Okay, good afternoon everybody. Privileged to be here. Uh, just to get people a little uh, going, can I just take a poll please? How many of you live within Colombo municipal limits? Okay, must be a very affluent audience. How many of you live in your own house and how many live in an apartment? How, okay, how many live in an apartment? Very, very few. Okay, you'll see why I'm asking this question in a, in a second. Can we cue the presentation, please? It's in, okay. All right. Okay, so much like you know, the economy we've been talking about for the past uh, two days, our cities in Sri Lanka have also been the subject of kind of bad regulation for years and years and years. Uh, and the product we have now is uh, what we call urban development is really also a ticking time bomb, just like our economy. And I think unlocking the potential of our urban areas uh, really will require a complete reset in the way we think about urban development. So over the last, uh, so over the next, uh, over the next few, wait, excuse me, sorry, I think this is the wrong presentation. It's the draft. I'm sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, well, they get that fixed up. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why, actually, I asked that question of who lives in Colombo. Uh, I'll go through the slides in a little bit as soon as they, they get it together. Uh, but basically, what you have in Colombo uh, is a city where we have people who are very rich and people who are very poor. Uh, and the middle class basically lives outside of Colombo, by and large. Okay? Uh, and just like in other sectors, they talk about the missing middle. Uh, in housing uh, and in urban development, the middle is completely missing. And I think the amount of literature and the amount of study in what is happening to the middle in urban development is also completely missing. Right? So uh, my hope in this conversation is to, I, I think, really just start a little conversation about that, uh, about uh, really considering what's happening with the middle class because the, the conversion of urban development is really about focusing on this middle class. Are we okay with the slides? Sorry. Okay? Okay, two more minutes. I'll try to, I'll try to crack a joke, but I'm not very good jo at joking. Um, so the, the other thing that I will, oh, here we are. Okay, great. Brilliant. Okay, here we go. Okay, so as I said before, unlocking urban development uh, is, is one of those big pieces of things that we will have to do over the next few years. I am not advocating, to be very clear, that you can do this immediately. Uh, I realize full well that what we have to do right now is just get out of the gutter uh, in terms of the economy. But we do have to look longer term in terms of how we want to deal with our cities and really set that trajectory going. So there's four key characteristics of, of our urban, urban development, right? We have this unchecked sprawl, a settlement that's spreading everywhere. We've got extremely fragmented land holdings. We've got very, very low density, widely dispersed housing. And we have, as I mentioned before, a gentrifying city. So you have rich and poor, and the middle class are kind of out, and more and more the middle class are moving out. And that is the pattern that we see uh, with our cities. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an image of a study done by the World Bank. This is satellite night light data taken over the last 35 years. What you see in white is development that's been there over the last 35 years, uh, 35 uh, or so. The yellow is uh, 10 years after that. The red is what's happened really in the last 15 years. And you can see that it's unmistakable that we have a settlement that is sprawling and sprawling and sprawling. It also incidentally shows you where people actually live. Right? So regardless of what you see in plans and master plans and uh, national physical planning, national physical plans, this really shows you where people are. 
and it's very, very clear. Most of us live in the Western province, going down the Southern Belt, uh, a big agglomeration in, uh, in Jaffna, and the, Can and the Colombo one is really just spreading towards Kandy. That's really what is happening. And if you look at the census data over periods of time, again, you see this progression. It just kind of, it just kind of spreads like a cancer. Right? So we have urban development, or what we call urban development, spreading like a cancer, eating up, uh, eating up the country. Basically, that's what we have. Uh, this shows, again, the differences in population, or the growth rates in population, over a period, uh, over the last two census periods. Uh, the DSD data, we have it uh, fairly recently. We don't have Graham and Iladari devil data for the most recent census yet, but the trend is in unmistakable. You have migration coming out of the city. Right? So what you see in blue is population that is negative. Uh, what you see in the reds are populations that are uh, going uh, much more positive. Right? There'll be a small reversion, I think, between 11 uh, and 2020, as you can see in the map on the left, uh, because there are some high-density developments happening in the city. But by and large, the trend uh, is, is something else. Same thing on industry. We, talked, we will talk, I'm sure, in the next session about industrial parks. But we scatter industry everywhere. There is really no agglomeration that we can talk of. Uh, I'm not going to talk about industry, but this is also a major, major problem. I was really trying to uh, figure out, OK, is there a pattern here? And if you squint really hard, you'll see the roads. That's really the only pattern. Okay? So that's a problem that we are not really dealing with, uh, with that uh, very, very well. And it's interspersed with this sprawling residential. Uh, now, this is kind of an interesting slide. Uh, it shows where we are in multifamily housing as a percentage of the total amount of housing relative to other parts of the world. We're at about 10% 10, 10 condominiumized housing, 90% single-family residential. That's why I said I think this room is not representative, actually, of, of, of Colombo. Uh, the, the image on the right is also very revealing. Uh, what you see in green is one to two-story construction. Very, very low density, and it's spreading, uh, spreading like hell, really. Uh, and we're an outlier in the region, right? If you look at any other city in the region, multifamily housing is at least 50%. And it's, just, it's, it's an anomaly that we are at 10% in our capital city. It's, it's really quite strange. Well, it's not really strange. It's because we've had bad policy for years and years and years. That's what it is. Uh, and this is one of those policies that we encourage and we love this land subdivision, right? Uh, and you go anywhere in the city or anywhere in the Western, anywhere in the country for that matter, you'll see tons of advertisements for land subdivision. So we basically are carving up the Western province and most of our urban areas into 10 purchase or so a uh, plot. Uh, and then when it comes to trying to do efficient uh, scale development, you can't find the land. Not in the private domain. It's all carved up. And I can say that with some authority because I've been hunting for this land for the last five years. You just can't find it. So it's a major, major problem, fragmentation. And this is what it looks like, right? I mean, you can, you can take an aerial photo of every, any, any city in Sri Lanka, and this is what it's like. It's like a carpet. Right? So this is Colombo looking north, south, uh, east. And these are other cities. You have Kandy, you have Kurunagala. You take anywhere. It's like a rash. You have to deal with it. You have to have to deal with it. OK, so, so the bottom line with, with this kind of low density, fragmented, kind of 10 perch, 6 perch housing is it's a very, very inefficient way to use a very, very finite resource in this country. Right? Uh, you have to look at changing this dynamic and getting into a different model so that you can do it more densely and, and really create better quality of life. It's really also an extremely inefficient uh, way to develop and service. You can't make public utilities efficient if you've just got a carpet that's going for tens and tens of uh, tens and 20, 30, 40 miles, which is just two story. You just can't make it work, right? So you have to have to change this. There's no other choice. Now, the fundamental problem, one of the fundamental problems is, OK, so we live all over the place. But we still, if you, I'm just going to focus on the Western province for a second, we still have to come into the city. Why? 
all of our greatest schools, our jobs, uh, most of the entertainment, uh, most of the, the offices, everything is in the city, right? So you have this massive movement in and out of the city, and uh, the vast majority of you do the same thing, probably. Right? So we have two million trips crossing Colombo every day. Okay, this is pre-pandemic, and as soon as we get fuel, I'm sure we'll be back to it. Okay? Uh, so that's about 600,000 vehicles a day coming into Colombo. Okay? And that's kind of insane, really, when you think about it. So then the question is, okay, how do you bring this number of people? So let's just take the premise that, okay, it's fine. We have to live outside, but let's come in. And how do we deal with this? Then you need to really look at how do you bring people in. And if you look historically how we have invested in public transportation versus private transportation, it's, it's a bit sad. Okay, I mean, this, it's hard to find the data because we keep amalgamating ministries with kind of uh, crazy things. But if you just look at, say, 2020 uh, and uh, 2021, uh, you can see it's like, you know, five, six, seven times uh, the investment in roads versus public transportation. So we have chosen low-density housing, sprawling. We have chosen extremely inefficient single-car modes of transport to come in to the centers that we have created. Uh, so we, this, is, uh, this is a fundamental problem. So here's, here's the stats on that. Uh, again, from pre-pandemic, we have about... Uh, don't miss, this screen is not working. Uh, we have about, about roughly half of the passengers coming in come in uh, private transport. They take up like 87% of road space. Right? 87% of road space. It uh, doesn't seem quite fair. Uh, it's ridiculous. We have to change it. We have to change it. So we buy, we love buying cars, right? Every youngster in this uh, place probably wants to first buy a cell phone and then buy a car, right? We love cars, but we keep going slower and slower and slower every, every year, okay? Doesn't make any sense. So we have to reset. And we have a massive productivity loss because of this. This, again, was taken pre-pandemic. -pre Travel times at peak time from Google, from Google Maps. How long it takes to come into Colombo, right? So you're talking, on average, uh, three hours a day, back and forth, right? Uh, just think about how much time that is. Just stop and think about that. Three hours every day. That's about four, you know, three to four hour days a month that you are actually sitting in a car. Imagine if you do that for like 40 years of your life. That's like you sat four years in your car. Right? But this is what we do. And we rob children. Like by the time you, 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 you're a child, you go to school, you, by the time you get out of school, you spent a year in your car. Actually, a year of your childhood sitting in a car. It just is not right. Okay? So, so this low-density sprawl and private transport is toxic. It is disastrous for Sri Lanka, and it has changed absolutely has to change. Okay, so I'm not going to read all these things, but you, I think we talked about it a little, uh, but the, the list of impacts really just goes on and on and on. Okay, now, the interesting thing about this problem is you can't solve one without solving the other. You have to solve land use, but you can't solve land use without fixing transport. They're so inextricably linked. So you have to solve both together. That's the only way that you can actually solve this problem. So, as Einstein says, the world we have created is a product of our thinking. 30, 40 years of ridiculous urban policy that has to change. And if we change our thinking, I think we stand a chance. Okay? So there's millions of things that we will need to do, probably, but I just want to focus you on four, which I think at a high level are the fundamental shifts, the fundamental resets that we must do. And we have an opportunity to do it, uh, and we must do it in the next few years. Otherwise, this is going to be a massive drain uh, on our economy. Four things. Transition to mass transit. Stimulate transit-oriented development. 
densify housing and establish a single window for state land transactions. I'll explain this uh, a little bit uh, uh, in a second. But before that, let me just, just, because it's kind of alien to most people, I'll do a very, very simple uh, case study uh, just to illustrate what we mean here. This is Candy, my hometown. Uh, and it's the same pattern, OK? You have the, the population differences uh, between uh, the last two census periods. Blue city is emptying out. The core city is emptying out. Everybody's going to the burbs. Same thing. And you see this in every city in, in, in Sri Lanka. And you see this agglomeration in the red dots. Uh, that's where the buildings are. It's a little constrained in Kandy because of the topography, but the pattern is exactly the same. It's sprawling everywhere. And, you know, Kandy's unique, interesting, there's three corridors coming in, uh, and all these three corridors uh, are really quite overburdened. One coming from Katugastata, uh, one coming uh, from Piradenia, and the other one coming from the Kundasale around the lake. So all of these, if anybody has been to Kandy, uh, well, maybe not so recently, but before the pandemic, you'd realize why we have the worst air quality in the country. Okay? Uh, we have 55,000 vehicles coming into this place a day. It's a small city, right? And 30,000 of those are private cars. So, you know, it goes without saying. It's the same, same problem uh, that, that you have this kind of sprawl and, and, and congestion. But here's the, really, here's the really cool thing about Candy. The red line is the rail trace. Every single school in Candy, all the hospitals in Candy, most of the offices in Candy, right? Most of the social infrastructure in Candy, all the key government offices in Candy are within walking distance from the train line. Okay? And it's been that way for like, 50 years, right? But we have this line, which is grotesquely underutilized. This is the Candy Matale line, OK? So what can you do if you really do look at modernizing this train? It's a, it's a very simple thing to do, because the track is always there. It's just that there are no trains. I mean, I don't think you need an, even need to have fancy trains. You just need to have a train running on it. Like I was a kid. We used to walk along the rail line, because it was much faster than you know, walking on the road. OK. So if you do this, this is, uh, this is some mapping of the, of the land between uh, Katugastota going into Kandy. And you'll see large, uh, large swathes of land which, OK, maybe are not yet fragmented too badly. And you can deal with it. And you can use that as a stimulus to change. And one of the areas in, in the bottom here is an area called Mahayav. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, which is where this zone where you have tons and tons of car sales. So it's basically a gigantic parking lot. OK? That's what it is. It's actually a, literally a gigantic parking lot. But what if you go in here and change the game, change the zoning, allow high rises, eliminate some of the parking requirements, uh, and allow, you know, if you have this modernized, modernized uh, railway line, and you allow, say, 10, 15-story development, you can easily house 25, 30,000 people in Mahaya actually, and not add one car to the traffic, OK? Uh, so the, you know, this whole idea of, uh, of transit-oriented development is really trying to get density close to modes of transport that can move high volumes of people, OK? And then you need to figure out how do you simulate that. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Again, just a very, a very quick sketch. Uh, of some stuff we were planning some years ago about what happens if we do, just for example, uh, do, uh, do Mahayao. Now, one of those things that I, I forgot to mention is how do you make sure these guys actually do this? You've got to stop them from breaking this into 10 purchases or less. Okay? You've got to block that. And you've got to mandate that you know, to get these rights to develop at density at scale where you really can make some money uh, and make it really efficient you've got to have large parcels. And you've got to disincentivize and regulate that so that that parceling up really just has to stop. Similarly, there's tons of TOD, transit-oriented development opportunities, along, along the sadly canceled Colombo Light Rail Trace. There's 50 acres of state land around Fort Railway Station. OK. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got Velikada prison, we've got land in Rajagiriya, we've got land in Batramulla, 
okay? Gobs and gobs of land that really would unleash value in a phenomenal way if you really did this in a structured, systematic way. But to make it work, you have to have the transit also. These two go hand in glove, okay? These two go hand in glove. The same thing is true of the Kalani Valley rail line. This is the plotting of the Kalani Valley rail line. Uh, and if you look a little closer, you see the station points in yellow dots. If you look a little closer, uh, the pink ring is 500 meters from the station. The blue ring is 1,000 meters from the station. If you have regular good service, easily people will walk 500 meters to get to a train station. Uh, Dimanta and I were talking, the other panelist, and uh, he was saying the research now suggests it's actually 800 meters. So that, you know, you, you have uh, railway stations along the Kalani Valley line, which are, you know, between one and one and a half uh, kilometers apart. So basically, you're creating a zone along the entire Kalani Kali Valley line, basically, that, uh, that can basically be a pedestrian, mostly pedestrian, very, very low traffic uh, zone that feeds into mass transit. So this is, again, uh, something that could have, maybe still can, be done. So four resets. Reset number one is a transition to mass transit. We have to make this happen. Okay? It is the absolutely most critical fundamental step. It is the backbone of this entire system. Okay? Uh, you have to do it. So the, the ways to do it, though, is not to just introduce one line. You have to look at this as a system. You know, look at it like your blood circulation system, right? You've got to have rail linking high-density corridors that are existing. You've got to have rail that is going to uh, new rail that goes feeds uh, populations that are not covered by rail. So the Kalani Valley is an existing rail. The, the LRT is a new rail line because that corridor is the most heavily trafficked, the, the highest traffic is along that three thousand for a corridor. That is why the LRT uh, made sense. But you also have to deal with bus. And bus, uh, you know, there's a raging debate on this, but in principle, you know, while you have some bus routes which will probably still have to come into Colombo, by and large, bus should feed into rail, right? So it's like your capillaries reading into your big arteries or your, your big veins, you know, you just got to, it's a, it's a, it's, so you have to look at this as a system, and you've got to regulate this as a system, right? And you have to disincentivize private transport. And one way to do this, which is done in cities like London and Singapore, is to have congestion pricing. You pay if you enter the city with these gantries uh, at all to rent the city with a car. And it's incredibly successful. But you have to do that while providing an alternative to people. Okay, it's a bit politically unpopular. Uh, I see our legislators worried about it, but I don't think, I don't think uh, it's impossible, actually. Because if you've got a good alternative, you, have to, you can actually pull it off. Okay? Reset number two. Stimulate how transit-oriented development. Okay? Uh, basically, as I mentioned before, you're talking about zoning changes, right? Change the land use zones. Permit high density. And you have to eliminate this mandatory parking requirement. Our regulations are distorted. Uh, as uh, now, I, you know, I look at lots of feasibilities for new projects, and uh, you know, the, the regulation that's been recently issued is is one parking spot for every apartment unit in housing, and then one for every ten as visitor parking. Okay, uh, so that really ends up being about 25 percent of your build. Okay, so think about cost and think about how much a thousand square foot apartment, 350 square foot or so to, to park and turn a car. It uh, doesn't make sense. If you do a feasibility for an office development, which I've done recently, uh, about 30% of your building is parking, maybe a little bit more. So you, you kill it, uh, but you have to take that requirement out uh, and, and plug it in to mass transit. And that's what transit. Uh, oriented development is all about. 
the other thing is to prevent this fragmentation. And again, you have to do this through regulation. You can't shock people into saying, look, merge all the lands, but you've got to create incentives for people to amalgamate to extract value. Okay. Uh, so so you, you basically allow for development larger plot sizes, which forces you know, three, four people to get together and amalgamate those plots. So uh, you can commercially develop these more efficiently and as a result bring costs down. But one of the more important things that we have to do, because this fragmentation exists, is the government needs to strategically intervene and release some assets for transit-oriented development to lead the way, because the government still has unfragmented land, like the 50 acres around uh, Fort, I mean the section from Nelung Kuluna all the way to Lake House, that entire stretch is government land, that entire stretch. Okay, that's about as long as the Singapore River uh, development that you see in Singapore. Uh, so uh, I think really looking at this and saying, look, which lands do we develop? Which transit lines do we invest in first? And how do you develop the lands in tandem? The other thing that we can and should think about is how we deal with what we call air rights, the space above stations, above transit. A city, the city of Boston is mostly built on air rights. Most of the city of Boston sits on top of rail infrastructure, rail, uh, metro, and highway infrastructure. Okay? So we have to seriously look at air rights because when you look at air rights, basically we're talking build on top of stations. There's nothing preventing us except our parking regulation. Because you don't need parking if you build on top of, say, Fort Railway Station or Candy Railway Station. So we have to look at that very, very seriously. Okay. Preset number three, densify housing. Okay. You have to uh, look at land, land market interventions and, and zoning, as I talked about before. And uh, you know, some of it is in transit-oriented, but even in other areas, we do really seriously need to look at, uh, at densification. But we have to also reduce the cost of multifamily housing. Right now, it's painful uh, to develop multifamily housing. One, because of all the reasons of bad governance and regulations and rent-seeking and all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on. Uh, but you know, a couple of other things that are just kind of easy to kind of swap in a way. One is this parking regulation that I talked about. It's my pet peeve. Uh, I tell my consultants who work on projects that if you know anybody that has a PhD in how to drive, design the most efficient parking lot in the world, that's the guy you need in Sri Lanka to make a project economically viable with the new regulations. You also have to eliminate protectionism in construction materials. Uh, uh, construction, even uh, construction and materials. You have to eliminate it. You can buy, you know, we pay more in Sri Lanka for tiles, cement, uh, aluminum, uh, and stuff like this than we do in the world market, right? And that gets passed on to the, for, for, at the end of the day, it gets passed on to the consumer, right? Uh, so, so this is a major, major problem, and that gets sub supplemented by all these para-tariffs, which make, again, stuff really, really expensive. And you, you import a steel bar. Uh, I don't know if you can even do it anymore, to be honest. But by the time you get it to a site, it's about 100% more. Uh, and that cost gets passed on to consumers, which is why most people are priced out of the city. Okay, you have to look at uh, this, this uh, cost structure and help target in a targeted way uh, to bring middle-income housing costs down. You also have to streamline the approvals process. I won't get into it. It's complicated, but, and that maybe is the hardest thing, actually, to do. Uh, but you also need to look a little bit at housing finance and enhance uh, housing finance access. Again, I know it's something that we can't do right now because we're kind of in a bit of a mess. But generally speaking, you can't go and get a mortgage unless you prove to the bank that you don't need the money. Uh, so that has to change. Uh, again, targeting uh, the middle, middle. And I said before, you have to release some state lands. The state lands must be re released, not just like come the highest bidder, take it. It's, you've got to release it for a purpose. If you really think as a policy, you must have you know, 100,000 more middle-income housing units in the city, then let's release some land with that explicit purpose and let that be one of the evaluation criteria. And we've done this before, can be done. Uh, 
And, uh, but you have to release with purpose, not release just kind of like, here's a buffet, which one do you want? It's here's what we want to do, here's part of our larger plan, uh, and here's what we, what we can do to help that come in. And the last point is really kind of also really important. You have to target the middle class. Successive governments rush to rehouse the poor. Clean up the slums, put them in high rise. Everybody loves it. Why? Because you think it looks terrible. Right? But the reality is, in the city, that's probably some of the most efficient housing. I mean, these housing units are like one perch, one and a half perches max. Uh, whereas somebody sitting in a nice 20 perch block on a single family house could actually be having 20. That, right? So it, they're actually quite efficient. And there's a whole host of social uh, issues which I won't get into. So I think we have to resist this urge of, oh, we need to densify. Let's please just bulldoze all these poor people into these high rises and be done with it. That's really not what you need to do. You need to look at the middle class and you need to address the middle class problem. You have to do that. That's what you have to do. I'm going to shut up soon. Uh, reset number four. Uh, is, a, is a proper process for land release, a single window for land release transactions. Right now, uh, I don't think we really know how much land we actually have in Colombo from the government, or where it is, or who really owns it. There is no proper digital cadaster of who owns it. And if you want to find a piece of land, you don't know who to talk to. And if you find a piece of land and you say, okay, maybe this works, you don't know how to procure it. That has to be unlocked. And that's one of the problems along Beira Lake. It, it, that land belongs to maybe about six or seven agencies. Nobody can really release it. Uh, you need to have a single window process. I won't talk uh, ad nauseum about this, but there's an exceptionally good model in Singapore. They do this routinely that we can easily uh, model after. But again, from an investor perspective, just one point to come in where you can just have an above board, clean, transparent transaction, a predictable transaction, and you have all the information related to the land kind of done. You also need to look at structure of these land transactions. Okay, one of the reasons you have only luxury developments in the city, even on leased land, is because, you know, it's like 15 million bucks a perch. You pay it on day one. Your economics are shot the moment you buy the land. You can't invest in middle-income housing because you've buried all your cash in the land. You have to look at transaction structures which make middle-income housing viable. Okay? And that's something that you really, really need to look at. And of course, there are PPP structures that you can go after as well. But you have to have the capacity, you have to have a focal point uh, to do this with the intellectual and professional capacity to execute those transactions. Okay, so four resets, as I said. But if you do those four resets, you have a cascading range of positive outcomes, a whole bunch of economic uh, outcomes, not least of which is just releasing years of somebody's life to, be, to productive labor. Uh, but, you know, uh, better housing accessibility, uh, less reliance on fossil fuels. You know, the petrol queues we have are because of our addiction to, uh, to private transport, but it's really because of bad land use and transport. Okay? So you, you cure all these, kind of, uh, these, uh, these kinds of issues and the whole range. I won't, I won't get into all of them. Uh, but, you know, the positive outcomes are really quite cascading. So I'll end it with this. And I'll end it positively, uh, because I know most of you guys are probably kind of depressed right now after looking at the past bunch of presentations about how messy we are. You know, this thinking is not new. Most of these interventions that we talked about were actually being done, had been initiated, were funded, and under implementation. The LRT obviously is one. The Kalani Valley Rhine was under the Suburban Rail Project, which was funded by ADB. The MCC was looking at the bus modernization and an integrated uh, traffic control system. They were also looking at land cadastralization of the, of the government lands. Right? Uh, Candy Rail uh, upgrading was actually being studied by the railway department, again funded by ADB. Uh, but these things take time. 
Now, urban development is a long-term process. Cities evolve. They don't get built overnight. There are no quick fixes. So you have to have a decidedly long-term perspective and just stay at it. You have to have the commitment uh, to stick through reforms and to see these investments through, right? So to succeed in urban reform, and I think very much it is possible, but to succeed in it, you must have a reform and invest, an investment agenda that stays consistent through political cycles. And if we do that, I'm 100% confident we can get there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marvel Mader. I would now like to invite the rest of the panel. Joining us virtually is Dr. Dimanta De Silva, Senior Lecturer, University of Muratua, along with the moderator, Satya Karunaradna. Over to you, Satya. Thank you, Anuka, for that introduction. Thank you, Mr. Mavid Mada, for that very comprehensive presentation. Um, I'd like to kick off the panel with a very central point that you touched in your presentation, which is transit-oriented development. And I'd like to pose a question at Mr. Dimantha. Uh, Mr. Dimantha, transit-oriented development seems to be a rather unpopular concept in Sri Lanka for both policymakers and the general public. My question to you is, how do you think Sri Lanka should start thinking about this concept and start demystifying the of no, no. Yeah, uh, so I think uh, I would actually start with saying transit-oriented development is not a concept that uh, is, is actually is something that not implemented rather than uh, not unpopular. So the key to the requirement of a TOD is that you need to have a quality transport uh, network and also the supporting uh, land use zoning. So without being these two being fulfilled, I don't think you can expect TOT to be successful. Now let's see what are the requirements from transport side. Uh, you know, you are looking at, a, you need to have a quality, reliable, efficient transport system. Otherwise, you know, you won't get the TOD um, happening, right? Um, so we looked at this transit uh, uh, development or mass transit, such as suburban railway, the LRTs, or subways, or even the metros. And that is how we would use the location of the station to for densification, right? Um, what we use saw from the presentation from Nayana is, uh, and, and this is exactly why I like sharing the stage with Nayanan or even sharing the stage uh, the the uh, office with Nayanan because he actually you know gives you all the uh, uh, you know the background information you know you you, you could see that you need to f provide an end to end solution right because uh, you saw from his candy uh, so, uh, you know example you know the attractors are connected the schools officers uh, then the, these hospitals or all, all are attractors, but what was not connected was the homes or the starting point or the generation. So you need to uh, have a solution from end to end. A person, if you want to, uh, you know, use this transport oriented development, we need to have both the origin and the destination connected. And the connection is with this uh, mass transit systems. Okay. Uh, and uh, when you, you talked uh, and, you know, we are talked about, uh, uh, so this requires this network based solution. And we talked about the KV line and you talked about, Nina talked about the LRT. And I, I would say that you can't expect a solution just by one LRT or just by one KV line because, you know, you need to give end to end solution. So LRT and the KV line together would have covered a considerable amount of uh, you know, area uh, through uh, the, through these buffer areas that Nana talked about. So, uh, like you know, as I as I uh, like you know, it's about about 800 meters that a, pe a person would walk for a high mobility corridor. 
So usually it is about 400 meters uh, for a normal mode, but for a high mobility uh, corridor, which has it is more reliable, people are ready to uh, walk more distance, right? So uh, with the LRT and the KV line together, we could have covered uh, and the stations being close about one kilometer apart, we would have covered a, a whole buffer area along the corridor and also on the other side of that, right? So I think you could have, uh, you know, it's, it's very clear that, uh, you know, you can't uh, solve or fix the land, uh, the land use without, uh, uh, you know, transport, fixing the transport. And I think Nayana covered that brilliantly, right? So we, with the KV and LRT or even the, uh, you know, railway modernization, we have a huge opportunity to get this right. Okay. And, and also we need a push from uh, the the policies from uh, the land use side or the planning of land use because and this is basically improving the uh, having the zoning rules to actually dictate how these buffer areas areas are densified and develop as high high uh, development uh, high, high densified development and I think Naira can add more uh, on how the zoning rules can actually be uh, supported. Uh, to uh, for the transit oriented development thank you mr dimanta i'd like to pose an extension of that same question to you mr mabi mada how do you think sri lanka should implement transit oriented development do you think it's a process that should be phased out uh, absolutely phased out uh, i don't think you can force land use change overnight as i said cities evolve it's a long term process you, I think immediately you can do two things. One is you can start to change zoning regulations uh, uh, in certain areas to stimulate this higher density and take out these weird things like one-to-one -one parking uh, uh, that immediately give you, uh, give you a boost. Uh, but then you also need to look at these state lands that are not fragmented uh, and start looking at releasing those next to transit uh, as, a, as a first move. Uh, and then if you, if you do these things of liberalizing the, the regulations a little bit and restricting the fragmentation by uh, requiring larger minimum plot sizes, uh, then the market will basically take care of the rest. You really don't have to mess with it too much, right? Uh, I mean, you, you walk around people, Colombo, and people complain, oh, you know, my house is being broken down. They're building a high rise next to it. Unfortunately, that needs to happen. Uh, and you see that happening in Colombo because the economics just make sense. Uh, so if the economics make sense along these transit corridors, that will gradually happen. But the, tra the, the state plans offer an opportunity to, to, to fast track. Uh, and, you know, some would say, okay, do you have to invest in transit first and then do it? I would say, you know what? Do Colombo Fort first. You don't even need transit. You can walk to everywhere in Colombo from, from Fort Railway Station. Uh, and you've got 50 acres of land already. Uh, so you have to do it sequentially. Most of this the market can take care of. On the development side, uh, the transit, of course, the government will have to do. But you lead with commitment to transit uh, and kind of a psychological shift from I'm going to build more flyovers and do more roads to I'm going to put every spare bit I have into promoting mass transit. You have to make that kind of psychological shift. And then it's really really strategic ones for this high density. And then zone it and let the market care, take care of it. And the market can take care of it. And it takes care of it in many parts of the world. Thank you, Mr. Mabil Mada. I'd like to pivot to this whole idea of land value capture and pose a question to Mr. Dimantha. Uh, Mr. Dimantha, do you think land value capture should be incorporated into infrastructure assessment and do you think this happens in Sri Lanka? Uh, I think uh, uh, the land value capture is something that we don't really take into consideration in our assessments. So when it comes to a typical economic analysis that we do with, uh, you know, uh, our infrastructure development uh, with the feasibilities, our pre-feasibilities, uh, the typical, uh, you know, where we look at the economic uh, benefits and we look at uh, for a, a positive uh, benefit cost ratio or EIR are, you know, close to about 10%. Uh, to see whether it's viable, but this benefit calculation looks 
mainly on uh, on the travel time saving, travel cost saving, and uh, you know accident cost saving or environmental benefits, right? So, but we don't capture the benefit that comes out of the project to uh, increase in the land prices, right? So if you could see with the LRT, we saw that we saw the prices going up uh, during different stages, which when we, are in, we were having the initial discussions about the LRT, okay, one time it went up, second time, uh, you know, when the agreements were signed, it again went up, then when actually the work started, it went up again. So you could see this this change, the you know land value change is actually uh, you know connected with the, the 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 that project. So the the reason that the other benefits are kind of used is because it's quantifiable through the transport modeling process. But in in the one of the reasons that the land value capture is not considered in is because it's not quantified with the current process in Sri Lanka, which is not the case in other countries like, you know, where I'm staying right now in Calgary, uh, you know, every project looks at the benefits to the, you know, the price increase in the land and the benefits come, comes through the through the land use as well. So I think land value capture has to be considered in and that process, you know, we need to start looking at it because I think we are really underestimating the economic benefits uh, of each project. Thank you, Mr. Dimanta. A very short question to you, Mr. Mabil Mada. How do you think Sri Lanka can recover the costs of our infrastructure investments, in your opinion? Uh, I, I think land value capture is perhaps the key. Um, because in most countries, uh, transit systems are loss-making on a cash basis. Uh, but where you get the value is in this massive connectivity that you get and the, and the huge upswing uh, in, in the livability and the value of the lands around it. So you take Singapore, for example, uh, when they, they, of course, plan much better than us. So they, when they plan an LR, uh, a, a, a metro line, a few years before they announce anything, they go and acquire one kilometer, I think it was, I can't remember, it was 500 meters square, uh, meter radius, they acquire all the land. Then they build it, and they get huge upside because then they start systematically selling it, selling this land. And it's interesting the way they do it. They don't start by selling the land closest to the host station. They sell it from the outside in because by the time you get to the center, you've got pumping values. Uh, I, I don't think that will work that easily in Sri Lanka because as soon as you announce you're going to acquire uh, land around one kilometer or 500 meters around the station, you're going to politically kill the project. Uh, so there's other ways to do it. You do have uh, a massive upside in land value, that's very clear, uh, but you have, uh, you have ways to recover it through property taxation. Uh, that's one way. Uh, there's also ways to recover it through permitting costs. So if you are, say, for example, uh, 200 meters from a railway station and you want to do a development, you can have a much higher permitting cost for that. So the government recoups uh, part of this. So it's really, in the end, a blend. Uh, and there's, again, many examples around the world. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. They do it very, very well in Singapore. They do it very, very well in Hong Kong. Uh, they do it well in many countries. Uh, so there's no reason we can't do it. And there's plenty of case studies around the world uh, that we can follow. Thank you, Mr. Mabil Mada. I'd like to pivot to state land and private-public partnerships. Uh, Mr. Dimanta, do you think private-public partnerships are proven to be rather difficult in Sri Lanka? And what role do you think state land plays in this? Yeah, I think uh, the, what we have seen from past studies, uh, recent studies, that the PPP or the private-public partnership has, is difficult. And this is mainly because, uh, uh, like, you know, in in Sri Lankan context, it's uh, even though it's, it's economically feasible, uh, it, the financially feasible is is long term. So it takes forty to fifty years to kind of recover the the, the monetary cost. And uh, you know when you look it from uh, from a financial investor who's come who, who comes to invest a project, they would not 
wait until 40 50 years to get that return of investment so they are, they would be looking at about 20 to 25 years and this is mainly happening because our ticket price is so low now when you consider that the, you know the ticket price is low and we we because we have actually priced the ticket at for low income group right and this is partly because our we have a flaw in our taxation system where we are not able to uh, actually capture or identify uh, the tax bracket tax like you know the income levels of each person so we can actually uh, price the tickets uh, in a in a better way so i think you know that can partly solve the problem but also what we have to identify is like you know because of this what we call the gap right we see that there is a gap for an investor uh, and uh, we, the government has to provide gap financing. And what we have seen from uh, the railway projects or the LRT uh, uh, project that was for the red line that was looked at, we need about 40 to 45 percent of the, uh, the project cost to be provided as gap financing by the government. And this has to be provided either by funds, money, or it can be through land, right? So uh, the, now this is where the state land can, can come in, but you, you also have to keep in mind the, the, the whether we have enough land to do that as well. And to, so just to give you the numbers, like, you know, for example, uh, the one golf phase land area was about 10 acres and actually it was, uh, I think, about 125 million US dollars at that time. So this is heart in the Colombo, heart in Colombo. So when you are looking at about a project like the the red line, the PPPLRT that was looked at, we are we were looking at about a, uh, I think a two billion dollar uh, cost because it was a, a longer distance, about twenty four kilometers, but that that makes it about you know less than one billion to be uh, you know required through uh, through as as gap financing, so. We need to understand, okay, how, how much of land that we can provide as well. Now, as Naina kind of rightly said, I think our prime land is this fort area, the fort multimodal hub that was actually planned. And the air right is what we had to have to, have to use uh, to kind of identify how we can actually, uh, you know, use this state land. And with a purpose, as he said, because it's important that we don't allow unnecessary development. We want the development according to a plan where we what we want to, uh, you know, develop and that development to support the the transport infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Dimanta. Mr. Naina, in your presentation, you touched on a single window for land clearance and land transactions. And even under the MCC, I think we missed out on a digital inventory for all available land. Um, could you talk to us about why this becomes so important to Sri Lanka, given the context we're in at the moment? Uh, sure. Can I quickly respond to Dimanta? Because I disagree with Dimanta okay. uh, that PPPs are, PPPs are not possible. I think PPPs are possible. The problem we have to do a PPP right now is nobody trusts us, uh, so we need to kind of get out of this rut. Wherein the rest of it is about structure, right? So yes, you have on one side uh, you have um, huge land cap value capture opportunities, uh, and a lot of these can get structured uh, on on kind of an availability payment or availability guarantee structure. Uh, a lot of times you have uh, PPPs done where the land is given to the developer which is a bit of an inefficient way to do it because then the developer or the, the whoever is trying to do it starts thinking too much about the real estate, too little about uh, the, the transit. Uh, so ideally, if we have it together, you do these two separately and you, and you kind of merge this uh, at, the, at the center. So I, I think PPPs are clearly possible. There's a bit of complication in, in structuring it. But, you know, we've got folks out here that have done these kinds of PPPs before. It's not as bad as Sri Lankan Airlines, so I think we can, we can pull it off. Yeah? Um, sorry, your other question was something else. <laughs> I, got the question. Uh, I was talking about a single window for land clearance and land transactions. Yeah, and yeah. Just... yeah. so I think, I think single window for land transactions, again, I think it's a critical step. It's something that we can do relatively quickly, uh, and I think there are lots of global models to follow. So again, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. Just go to Singapore, look at what they do. 
they have a brilliantly transparent process where you know all the state lands that they plan to uh, release for the next five ten years is in a catalog i mean i can walk into uh, ura and get it and you know what's coming out next year and what the process is it's it, it it's not that complicated thank you mr mabu mada before we move on to the last round of questions given the time constraints i'd like to open the audience uh, open the floor for questions if there are any questions do indicate and we will provide you with a microphone any questions at all there is one question can okay thank you so much mr marvel mother for your presentation i also work in real estate development and apartment development and this is a topic really near and dear to me the thing i wanted to ask about was you said earlier uh, there's a lot of local tension when you develop an apartment building some of the neighbors dislike it all that but what i was wondering was what can a developer do to when they're going into new area they're looking at a project what can they do to get more local support for it to maybe educate against all of that contention uh i think there's no silver bullet answer it depends on the community and depends on who you're dealing with but i think uh it helps if the if the policy environment and the narrative around housing is much more around multifamily housing it, it it's not seen you know you have a conversation uh, about housing and any time you talk about uh you know high density housing people start saying oh, i don't want to live in a concrete jungle but as i showed in my presentation you know the the concrete jungle is what we live in now we've carved up the western province into 10 perch plots and taken out most of the trees taken out most of the wetlands that's the concrete jungle once you concentrate it uh, you open up a huge amount of space for open space and green space and i uh, so you will you will inevitably have this conflict uh, as as this transition happens and this is a conflict again that is not unique to sri lanka it happens in every city uh, and this is inevitable uh, so your government needs to help through that transition uh, and you will have some growth pains but you know it's you have to just do it i'd like to go to mr dimanta i think even when we spoke in preparation uh, for this discussion um you you said you've thought a lot about a broader approach to solve sri lanka's transportation problem could you walk us through your thought process yeah i think sorry we can't seem to hear you mr muted dimanta first. you might be on mute yeah i was being muted so i was trying to say okay uh, so i think we we talk a lot about uh, public transport needed right it it's it's true we need public transport but you know you, t- you need to think wherever like we are around uh, we are having about 52% with public transport right now but it's declining right so but still even with a very efficient public transport we will going to about 60 70% maybe it would be great to have it about 70% so still the 30% has to be provided by you know private vehicles now this is where we need to kind of have a balance right now so that is where we need to identify the mobility is not only by one mode like you know we we need to provide a broad concept is we we need to provide mobility through all the modes right you know by car or by taxi or by bicycle by bus by lrt by railway you know you need to have that mobility and the option should be allowed to the user we can't force a person to use it don't put you in the shoe and think about it because a, let's say a, a senior person who is who cannot actually walk uh, he has difficulties in walking his best mode of transport is not public transport his best mode of transport is private transport right so uh, maybe during the time right for example nay late in the night providing a mass transport is not efficient so a best mode of transport late in the night or early in the morning uh, for a doctor who's going for appointment for a, for his consultation or to look at his uh, patients is is his private vehicle right but so this is where you need to provide accessibility like you know all the mode access to the people but then we make the pri- public transport which we all know as the most efficient transport as the uh, as the most uh, you know attractive one 
we make it faster, we make, make it better connected, we provide it at a lower cost uh, than the private vehicles, and then we make it attractive. And then we make, we make that attractive mode, but also we make the push towards the, the public transport by the policies. Uh, such as that what Naina spoke about, uh, you know, uh, about, you know, congestion pricing, uh, higher parking fees. For example, the Calgary uh, now, where I live right now, has the third highest parking fees. So people are encouraged to use the public transport. Right. And also other things like, you know, government incentives for people to use public transport, such as, you know, giving a free monthly pass in, in, instead of the full allowances. So we make push towards the public transport. But we can't do that without the high quality public transport. So we, let's, we need to get the public transport. But that option of choosing which mode has to be provided, given to the user. And now when you talk about the public transport, the, the, what we have found today with the fuel issue and with people, you know, moving into uh, the trying to get into public transport for a reason, actually not because of, uh, you know, having a better quality public transport, but they have found that that we don't have capacity. And this is what we, you know, this is what we has been debated a lot. The bus service that is there is not able to carry the passengers if the or people from private vehicles, uh, you know, come into the public transport. So that is why we need our rail system to be the main mode of transport coming into the city. And whenever we can't have railway development, we can go with the LRT in the corridors that, you know, uh, you know, can, can be developed, right? And then the the bus actually has to change into uh, the change its role and it change its role into more feeder system and we have, uh, it, it actually provide connecting, get into the housing, get into the neighborhoods, collect the people and get into the railways and the LRTs so that people can be brought into the city in a much faster and much efficient way. And this is the, this is, this broader concept uh, has to be brought in. And if we can do that, actually we will successfully uh, transform our transportation system. Right. Uh, one more thing before I stop. I think I want to clarify what I said, uh, what, uh, you know, Naina said. Uh, I think I want to clarify. I didn't, I didn't, dis I didn't uh, say that we can't do with PPP. What I said, it's difficult to do with PPP. I didn't go into the details of why it was not, what is difficult. It was mainly because, you know, the, the PPP project that the LRT was looking at was actually expanded. You know, the railway lines was expanded beyond the uh, urban areas, making it not viable. Actually, if you actually make it, more compressed, it will be actually more more feasible as a PPP model, right? Thank you, Mr. Dimanta. Due to time constraints, I think we've come to the conclusion of this panel discussion. Thank you, Mr. Dimanta, and thank you, Mr. Naina, for joining in with us. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Thank you. And Satya. We will now break for tea and recommence our session with a fascinating look at private industrial zones at 5 p.m.
at the final tea break of the conference. This is Reform Now conference organized by Advocata Institute Sri Lanka under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. And coming into this uh, final tea break, we thought it's important to talk about the whole management behind it. And uh, it's important to talk to some team members to see how successful the conference has gone so far. And to do so, I have, let me introduce you, the guests I have, the team members of Advocata Institute. First of all, let me take the pleasure in introducing uh, Shairanthi uh, Durey Raj, Research Assistant at Advocata Institute. Hi, Shairanthi. Hi, Anki. Uh, hi, Ashi. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And uh, next, let me take the pleasure in introducing uh, the policy analyst at Advocata Institute, K.D. Vimanga. Hi, Vimanga. Hi. Hi. So good to have you all at the live streaming studio. <coughs> and I would like to start the conversation with Vimanga. Now, one milestone of Advocata Institute, and it's a significant moment in the journey of Advocata Institute in launching the SOE web platform and also you all launched the report, the state of the state owned enterprises in Sri Lanka 2022 and also the report on SOE governance and compliance um, plans. So I would like to ask you, you were a main person behind the whole research project. How did this all start and what is your point of view after launching the whole web platform? Uh Thank you. I think it's a very interesting question as well because it's been, uh, I would say, two long years of work. Oh, okay. uh, and also, to be honest, uh, as, as probably you, uh, my colleagues might have spoken before, SOEs and the state of state-owned enterprises is Advocata's flagship project. Uh, they've been doing it since 2016. And it, it is basically one of those foundation pillars uh, where we do a lot of intervention, policy intervention on. Mm -hmm. So this particular report for 2022 has been uh, on the table since 2019. Okay. Uh, that 2018 was when the last report was uh, completed. And then we took about two, two years to complete this. Uh, and there has been a whole team behind it. Uh, I think the most important uh, individuals uh, have been the internal research team. Uh, probably you might have seen my colleague Anuka uh, and uh, the co-host yesterday, Adita, uh, so they were one of those foundation pillars uh, who were involved in the project. Then we had uh, a whole series of interns throughout the two years uh, who did a lot of work in terms of preparing content uh, for the platform, for the report, and getting things going. But in terms of really coming up with analysis, uh, with coming up with, uh, you know, the, the value addition on this project, uh, I think that came with uh, a series of expert uh, opinion, expert individuals. So uh, we had uh, Ravi Saratna Sabapati as uh, the main consultant of the project. Uh, then we had Rehana Taufik as the co-consultant. Mm -hmm. And then we had a panel of experts uh, who was led by Professor Rohan Samarajiva, Dr. Roshan Pereira, uh, and uh, former Treasury Secretary, uh, Dr. Samarathunga. So there was a, there was a panel of eight uh, experts right. who basically provided mentoring mm -hmm. uh, on the project. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, we developed a scorecard. So this particular scorecard actually went through numerous process of verification with the expert mm -hmm. committee. Uh, and, and then it came, then it was released yesterday. So now we actually can rank state-owned enterprises uh, from a perspective of governance mm -hmm. as, al as also from financial performance. So right. I would say there was a whole team behind it, yeah. uh, and it was all, all I would say a two-year uh, long effort throughout. Yeah, um, as you were a prominent team member in the whole uh, project research, I would like to ask you: How do you feel now? Now you have launched this web platform, and this is Sri Lanka's first and only web platform where you can get all have access to all information about uh, state-owned enterprises. Because uh, one main issue, one main reason for this whole thing to come up is because there is no, there's lack of accessibility to information of SOEs all these years. And we heard yesterday uh, through the conversations as well that uh, SOEs haven't really provided their reports over the recent years. And this is a huge gap that we need to fill in. But right now there's a platform and you have been a member in the team. What do you feel as a person? Uh, individually, it's an absolute pleasure to have uh, been part of this course. Uh, I think it's also a very relevant course considering the current uh, economic dynamics of the country. Yeah. I think uh, the kind of crisis requires 
hard reforms and SOEs is one of those areas that we should fundamentally reform. Mm -hmm. And it's personally, it's an absolute pleasure to have, uh, you know, been part of the team uh, that came up with the platform. Mm -hmm. And also it was an absolute pleasure working with the team members, the core uh, Advocata research team mm -hmm. uh, who worked a lot on the project. So it was, it was also inspirational and motivating, uh, to be honest. Uh, and also a sense of, as I said, a sense of responsibility, a sense of uh, calling, I would say, yeah. uh, to contribute uh, to the current economy and the current uh, situation in the country. Yeah, I think that is a lot of responsibility coming into the team. And I wish uh, congratulations on this milestone and all the very best in uh, taking it and on the sustainability plan of it as well. Thank you. And now from that, I would like to come in to talk about this conference, Reform Now Conference under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. And I would like to ask Shairanti the question, how has it all been now? We are at the latter part of the, the day two and we are almost, we have only one more session to end the whole conference. What is your thinking um, to start with? Um, the thinking starts with the, the way, the journey that we've come through. Mm -hmm. It uh, was not just one idea, it was several areas, several massive areas that we were covering. And the fact that we've been able to touch on everything and the way we have been the depth of every session that we've had and also the journey of making this information from ourselves mm -hmm. to everyone else was a complete bliss, I would say. It's not just a sense of, uh, um, it's not just, uh, it, it, would, it would be an appreciation mm -hmm. for everyone uh, who have been part of it, uh, but also the fact that we've carried out further, it makes us happy uh, mm -hmm. that, that we've put the information out there. We've put the information not just to the policymakers, but yeah. also to the people out there exactly. so that they can know what kind of reforms that Sri Lanka needs at this point to come out of this extreme chaos at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah, I think uh, throughout the live stream also we've been highlighting that we shouldn't really blame the authorities or are only a part of the society for taking control of the whole situation. But as the citizens of Sri Lanka, we all should take the responsibility individually and uh, put everything into action to go forward and to reset Sri Lanka. Um, I would like to ask you, Sharananti, what was the initial thought behind or what really inspired Advocata Institute to come up with this conference and to bring in all these uh, policymakers, uh, think tanks, to one conference? Uh, so it probably started quite longer than you can think. It's not just because of the economic crisis. Right. It didn't just start this year. We've been, we've been talking about what could happen in future. Advocata has been communicating it yeah. since 2019, 2020, telling what could happen. And seeing that whatever we were telling was happening mm -hmm. along the way, mm -hmm. we, we knew and we kept on informing that such a thing could happen. And when it did, we knew that we had to take forward the things that had to be done to come out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was not just suddenly planned. It was uh, planned for, it has been in our minds. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we have to not just stop with like discussions with mm -hmm. specialists, but also to take it forward to the people and communicate it was uh, such a main factor and main point that we were keeping in mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the reasons why... It, it started from that point that we wanted to bring it forward and uh, get it across. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the whole management in the little bit of time that we have right now during the tea break. Because um, just to highlight and let you know, you might only see the live stream right here. But it's so many uh, functions happening in so many rooms coming together just for you. But uh, to highlight on that as well, let's talk a little bit about the management and the functioning behind the whole conference, uh, the different functions. If you can just highlight a little bit. Uh, the, <laughs> the team, I would say, is basically like a peppercorn, <laughs> where it would be, even though it's small, it's extremely spicy uh, because uh, we have only like four people, uh, four to five people in the communications team right. and like uh, eight to ten people in the research team and we've pulled off two uh, two days of two days of a conference with extremely in-depth conversations in several areas makes it it would make anyone wonder because uh, how can a such a team pull off this yeah. it's yeah. basically a team not just the number it's yeah. about the quality because yeah. uh, it was a team full of people with just pure passion to change the country for themselves yeah. with a lot of hope, with a lot of passion towards what they do. Yeah. 
that's one of the reasons we've been uh, we've been able to pull it th- pull this off mm. it's a uh, lot of sleepless nights but no one complained people just wanted to do this better mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. people didn't find excuses to just get out of it people wanted to give 100% and the team had been completely impressive and uh, the people who are here the people who have been watching online yeah. have been uh, should probably would be thinking it's like a group of like I don't know 50 but it's not it's less yeah. than half of it <laughs> uh completely pulling it off from the research the content side and also the communication side on yeah. how what we are saying and how we are saying it were both delivered well with a small team I would say yeah I think when it comes to the conference uh, day 1 and day 2 it's a lot of work with the productions as well because like I mentioned before um there's a main session going in one hall and here we are at the live streaming studio and there's another studio for podcast which you will witness soon on Advocata Institute uh, YouTube channel because Advocata Institute is all about giving you the best so that you also can get involved in resetting Sri Lanka and you can watch all of these with an open mind to go forward and I would like to ask uh, Vimanga also about the conference in whole what is what do you think about the whole management of the uh, conference and do you think there's something that uh, y'all can improve for next time Yeah I think there's always space for improvement uh, regardless of what you what you do and what you strive to achieve um I think the concept of reform is going to be uh something that we will take forward uh mm-hmm. in the coming years mm-hmm. uh and probably there will be repetitive conferences of this nature mm-hmm. i think in terms of management i believe what we really want to do is for the build our research potential our capacity to come up with a uh, novel content mm-hmm. uh make sure that it's relevant with the the with the economic and policy dimension of the country so i think that's going to be a key priority area that we will work on mm-hmm. uh in terms of general conference organization i think we will work uh you know we will try to expand it uh to other cross sections of society make it make it accessible uh in all three languages probably uh i think those are improvements that we would want to bring in uh next time uh but again i think advocat is growing uh we're going we're also growing as a policy family as a policy community yeah. uh and those are the kind of bridges that we also bring on to bring in uh mm. to the next conference mm. and to the work that we uh take forward amazing uh, i would like to ask try on the one more question that is uh, how are we really going to sustain this topic these discussions because it's important now we've had a successful conference we're still having we are yet to go to the final session of the conference um i would like to ask you how it really going to sustain how what is the plan of advocata institute going forward like we manga had mentioned it's it doesn't stop with the conference mm-hmm. it has to be taken forward uh the one of the reasons we had not just uh, not just the people to view also the people who are making the policies mm-hmm. um why is because it should uh it should be taken up with the policy makers only if we tell them right mm-hmm. so we brought them down also in this conference and we communicated the hard hitting truth about mm-hmm. what uh the economic crisis is about and what we need to do about it mm-hmm. and this should be taken as much as it's taken forward by the policy ma- policy makers mm-hmm. we would continue to communicate people what's happening on their side mm-hmm. and also what should be done and reiterate the fact again and again mm-hmm. with a better view like find every possible ways to communicate Definitely. not just conference but through every possible media to communicate it to the people on what should be done and how should it be done the things that we've discussed in the conference to further further more conversations in that same in those areas yeah. will be done for future forever <laughs> yeah thank you so much on that and before we move forward with the may session i would like to give you a sum up on day 2 now we started the day 2 with a session on debt crisis structural adjustment and trade policy and then we moved forward to a presentation a context setting a presentation on labor market which was followed by a labor market reforms for more inclusive growth panel discussion and thereafter soon after the tea break we had a main session on termination versus resuscitation which was a yet another successful uh, program and soon after lunch we moved forward to talk about the current la- land utilization so there was a presentation by on unlocking land for development which was followed by a panel discussion for agricultural land reforms and uh, there onwards we moved forward just before 
the tea break you all witnessed the program on unlocking urban potential now soon after the tea break next up we are getting ready to move into the main session which is the final session of the whole conference of reform now um, Let's Reset Sri Lanka, organized by Advocata Institute. That is, the forum will be on the case for private industrial zones, lessons from the Dominican Republic. So I'm sure this is also an important session because uh, we started from yesterday to talk about and listen to stories of other countries and they, they have set us an example. But I'm sure we've not, we are not really in the same level of economic crisis when we are going towards it. But it's important to know how different different countries, different governments have overcome their uh, struggles and overcome the economic crisis. So as Sri Lanka, I think we all need to get together. We keep reiterating that this fact that we as citizens of the country should get together and be responsible and take things forward, put things into action. I know it's a little painful sometimes, but it's with hope. We're hoping for the best, so it's okay to go through certain things. It's the adaptability. We're adapting to situation for a better future for us and the future uh, generations as well. And now I would like to take a message from both of you. I would la start with uh, Vimanga. What, what do you have to say on behalf of uh, Advocata Institute to the public who are watching us right now? I think the message is simply uh, that the policy landscape in Sri Lanka needs to change, especially with the current crisis that we are in. I think that and, and the public as a whole must understand that the, the next six months, probably the next year is going to be fundamentally tough. That is also because we have not made those adjustments, those changes uh, for a very long time. Uh, and this is our chance to make those changes, to make those structural adjustments That's right. and make sure that you fundamentally put the whole country in on track. And probably this is our own. And as a policy analyst from a, and also as a responsible citizen, my message is simply use this crisis to come out of it. And which our basic theme is either our choice is either we can become a tiger economy or we can become a failed state. Mm. And this is our only chance to decide and implement and become a tiger economy. I think if we lose this opportunity, uh, we are probably being irresponsible and putting our future nations and their future in this country at risk. Thank you so much, uh, Vimang. Uh, Shairanti, I would like to take a message from you as well on behalf of Advocata. Yes, uh, I would probably like to quote my, uh, my chairman of Advocata who said, uh, the hour before dawn is always the darkest. Yeah. So yes, we are all in the darkest moment of our life. We are struggling for even our day-to-day -day needs. But at the time, even at this time, we need to remember that the country is at stake mm -hmm. and it's us who can bring it out of it. Mm -hmm. It uh, has to start with us. At this point, individually, everyone watching should uh, work, put out, put, out, uh, these, put out these reforms in their own voice to everyone and carry it forward and become the tiger economy like Vimanga just mentioned. Mm -hmm. That's from, my, that's from my side. Thank you so much uh, for joining the live streaming discussion, Vimanga and Shairanti. And I think it's important to mention the sponsors uh, also for one last time. That is, I would like to thank all the sponsors who have made this event a success because without them, this event wouldn't have been in this level. So thank you so much to all the sponsors. Let me remind them, as a platinum sponsor, we have Cal. And as a gold sponsor, we have Expo Lanka. As the silver sponsors, we have M2M Veranda Services, John Keels Group, and John Keels Properties. And as event partners, we have FNF, Jetwing Hotels, and Atlas Network. And also, let me remind you, the partners who joined with us for live streaming platforms, and you might be watching us right now from any of these platforms, that is SL Vlog, Politics.LK, Sri Lanka Students for Liberty, The Morning, The Sunday Morning, Daily FT, Other, Economy and Business Sri Lanka, businessnews.lk and via citizen as well. So thank you so much to all these partners for joining to get the message across. I think it's all about that. Getting the right information out and spreading awareness. And um, later on, uh, if you missed any part of this conference and even if you watch the whole conference there's more content that's coming to you through Advocata. I need to remind you about their social media platforms as well because just like both of them said it, this discussion does not stop from the conference. It will go on and on and they're already ready with the content that's going to come up. So like I said 
there was a podcast uh, studio happening and a lot of podcast sessions were taking place with the policymakers, business community. And it's important that you get involved in these discussions as well. So for you to get involved in these discussions and to share your point of view, you may follow Advocata Institute in all their social media platforms. Let me remind you, they are on Facebook under three arms. That is Advocata Institute, Advocata Plus and Advocata Kural. And they're on LinkedIn as Advocata Institute. They're on Twitter as Advocata Institute and Advocata Plus. And they're on YouTube, Advocata Institute, and as Advocata Plus. They're also on TikTok as Advocata LK and Advocata Plus. And on Instagram, you can follow them on Advocata LK. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are ready to go into the final session of the conference. That is a case for private industrial zones. Lessons from the Dominican Republic. With that, the whole conference will come into conclusion. Thank you, Shairanti. Thank you, Wimanga, for joining with the live stream uh, chat for the last chat of the live stream. Thank you so much for everyone for joining and be ready for our next session. That is, we are now going into the main hall. Thank you so much for joining. commence the final presentation and discussion for today. Uh, to start off the presentation on lessons from the Dominican Republic on private industrial zones, we have Mr. Juan Jimenez. Mr. Jimenez is an economist from the Dominican Republic and the managing partner of the consulting firm Apricus Consulting Group, and he will be joining us virtually. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you today and warm regards from the Dominican Republic. I will share my screen to present the case for private industrial zones in the Dominican Republic. I hope that everyone can see the presentation. So for today, um, I shall present to you first some general information about the Dominican Republic, and then see the past and present of free trade zones in the country, and then a case study of an industrial park. So talking about the Dominican Republic, um, our country numbers, we are um, two thirds of an island in the Caribbean, uh, very close to the United States. So um, our population is um, 10.4 million uh, people. Uh, pre-COVID, with a GDP per capita of uh, $8,500. Um, that's not PPP, that's current dollars. Uh, we've had an average growth rate of the GDP per capita of almost 11% for the last um, 
almost 30 years. Uh, we are a very open economy. Our imports plus exports would be 51% of the GDP. And we are a service economy. More than almost two thirds of the GDP comes from services, but a third would come from both industry and agriculture. We're a very stable country with a um, lot of political stability, no terrorism, very little violence. We would be fifth in Latin America. And we are the country with the highest GDP per capita growth and uh, GDP growth for the last um, six years. So it's not only that we have a very good average for the last 30 years, but also in recent uh, years, you can see that we have a higher GDP per capita than Panama, for example, that it's a very uh, dynamic country in the region. We've had uh, a change in the country. In the 70s and 80s, we had a, an economy that would be very dependent on import substitution strategy uh, and agricultural exports. So that was the description of the country for the 70s and the 80s. Of course, in the 80s, we had the debt crisis that happened in almost all Latin American countries. So in the beginning of the 90s, we took advantage of the crisis. It was very tough. Uh, we even had a double-digit inflation, negative GDP growth in 1990. So we took advantage of that crisis to promote certain structural reforms that ended up being very successful. And we adopted a, an export promotion strategy, both in services, tourism, and in goods would, would be um, the free trade zones. And since that, since those uh, reforms, we've had very high economic growth with uh, price stability, and uh, we've seen a reduction in poverty and an improvement in almost all social indicators. Our export basket has changed. You can see that since 1990s, we've grown a lot in the services, not so much in agriculture. Um, you can see the yellow here in here. But it's interesting to see that um, if you see the, the, the blue ones, those are electrical equipment and medical devices. So we've developed a very diversified export basket um, since we had those reforms in the 90s. So prior to the 90s, we would have uh, almost 70% of our exports would be agriculture. And now most of our exports come from services because of tourism and uh, from the free trade zones regime. This is our product space. I don't know if you're familiar with this um, visualization. So what you can see is how our export basket has been changing. If you see here, the, the uh, green ones, these are the uh, garment industry. The yellow would be agricultural exports. And the blue ones that you would see in the left um, appearing, those would be both electrical equipment and medical devices. So let's see how we've changed. That was the product space in 1995. Uh, you can see that we've developed these two big um, circles that are blue in here, that are electrical equipment and, no, all right. So that should be not 1995, but 2012. And this is the most recent one. Um, and you can see that many, many colors. So we've developed the chemical um, industry, which is the purple in here. We've developed the medical devices. We'll talk about that later. Um, so free trade zones, uh, we have in the country 79 um, industrial parks, uh, world-class service and infrastructure. We have public parks, private parks, mixed administration. Um, and in, in these parks, we've, we've received many uh, awards, such as Best Free Trade Zone in the Caribbean, in Latin America. So this has been a very successful concept that we've, uh, we have developed here. So right now, most of our companies are established in, in private parks. Um, so you can see in here that 50.1% of all the companies 
that are located in the free trade zone regime are in uh, private parks. Then we would have public parks, uh, only 15.7%, 11.4% in mixed, and special zones, uh, almost a quarter. And we have special zones for services and for certain agricultural exports. But as you can see um, down here, most of the parks are private. So this is a very private sector industry that, um, that we have. We have industrial parks almost everywhere in the country. That is a map of the Dominican Republic. And where you see uh, these dark blue, those are the provinces in which we have uh, industrial parks. And only in certain parts of the country that are at, uh, near the border with Haiti, we don't have parks. Uh, the reason being that they are not connected to a very good port. And that's, uh, that's why it's not very feasible to have industrial parks because most of the companies that are in these free trade zones, they are exporting companies. So they are part of a global value chain in which we import uh, inputs mostly from the United States. And then we process those in, uh, inputs, and we send parts of a, um, let's say, a medical device and electrical equipment. As you can see, uh, this is a sector that has been growing quite a lot throughout the years. So in the 90s, uh, we had a very, very high growth, mostly garments. Uh, then at the beginning of the 2000, uh, we had a decline because we lost uh, competitiveness relative to Asian countries. And then since 2009, these new sectors, mainly medical devices and electrical components, they've uh, grown quite a lot. And that has, let's say, um, given a new life to the sector. As you can see, um, 10 years ago, we had 48 parks. Uh, right now, we have 79 parks, which is a growth of almost 50%. So this has been a very dynamic sector in recent years. In companies, we've seen quite a high increase from 555 companies to 734 in 2021. And we have a almost 200,000 people working uh, directly in the sector. Uh, with accumulated investment of almost $6 billion. Right now, uh, we have more than $7 billion in export. That would be second most important export after gold. Um, again, 79 parks and 734 companies um, last year. In terms of what we export, so we are currently exporting to more than 129 countries um, and 1,744 products. Um, this is pre-COVID at the beginning of 2020. So most of our exports, 27% uh, are medical equipment. After that, we have electronic apparel, 16%, tobacco, very important. Um, handmade tobacco, 17%. Uh, and then garment is only 12% because this is a sector in which we've been losing competitiveness, as I mentioned before. Most of uh, important brands in almost every industry are located in the Dominican Republic. You have uh, electrical equipment, let's say General uh, Electric. Uh, we have Baxter Brown, um, Ecolab in medical devices. Uh, in garments, we have Haynes, Johnson & Johnson. In tobacco, we have Davidoff. In footwear, we have Adidas, Timberland. Just to give you certain examples of very, very famous brands that are located in the country. We've positioned ourselves uh, very uh, respectfully in the field. We are first global exporter of hand-rolled cigars. We are first exported to the United States of uh, electrical switches. We've, we are fourth exporter, uh, Latin American exporter of medical devices to the United States. Third world exporter, uh, Latin American exporter of footwear. 
second exporter of women's wool coats to the United States, second um, Latin America exporter of um, aromatic candles. Talking about medical devices, which is a sector that has developed um, for the last uh, 13 years. Uh, so w five of the, of the world top medical devices manufacturer are located in the Dominican Republic. Our products include ostomy appliances, surgical drapes, electromedical instruments. Um, so not only um, garments, for the medical device sector, but also certain instruments that they use. Within the free trade zones, right now we are developing a subsector uh, for services. Um, as you can see in here, we have a very successful call center and uh, business professional operators in the country. Uh, in the services, call centers and BPOs are 50%. Logistic services, that's something that we are investing quite a lot recently. We want to be a hub in the Caribbean. And those would be the two most important ones, um, technology, industrial services, and other services with um, smaller share. In call center and VPO, uh, we have uh, taken advantage of the Dominican diaspora. Uh, we have many Dominicans living in the United States, um, I would say about a million Dominicans in the United States. Some, some of them uh, have seen the growth and success of the call center and VPO sector. Um, they pick reasonably well. And that's why since they can speak English, they, uh, they have relocated in, in the Dominican Republic because they can have a good job here. In terms of what has been the, um, let's say, key advantages uh, of the Dominican Republic um, for foreign companies to establish here. So we have very, very generous tax exemptions. I'll talk about that later. We have excellent infrastructure because they are private provided. So within the industrial park, the... Um, the operator of the industrial park, they have to invest in very good infrastructure um, so they don't rely on government funds to invest in that infrastructure. Um, so it's a real estate business. We have preferential access to both the United States and the European Union markets. Uh, that helps a lot. Uh, proximity to the United States, we are taking advantage in recent years of the, um, of the market share that um, needs a very, very rapid response because of um, e-commerce. So we are the country that is, um, with Mexico, the closest to the United States. So just-in-time industry um, has given us certain advantage because we can um, produce in a day, um, and that would be in the United States um, in less than three days. So that that coincides with the time that um, uh, most e-commerce platforms use. Uh, we have very legal, um, we are a very legally stable country, so we, we haven't changed the legal regime for the free trade zone in, in 30 years. And uh, very important, we have a very good public-private dialogue in which the government quickly respond to private sector needs, let's say permits, um, lobby in the United States. So uh, that helps a lot. I'll talk about that later. So in terms of tax exemptions, we have a 100% exemption of income tax, value added tax, um, tariff, certain um, selective taxes such as insurance, fuel, uh, assets, patrimony. So once firms uh, located here, they have 100% uh, tax exemption for 15 years in which we cannot change that. Um, but most of the time, we, we just, um, after the 15 years, we renew the tax exemption. But for 15 years, even if we change the legislation, um, we have to respect those um, years uh, for which the company have these um, tax exemptions. 
the institutional framework, uh, there is a public private committee, which is the uh, supervisor and regulator of the of the sector. Um, so we have the council for uh, free trade zones, uh, which is in charge of appro approving new parks, establishing firms on the, the free trade zone regime, including the tax exemption. Uh, it's a coordination body of the government, so it also coordinates government response to uh, private sector needs, and it also coordinates promotion of the country in international forums. So um, let's say that this committee is the one that um, responds to uh, investment in which there is economies of scale. It has five members of the public sector, Minister of Finance, Minister of Industry, and also five members from the private sector. So in the industrial parks, uh, as I said before, this is a real estate business. Um, so they invest in all the basic infrastructure within the industrial park. Uh, they also give services to the firms, such as uh, payroll services, um, administrative services. So firms locate in the park, and it's kind of a cost unit for multinationals. FDA promotion. So the government, through the National Free Trade Zones Council, they promote the country in specialized furs, magazines, articles, but the country, not an industrial park in particular. And through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, we contact firms in different countries to promote the country for foreign direct investment. But then industrial parks, there is a very big competition within the industrial parks and they compete for big companies. So once we get, let's say, an important con company to come to the country and um, consider the Dominican Republic for um, investment, then we bring the executives to the country and the industrial parks arrange their visits and their offer and negotiation. Uh, foreigners living in the country, of course, we have hiring limits. Um, companies can only hire 20% of their payroll, uh, foreigners, but most of the employees in the free trade zones are Dominicans. I would say 97% of employees, including in managing positions, they're Dominicans. Uh, companies can get work permit for their employees. Let's say they want to bring a CEO from their um, their home country. Um, they get the, the permits usually 60 to 90 days. And once uh, they get the permit, they get the visa and they can stay for as long as needed. No limits to exchange rate conversion, money repatriation, travel, so on and so forth. Spillovers to local companies. Um, so we have many Dominican companies managing the industrial parks. So most of the industrial parks are owned by Dominicans, but most of the firms, um, especially most of industrial firms, are multinationals. We have Dominican firms only in services and agricultural sector. Spillover, uh, we have some local companies that give uh, services to the companies located in the free trade zones. In terms of su supply, we have to admit that most of their inputs are imported. So we have very limited backward linkages because multinationals are part so they are a very large value chain in which the, um, let's say, the headquarter in the United States, so they negotiate the, the suppliers of the different um, subsidiaries that they have in different countries. So uh, in here, they only do certain parts of the process, of the industrial process, and then they export that to the United States or other countries for another um, value added. Uh, such as finishing um, services, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's why there's very limited backward linkages. Uh, we also have very limited entrepreneurship, very few employees from 
the uh, these firms end up establishing their own firm. This is different, let's say, to Guatemala. In Guatemala, um, many foreign companies abandon Guatemala because they changed the legislation. So in the garment sector, uh, they develop many local firms um, to supply the previous employer, but that hasn't happened in the Dominican Republic because multinationals um, stay here, except for the garment, uh, for the loss in competitiveness that we had in the beginning of the century. So I would finish with a case study of a new industrial park. My firm did the pre-feasibility study for the most, uh, let's say the biggest industrial park that is being um, about to be developed. Um, and I think this is important because this can give you certain information about um, the private uh, version of the um, of this business. So this is a new industrial park that would be located near Caucedo Port. Caucedo is the most important port in the country. So this would be the biggest industrial park in the country, 4.9 million square feet, uh, of which 40% would be basic infrastructure. Um, most of the industrial parks are uh, 30 to 40% uh, basic infrastructure, and the rest would be um, industrial units. Um, so we're planning to have 60 units of an average area of 55,000 square feet each. Some companies hire two units, three units, um, but we rent each unit of an average 55%. But of course, we build the units um, in accordance to the needs of the client. This is a high-end industrial park. Uh, most of the companies we are expecting would be in the medical equipment and electrical component because these are the firms that require the uh, best services, but also these are the firms that pay the highest rent. Um, they pay a rent of 9.5 cents uh, annually per square feet. Um, garment companies pay usually six to seven uh, U.S. cents per square feet. Footwear would pay six to seven as well, and um, and agriculture would be even even less. So capex, we this this would require a forty four million dollar initial investment in both the land and the basic infrastructure, and the units you only build the industrial units once you have a contract with a firm. Um, so let's say that you have a contract with uh, Haynes, for example. They would require their um, technical description of the unit, of uh, a certain height, a, cer a certain temperature, certain distribution of the, um, of the area. And once you have the contract, uh, you hire an engineering company and that would take three to six months on average of construction time. But you don't, so you don't build unless you have a contract. Um, in terms of income and OPEX, as early as in the third year, once you have uh, about four units that are rented, your EBITDA turns positive. This is normal because this is a high capital intensive um, investment. So OPEX is normally very low. Equity holders would receive a positive um, dividend in the 12th year. So in the first 40 years, we calculated an IRR of 12.8%. Um, this is reasonably well in this country. And with an MPV of uh, 37 million um, in the first 40 years, um, this and we have these very good numbers because most of the parks are already uh, full capacity. So, if we add up all the industrial parks in the country, well, we have 98 percent of the land already hired. So we have many companies visiting the country, and they don't. Um, they don't get a, a unit because parks are uh, overwhelmed. So this is why 
we um, these investors uh, saw a an interesting opportunity, and uh, this is why we're getting a very very high IRR in this uh, context. Most of the income comes from unit rents, ninety percent of the income, of course. You also give services to these companies, uh, payroll services, hiring services, admin services, but uh, you do that not because of the income, but um, as, uh, as a way to get companies because the, uh, especially multinational companies, they don't want to deal with um, Dominican uh, labor law um, and regulations. So they hire a service company that would do everything for them. Most of the expenses are related to infrastructure maintenance. Uh, as I said before, this is a capital intensive uh, industry, uh, the park uh, administration. The rest would be payroll and marketing. Uh, parks invest a lot in marketing uh, because they have to visit companies abroad to bring, um, to bring them uh, to invest in their parks. Last slide, um, of course, we've seen a deterioration of the project finance. Uh, wh when we did the numbers in early 2021, the IRR was 18.8%, uh, but we've seen an increase in utility, construction costs, an increase in the interest rate. Uh, that's why we have the NPV reduction from 82 million to 37 million. And IRR went down from 18.8 to 12.8. But um, despite this decline in the project finance numbers, um, this is still a very good business in the country. So this would be my presentation, and I'm happy to receive um, questions and um, anything you would like to know. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Please remain online as we invite our panelists to the stage. May I first invite Mr. Thilan Vijay Singh the chairman and CEO of TW Corp Private Limited. And Mr. Murthaza Jaffaji, chairperson of the Advocata Institute and CEO of JB Securities Private Limited, on stage to continue the discussion on private industrial zones. Thank you. Um, let me give you the context uh, why we are having this discussion about industrial zones, private industrial zones. The key challenge that most investors, especially foreign investors have, is what is called the coordination problem. So if you want to set up in a greenfield area, you will have to get more than 16 approvals. And we don't have the concept of one government in Sri Lanka. So any potential investor has to be able to jump from one agency to another to get all the necessary approvals. Now the case for industrial parks is think about it similar to a mall. So mall, you know, you have standardized shops uh, and you can go and rent out a standardized unit all the air conditioning and cleaning and most of the allied services all taken care of. So a similar view was taken in setting up industrial parks globally. And of course, they have the benefit of certain fiscal incentives like duty-free and tax-free because they were initially targeted for export. Now, if I can uh, pivot to Tilan, um, you have been a former BOI director general and the chairman. Uh, I believe the first industrial park was set up uh, in Katunayaka, Free Trade Zone, in 1978, when the Greater Colombo Economic Council was set up. For the benefit of our audience, why don't you take us through the evolution of Free Trade Zone cum industrial parks in Sri Lanka? Uh, thank you, Murtaza. I'll be as brief as I can, but it's an interesting evolution and story. So I have seen pictures at the Katunayaka and Biagama zone taken in 1981 where Prime Minister Mahathir Mohammed and Jiang Zemin, who became Prime Minister of China, coming to Sri Lanka to study our industrial zones, 1981. Um, in 1992, the private sector built its first industrial zone, DFCC built Lindell. 
uh, because that was a property that evolved on them on a, on a loan that was gone bad. Then when I became chairman in 1995, uh, we had just three zones, Katunaga, Biagama and Pallakali, sorry, four, Koggala. The then government, uh, in consultation with the then president and finance minister, CBK, we decided that we were going to aggressively build EPZs for the very reason that Murtaza just pointed out, because of all the plethora of uh, approvals that you have to go through with local governments, etc. So we built eight zones, actually seven EPZs and one IT park area in Malabe. I'll get to that in a second. Increasing EPZ lands by 400% over five years. Sita, Horana, Watupitevela, etc. On top of that, we took a decision that the government would provide a budget allocation to the BOI to, to improve the township surrounding both the existing zones and the new zones. So we did water supply schemes, um, upgrading schools, hospitals, etc., and building the Katunayaka cricket grounds um, and uh, the, the Biagama sports complex, all for the benefit of the community that lives around, in and around the area so that the objective was that investors and the workers could g get on better together. In fact, uh, it was I who donated the Palakele Cricket Stadium next to the Palakele Zone to the Cricket, cricket Board. Um, then, in terms of IT parks, it was then Minister Mangala Samarivira and a team of us who designated the entirety of Malabe as an IT zone and Millennium Information Technology was given special concessions to open their campus and Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology which was actually founded by the BOI through a grant funding process which now has 12,500 students located in Malabar also during that time. So what was, the, what was the outcome of this? I think Mutasa, it's important to note that the 95 to 2001 period because of the fact that we focused on export orientation, I'm going to quote from uh, Professor Premachandra's statistics. During that period, uh, exports as a percentage of GDP grew from 28 to 34 percent, and even the tradable to debt um, ratio also improved during that period. And that period is the only period in the longest period that Sri Lanka never went to the IMF because of the focus on exports. During that period, the Martin Trust, MAS, Brandix built 30 factories. YKK came, Texture Jersey was built, Lodestar, which is now Michelin, came during that period. In the IT field, we also interestingly made the whole of the World Trade Center an IT park. What did we do? When Vertusa signed the agreement with me in 1996 or 97, I can't remember, I was told, where should we locate our business, Vertusa? Um, so I said, why, are you, why Chris Kanagarata, why are you asking me this question? Oh, we can't find a place with proper bandwidth. So I went to my board, I said, allocate me a, a budget. We laid a fiber optic cable through the entire backbone of the World Trade Center. And that's where Virtus started its business. Because it was 70% unoccupied in 1996, the, the World Trade Center. Um, then in the brief history, uh, somewhere in 96, we decided to invite the private sector to build a zone and we signed an MOU. That was the time the Koreans and the Malaysians were exporting their labor intensive industry to countries like Cambodia, Laos and Sri Lanka. So during that period, the BOI acquired 1,200 acres from Kotagala plantations in Horana and signed an MOU with Land and General Berhard to build a private industrial zone. Unfortunately, with the 97 crash, that project didn't go ahead. and the Board of Investment went ahead and did the, did the investment themselves and invited a private party to do the housing development. That project has not uh, succeeded that much. So what happened in terms of our initiative to bring private parties in, in the late 90s was primarily the East Asian currency crisis. Then we had three parties building mini, what, are, what we call niche zones. And that's something we, we need to think about in the future, not these mega development projects. We had MAS taking over the dilapidated Tulhiria complex and creating the MAS Fabric Park, which is a brilliant project. The growth of Nike's export business from Sri Lanka arose because they took over that defunct asset. Then we had a gentleman from Sweden called Rune Flint, who built a mini zone in Khadavata with 11 enterprises on an extent of about, I can't remember, 20 odd acres, where one of those enterprises made sensors for Airbus and Boeing, 
that went on their flaps. And those sensors were designed by Sri Lankans. And this particular factory won a bid from British Aerospace in order to supply uh, Boeing and uh, Airbus. Unfortunately, Mr. Flint became old. He had some fi financial difficulties. So I, as an investment banker, helped him sell the industrial zone to Akbar Brothers. And today, Akbar Brothers owns that particular industrial estate. And then we must remember the, the work done by Jeevan Janam in building Orion City. That's an, a classic example of a private industrial park. Two more examples. Um, somewhere in 2018, I believe Rojana from Thailand wanted to build a private industrial zone. I tried to help as PPP chairman. It ran into problems. I was told there was some funny uh, influence being influenced. I, I personally believe there were some corrupt elements that came into play. They walked away. Um, then we had Hambantota. Hambantota, personally, I'm opposed to the deal, very simply, because we gave up a port for 99 years, never negotiated the industrial zone to have proper infrastructure, whether it's public investment or private investment. And there was a company that was willing to invest in the industrial zone, and we didn't. We gave up the port. We didn't have the industrial zone. Therefore, we, were, we failed to capitalize when COVID came, when there was a complete supply chain shift towards this part of the world, including India, uh, Philippines, etc. Had we had the infrastructure, the social infrastructure and the physical infrastructure adjacent to the port, we would have benefited. So that deal was not properly negotiated, I'm sorry to say, uh, Harsha. Uh, the, you, know, you had nothing to do with it, neither did I. Um, so, um, one final evolution in this whole saga is the Port City. Port City, uh, it was actually uh, at a meeting held with the now president, uh, uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe, in April 1995, that I pitched the idea of making it a special economic zone. Uh, Harsha and I worked on what was to be a fantastic law, which was focusing on nothing but ease of doing business. It was not about 40-year tax holidays, nothing else, but we benchmarked the how can we go from number 100 to top 25 in ease of doing business? Drafted a super piece of legislation. This government, government comes into whatever the government that came after Hapal, uh, threw it in the dustbin, and we have a substandard law that needs to be amended. Uh, and, and, and essentially, Port City is, in my view, a commercial failure. Uh, only about 17 acres of land has been formally signed up. I, 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 my company was financial advisor to all, all of that. But it is a commercial failure because of a whole host of other factors. So that's basically our history uh, in, in, in seven, eight minutes, hopefully, uh, okay. of Sri Lanka's story. Thank you, Tilan, for outlining that. If I can pivot to you, Juan. Um, now, uh, our industrial parks, which are owned by a government entity called the Board of Investment, the largest ones are about 300 acres, uh, which is 120 hectares. It's about 120,000 uh, square meters. I think square meters is what you will understand. Um, the, the industrial park that you are advising on, what is its size, the amount of land? So it would be 4.9 million square feet. Okay, 4.9 million square feet is about 480,000 square meters. So that would be, for the local audience, about 1,200 acres. Uh, now, Juan, uh, one of the big challenges that we will have in Sri Lanka in the context setting presentation which came before this is 82% of the land here is owned by the government. Now, how did you manage to get uh, 4.8 million square feet of land is the land owned by the government, or how did you get your hands on that? Yeah. So most of the land in the country uh, is owned by the private sector. So the government has uh, land in previous uh, big agricultural um, areas because the, the sugar industry was in the public sector like 50 years ago. Uh, but the government is happy to um, sell the land if the private sector wants it because it would be a better use of, of an asset. Um, as I said, we have uh, about 12 industrial parks that are owned by the government. 
The only reason being that the private sector doesn't want the land because um, it's not uh, here. We don't see that government should manage industrial parks uh, or do business. You know, in here we're very convinced that government needs to legislate, um, protect citizens, and give uh, good public services, but not in the in the economic sector. Um, so it's really easy to to get land here. Uh, of course, it's a matter of price. Uh, but even that, I can tell you that um, when we have a foreigner that wants to invest in an industrial park, the government would help them um, to get uh, different options and uh, build the infrastructure and the permits. Uh, with the local government. So the government is here, it's not land owner, but business um, facility. And Juan, uh, can foreigners own land in the Dominican Republic? Yes. They can. Absolutely. Right. Yes. So uh, obviously, the incentive to come into industrial zones, uh, it's more than ownership. Now in Sri Lanka, foreigners can't own land. Uh, there are restrictions. Uh, so most of the investors who go into industrial zones, they get on a lease. Um, so, okay, you get the land. Uh, now, if a private person wants to set up an industrial zone, uh, do you need special permission to set up an industrial zone? Is there a permitting regulation? Can you enlighten us on that? Sure, yes. So you would need a permit from the local government um, saying that um, you can have a, an industrial use of the land uh, because we have a, a territory uh, distribution. Uh, just to give you an example, you cannot build an industrial park uh, in front of the beach because that would be better for tourism. Um, and you also need a permit from the council, the free tourism council, uh, because you're going to get tax exemptions. Um, and you would also need a permit from the um, Ministry of um, Environment and Natural Resources. So those would be the three permits that you would need to get. Again, the, the council, um, they have an incentive to help investors get the permits because um, you know, they are met, their success is measured in investment, jobs creation, so on and so forth. So you would first go to the council and they would talk to everyone within the government to, to get the permits. So um, then you get government approval to build one. Uh, what happens next? I mean, you need uh, certain infrastructure facilities. Uh, water, electricity, a road up to the park, I mean, a fairly large road because there's a lot more activity. How does that happen? So normally the private investor would build um, the infrastructure inside the park. So they would build the uh, streets, they would build water treatment plants, uh, they would build the, um, the substation for electricity. Um, mostly that, unless you need a, a waste management uh, because of you know certain activity, um, and then the go in case you need infrastructure outside the park, you would talk to the government. Um, oftentimes, the government invests uh, because uh, it's only let's say uh, a couple of streets to connect to the highway. Uh, and uh, you would create a lot of jobs and uh, people in the community would be happy. So the investment is very, uh, very much in the hands of the private investor. And you wouldn't build a single unit. Uh, then you would go abroad and try to get clients. You would negotiate with them the, um, the distribution of the design of the unit, and then you would build each unit once you get the contract. And finally, on this topic, uh, the customs, you said that uh, it's a duty-free. So you will have certain fiscal officers on site? How does it yes. work? So, yes. So uh, free trade zones here work as an extra territory for customs. So when companies located in the parks, 
when they import, it's not considered that the, um, the merchandise has entered the Dominican uh, market. It's considered an extra territory uh, for customs um, purposes. So you would have an office in each industrial park of the customs agency. And they would check that everything's fine um, from the port. So whatever you import and, and the um, document that you get in the port, then the customs inside the park would check that um, is exactly what the port authority said that you import. Um, the same for export, because um, before you had an export requirement of 80%, not anymore, because the WTO has banished that. Um, but nevertheless, you still have a check uh, when you have the merchandise to leave the industrial park. Thank because you. Otherwise, they would need to pay. Uh, they would need to pay taxes if they if the merchandise enters the Dominican territory. Okay. So, uh, uh, Tilan, you you heard him uh, briefly. If we had to do the same thing in Sri Lanka, can you lay out the steps that it is possible? Yeah, it is possible because, let me put it this way, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had a problem where the BOI would subsidize the land. And often the private sector might find it difficult to compete in order to get ROI. But now, virtually all the zones are full. So you, if you should you know, create a policy to say, hey, BOI, you cannot compete. You can compete, but compete on equal terms. Um, and then look at a public-private partnership structure. I think what uh, was mentioned was let, also let, PVP let's structure. Take, uh, the, the, the zone one is working. Could you get 1,200 acres of land? Yes. You can? Yeah. I mean, I would suggest uh, Horana still has about 800, no, maybe, yeah, about 800 acres vacant. Um, privatize Horana uh, along with the land. I, I, and you could securitize the uh, rental that the uh, companies are paying. There are about 27 companies, if I'm not mistaken, in Horana. There's additional land. Um, there, there is, yeah, seven, eight hundred acres. There's some flood problem, which we can resolve through building a bond. Uh, so it would have to be a, a deal where the land pricing would reflect the fact that it, it, it would have to be a concessionary. I mean, if you apply market rates, I'm sure it, it's not going to be viable. And the state, like in the case of Port City, would have to provide infrastructure to the periphery of the site. And all the infrastructure would be done in, internally by the developer. The important point is, what would be the positioning of that particular zone? What is the value chain in terms of what we are trying to achieve? So, it, so I believe at this juncture, Sri Lanka needs to look, be more niche as opposed to... Um, like in the case of Fabric Park or Rune Flint's uh, electronic park. But it is doable, uh, Murza, in my view. Uh, what would you do about the customs? Uh, similar to the Board of Investment Zones. Uh, so you could declare that entire zone under the Board of Investment Law, which means a BOI has passed to conduct customs functions. So, so it, BOI may, ne may not necessarily be managing it, but it would be declared as a licensed zone under the Board of Investment Law. So it's de facto... Uh, you have the same uh, rights as the BOI, but it's been managed by a private party. So Juan, if I can pivot again to you, uh, agglomeration is a well-known concept in real estate. Um, clustering is something that Michael Porter spoke about. Any of those dynamics play out in industrial parks? Yes, yes. Um, just to give you an example, we didn't get certain um, companies in the medical sector because we didn't have some services, sterilization, um, temperature, uh, temperature um, reheat of certain parts. Uh, and companies, uh, for, for example, sterilization companies wouldn't locate here because they would say, you know, I cannot make an investment because you have one company or two companies. Um, so you, you do need economies of scale for certain industries. Um, I can give you another example. When uh, COVID hit, uh, I was talking to, um, to a very big company um, in, the, in, in the mask sector. I mean, the, the most important company in the mask sector. 
and they we couldn't get that investment because we didn't have an an oil industry in the country and they would need an input that comes from oil refinery um so and of course we wouldn't get an an, an oil refinery just to 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 service that um so we we do see quite a lot agglomeration and and clustering um mostly in terms of certain special inputs and certain services okay uh if i can ask you one other question and then i will ask you tilan to weigh in how it will apply in sri lanka you mentioned about the investor promotion that the government does assist but you have a lot of competitors different uh, competitors so how does the competitive dynamics play out in attracting investment because not only are you when you go pitch to these american companies there are also other caribbean com- countries also competing for these investments and you have intra country competition <laughs> amongst the different parks also saying you come to my park and then the government is facilitating the investor promotions for the benefit of our audience can you explain how that dynamic works out yeah definitely um we could give you an example our most important competitor in the region would be costa rica um it's very big in the medical equipment and electronic devices sector uh we are not competing very much in the garment um sector that would be honduras and nicaragua um footwear mostly honduras uh but oftentimes you compete in terms of a couple of things first um cost you, you need to have a matrix with all the cost with your competitors and you have to you have to pitch that it's cheaper to produce in your country so we all always had these um matrix in which we would say uh electricity is cheaper here than in Costa Rica we have a cheaper labor um we know that uh education is better in Costa Rica but then we would have these special training programs here so cost would be one second would be training programs um and third be um quality of the parks so you know you need pictures videos um because the some companies um they 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 need to be sure that it's a very high end park um of course all the companies would do exactly the same um and then one once they are here uh we set up a schedule with the different parks so let's say we have an investor here uh, that is going to visit the country for 3 days uh we contact all the parks and we set uh, we arrange meetings and visits to all the parks. Um so that would be how the dynamics would play. And I think that's very common in different countries that I've seen in the region. More free trade agreements. We need to deepen our free trade agreement with India. We need to move to a ICTA with India. we need the free trade agreement with china as the president mentioned deeper trading ties with the uk and uh, asean leveraging on these we need to then build the infrastructure and i'm not just talking industrial infrastructure we need to have social infrastructure as well i mean i think dominican republic is a small country and sri lanka as nayana showed we are heavily urbanized towards areas where there is good infrastructure so we need to find areas which are close to highways i still personally believe that um, hambantota has potential if we can find another investor like china hub who had deep pockets to build port city to build the social infrastructure next to the port it it can be include it can include worker housing it can include uh, managerial housing it can include recreational parks golf courses but at the moment without that social as well as physical infrastructure there isn't a water treatment plant in hambantota as yet so even the tire factory that was supposed to come there i don't i don't know whether they have even broken ground it was supposed to be a 300 million dollar investment so so f- trade agreements improving social and physical infrastructure we can find the land and and then a proper ppp type structure so, so, to make sure so you give roi my, my question was more on the investor promotion 
So if you have this private and then you have government own parks, now investor promotion the country will have to do, right? So the nexus between the investor promotion and how the industrial park gets a tenant. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Who will do the promotion? I mean, if you For have the private to party, hmm? I think the private party will do a far better promotion than the board of investment. Okay. Um, board of investment can be, be a facilitator. It, BOI need, doesn't need to travel overseas. I'm a firm believer on that. It's the private parties who are doing well. Uh, the, the Sri Lankan private sector who should promote the country. Okay. I must have been the least uh, traveling chairman in the history of the BOI. So we have about five minutes more to go. Is there any questions that are coming from the audience? Yes, there is a question over here on the left. White shirt, yeah. So you guys mentioned that for your country, a lot of medical equipment was your niche. And in other places, there's garments and in shoes. I'm just wondering whether, since you consult for industrial parks, you'd have any advice on what Sri Lanka could choose as a suitable niche target? Where to look for a good industry there? So I think his question is uh, about the product space. Maybe I can flip the question, uh, Juan. Uh, going back to the Harvard uh, theory on product space, uh, you did well on medical devices, but something preceded that, that Ricardo's famous example of the forests and the trees, there were some trees that were close by that allowed you to jump to the medical devices. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So um, first we had garment and um, footwear. <clears throat> and um, when employees are trained to do the... Um, to, to, to work in the garment industry, uh, they can easily switch to electrical equipment um, because it's just putting things in place. It's not that we do the R&D or anything like that. Uh, it's putting things in place. Uh, not so much in the medical devices sector. It's not very uh, like the, the, the hand activities. It's not very similar to what they do in the garment um, sector. We had to invest a lot in training employees uh, when we had the first medical uh, devices um, companies. Um, but I would say that the jump was easier from garment to electrical equipment, not so much to medical components. I think it's mute, I can't hear. No, no, I said that these medical devices, are they finished products? Or are they components that go into other products? Oftentimes, um, components that go to other products. Can, yes, go can ahead. Can I just make a Comment, final, yeah. uh, two minute uh, remark? I think, in terms of way forward, uh, Murtaza, I, I personally feel that either the Board of Investment Law should be amended or we should be looking at introducing a new special economic zone law. Uh, to cover Port City and Hambantota. We have not modified the BOI law to, since uh, you know, 1992, if I'm not mistaken, when GCC became BOI. Uh, point number two, we as a country, I believe, need to look at agriculture special economic zones um, where you bring in principles of real estate. In fact, I, I, if I may take, take two minutes on this, when I was managing director of Forbes and Walker, I wanted to do carbon sequestration, raise $35 million of PE, uh, and I studied the British plantation model and asked myself the question, how can I apply this to the 21st century? And this particular model, I wanted to apply to a land extent of over 30, 40,000 acres. Then someone said, you can't find this land. Then I hired two land commissioners and said, you go to Hambantura district, this is 2006, 2007, Hambantura district, Monoragala, Ampara, and Polonnaruwa, find me degenerated forest lands or degenerated lands where less than, less than 5% has trees. You wouldn't believe it, they came back with, I'll tell you how many acres, 275,000 acres. Uh, some of that land was what, where Matala was built. Matala was just degenerated, uh, most of Matala. 
But in Monavagal, in particular, I personally saw a 35,000 acre contiguous block of land gazetted under the forest department, not a single tree. Now, if these lands can be degazetted to build an export-oriented agribusiness industry, we can provide food security to the whole of the Middle East. But it requires significant investment. Now, for, to get significant investment, you need to have scale. So you need to give large extents of land. So go back, going back to the British plantation model, the investor should build the housing township, should build the social infrastructure, should have smallholder plots, the nucleus plantation, and the factory that adds value. I personally believe in, you know, everyone says we have such a fantastic irrigation system also in this particular Monragala land. Uh, we need to be looking at uh, agriculture, special economic zones. So that's my sort of final take. So thank you, Tilan. I will uh, come to you, Juan, for one last question because Tilan was talking about building this social infrastructure. The industrial parks that you have in your country, are they built where the people live? Or you build the parks and then yes. expect the people to come where the parks are? No, no, no. So, so that's a very good question. Um, it's very important to reduce the, the travel time. Um, so, and I can tell you because we were looking for a land that would be close to a big housing sector uh, because uh, otherwise uh, it's not only in terms of cost, but also um, it's better if people feel that where they work is close to where they live because people want to go and, you know, eat, eat at uh, their houses, feel that they have their kids in school very near where they work. So um, it, it, people prefer to work close to where they live. Um, and I've seen that at least my client, he was very, very eager to invest as close as possible to where people were living. Verification. We are out of time. I would like to conclude this panel discussion. Thank you. Mr. Jaffaji, that was quite the insightful discussion. I would now like to invite Dhananath Fernando, the Chief Operating Officer of the Advocata Institute, to the stage to give the concluding remarks of the session. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When I first thought the list of that I have to thank, I found about 123 people, and I was convinced that I've missed so many. So then I thought, before we reset Sri Lanka, I should reset my concluding remarks and vote of thanks. So finally, I found, like, categorize it for five main sections to quickly thank. First, I would like to thank Team Advocata. They have been a wonderful team and many sleepless nights for them. And I have a very young team and they are about 90% female team. So I'm the youngest in the team. I'm the, I'm the eldest in the team, so you can, you can see how young they are. I'm very grateful for them. And also our chairman, Murtaza, Dean, Ravi, Riyadh, and the directors. Thank you very much for the team. And especially, I'm not going to mention the names. Or like You all recognize them very easily. And also, they can't stand, uh, they, they can stand because they have been standing everywhere, so their legs must be quite uh, paining now. So that's thank you very much for the team. Second, I would like to thank all our panelists and the speakers. Thank you very much. And many of them joined quite odd hours in their respective countries. Dimanta joined, I think, at 3 o'clock in the morning or, or quite, quite early in the morning. So I thank all of them. Thank you very much. And then I also would like to thank our sponsors, especially uh, Capital Alliance uh, as the platinum sponsor and Expo Lanka as the gold sponsor, John Keels Properties and John Keels Holdings and M2M, as well as Jetwing Hotels, Frederick Nauman Foundation and Atlas Network uh, for contributing for this event. And then I would like to thank our technical team, the, all the camera crew and everyone who contributed for the event. Thank you very much. 
Uh, it has been great pleasure working with all of you. And then I would like to thank all the participants online and online and in person. Uh, thank you very much because uh, we had a massive online operation going. There was a studio set up on the other side uh, and you will see more content coming in in the next few probably weeks and in the next uh, few months. Uh, we have uh, had a lot of uh, recordings and content created. Uh, also, a special thanks to Dr. Uh, Viratai Santiprabhu coming all the way from uh, from Thailand uh, and for that initial session because it was we had to postpone the event for multiple reasons a few weeks ago but we luckily didn't publish the event by then so we had to cancel it and again he was kind for us to give another slot uh, from his busy schedule uh, and everyone who participated of course I also would like to thank the president of Sri Lanka for accepting our invitation uh, and joining the Reset Sri Lanka. So that was broadly my Reset vote of thanks. Let's now Reset Sri Lanka. Thank you.